Good morning, dear participants. I once again welcome you all to the day two of Vishnu Adhyan 2022. I hope all of you are well and are well uh, benefited by yesterday's lecture series and are of the view that the expose provided by our eminent speakers was interesting and interactive and are looking forward to today's sessions. I am Dr. Sujana, senior lecturer in the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology. I consider it my pleasure to guide you through today's schedule. Firstly, it is with great delight that I would like to introduce the first speaker of the day, Dr. B. Jambukesh Kumar, sir, oral and maxillofacial surgeon, currently working as an associate professor at Kurd Institute of Dental Sciences. Sir completed his graduation from JSS Dental College and post-graduation from Sri Siddhartha Dental College, Tumkur. He is a qualified instructor in basic life support and advanced cardiac life support trained under the American Heart Association. He went on to share his knowledge regarding the same to medical, dental, and nursing health care providers from different institutes. He has completed NPTEL courses and has 10 publications to his credit. Today, he is going to enlighten us on the topic medical emergencies in dental practice and their management. I request the participants to kindly post your queries in the chat box regarding the topic and they will be answered subsequently at the end of the lecture. I now hand over to you, sir, to open the session. Today, my presentation is on medical emergencies in the dental practice and its management. Uh, I thank for giving the opportunity to appreciate the issue with you for giving this opportunity. And these are my contents for the presentation. Not all the emergencies, so most commonly occurring emergencies is covered. And what is an emergency? It is a serious, unexpected, and often dangerous situation requiring the immediate action. So, what are the key points while facing an emergency? That is, first of all, you should be prepared for the, treating the emergencies and then ensure access to the appropriate drugs and equipment during the time of emergencies and ensure the trained faculty are there or training of the faculty should be done before and know whom to call at the situation and know about the medical history proper of the patient when we are treating about the medical emergencies. And, and we see most common medical emergencies because of the stress related that is pain, anxiety, fears, etc. during our treatment. And according to the DCI Code of Ethics 2014 guidance that in case of medical emergency, the dental surgeon must institute standard care including resuscitation in case of cardiac episodes for which all the dental surgeons must be adequately trained in the basic life support program or basic life support. And as the Goldberger states, if you prepare for an emergency, the emergency ceases to exist. And most office emergencies are minors, but should be aggressively treated before they become the major. That means we, as a dentist or the magnification surgeons, we should be able to diagnose the disease or diagnose the medical emergencies before it turns into the majors. And according to the statistics, 19 to 44 percent, percent of the dentists, the medical emergency suffers in the dental office as reported. And incidence of these medical emergencies, mainly the syncope is around 60 percent, 
hyperventilation is around 7% and others are over the very less traces percentage occurring. We see both of the medical emergencies that sync up on the hyperventilation for the slides. And the medical emergencies, the dental office, this has been taken from 2006 journal. Coming to the classification, general classification of medical emergencies, that is mainly unconscious, maybe because of passive depressor synchro, posterior hypotension, acute internal insufficiencies, and altered consciousness, diabetes, mentis, thyroid gland dysfunction, cerebrovascular accidents, and respiratory distress, mainly asthma, hyperventilation, airway obstructions, heart failures. And next you will have seizures. Next you have drug-related emergencies, that is your drug overdose, and allergy and chest pain that is your angina pectoris and then myocardial infections these both are almost similar what is the basic difference between the angina pectoris and the myocardial infections also will be learning in the further slides and cardiac arrest see mainly while treating the medical emergencies you should be prepared for the prevention and preparation for treating the medical emergencies so Emergency kit. Coming to the medical emergency drug kit, as we all read in the Malamed uh, medical emergencies, uh, we have a module 1, module 2, module 3, and the module 4 drugs. In the case of module 1 drug, we have a basic emergency kit where we have the critical drugs and the equipments. In module 2, you have a non critical drugs and the equipments. And module 3, you have uh, advanced cardiac life support drugs. And the module 4, you have an uh, anti portal drugs. The, each module contains the two categories of that is injectables and the non-injectable drugs and the emergency equipments. The critical injectable drugs mainly you have a diphenhydramine and the clothirium and mallage. And critical non-injectable drugs you have the mainly oxygen, either it may be cylinders, and you have a nitroglycerin lingual aerosols, and then the nitroglycerin sublingual nitrates, and then inhalers, and you have a glucose and critical emergency equipments when you come you have a ambu valve that is artificial manual breathing unit and you have a pocket mask you have defibrillator and then the glucometer you have an iv cannulas syringes suction apparatus with the angles intubation forceps um so we all know how to face a medical emergencies to some extent and we are, we are keeping it in a proper streamlined fashion so that the patient can resuscitate back during the time of our medical emergencies. The for the managed properly, most common emergencies are resolved satisfactorily. If mismanaged, even small emergencies can turn into the disasters. So, what are the steps mainly in case of treating the medical emergency? That is, recognize mainly identify what is the what has happened ideally and then after recognition positioning of the patient then stabilizing then final diagnosis then treat and then if needed you can refer to the higher centers coming to the prevention part what is the prevention part it is the best treatment to know your patient and never treat a stranger not be knowing and then in the case of prevention, you have the medical medical history part, and then you have a physical evaluation, vital signs, and then you have dialogue histories, then you have determination of the medical risk, and then you have stress reduction protocols. What are the things you need to take? What are the steps you are uh, taking in case of stress reduction protocols, etc. Next, you have in the medical history, you have to take the recent medical history part. What is the review and then update the medication part? What are the medications, medical consultations? What, what is the recent uh, consultations, medical uh, records of the patient? And then you have physical evaluation. In the physical evaluation, you have length of time since last evaluation, vital signs. And the visual inspection of the patients and the 
referral to the physician. Coming to the classification of the patient, when you see what kind, how, what are the types like American Society of Anesthesiology Physical Status Classification System has come up with that is ASA classification. ASA 1 is healthy patients, 2 is mild to moderate systemic diseases caused by the surgical conditions or by other pathological processes and medically well controlled. And ASA 3 is severe disease process which limits the activity but is not incapacitating. ASA 4 is severe capacitating, severe incapacitating disease process that is a constant threat to the life. In case of ASA 5, you have a morbid patient not expected to survive 24 hours with or without an operation. ASA 6, you have the declared brain dead patient whose organs are being removed for donor purposes. And in the case of prevention, we have stress reduction protocols that is your pre medications. Before we operate, we'll give the pre medication, sedations, pain control, like either intra or and post operative pain controls, early appointments, short appointments. Like when you are treating the patients, you will have the music also during when you are treating. So that is also one of the steps in stress reduction protocols. And 90% of the life threatening situations can be prevented, 10% will occur in spite of all the preventive efforts. And when you are treating the medical emergencies, keep it as simple as possible. Coming to the each medical emergency proper, as we have discussed earlier classification, according to the statistics says that around 60% of the medical emergency, what we are facing day to day is synco. That is a sudden transient loss of consciousness due to the reduced cerebral blood flow. What are the psychogenic factors? That is mainly, see the first picture is depicting stress. As soon as the patient sees, the he will go into stress and he will have a release of catecholamines. And due to this, there is a change in the tissue blood perfusions decreased peripheral vascular resistance, increased blood flow to the tissues or skeletal muscles that leads to the pooling of blood and decrease in the circulatory volume and decrease in the cerebral blood flow that leads to the syncope. This is the pathophysiology of syncope. And what are the clinical manifestations? Those are like pre-syncope, stage and the syncope stage and the post syncope stage and the case of pre syncope stage we have the early symptoms and the late symptoms of a syncope in the early symptoms you can see the patient is feeling warmth and paler and heavy perceptions feeling bad or faint nausea and the bp will approximately be at the baseline then you have the tachycardia will be noted in the case of early signs or symptoms. And late you have the pupillary dilatations will be noted, yawning, hyperapnea, coldness of hands, hypotension, bradycardia, visual disturbances, and then dizziness, loss of consciousness will be noted. Then the syncope will have the breathing will be irregular, the same thing what we have seen in the chart, that pupils dilatations, bradycardia will be continued and BP goes, may go, like it will be less than the baseline and there will be weak and thready pulses will be noted. And coming for the management part, as we have seen, the initially because of the, there will be decreased vascular treatment. Uh, decrease blood flow to the cerebral cerebral blood flow and because of that you can change the position that is you are shifting into the Trindlenburg position that is as is shown in the picture and after that you are going to administer the oxygen to the patient and then in the middle you can start with the aromatic spirit of ammonia which is a respiratory then and then you have a Atropine, if needed, you can administer to the patient. There is a small 
video you can observe the patient has come to a doctor for the tooth extraction see in the picture what your patient is getting here because of the needle and now block patient is in stress and C is not responding. SNL is not responding. Doctor is putting on a triangle and both position. The emergency traffic has arrived. One such in the place. Checking for the pulse. Putting the mask of oxygen. See, all the equipments are nearby. For the GP and patient is he is showing that he is better. Okay. This is a small video which is depicting the of, uh, patient management during the time of syncope. Next, you have what are the post syncope? See, we should not be sending the patient as soon as he is being come out from the syncope. So the post syncope signs. May, like, like maybe like pallor, nausea, weakness, and sweating for the sweating for few minutes to few hours. It may be there, and there will be short period of time. Mental confusion or the disorientation will be noted, and the BP heart rate returns to the normal slowly. Tendency for a second episode if allowed to the patient to stand or sit as soon as possible. See from the Trinlenburg position, he slowly raises the chair after a few minutes directly or not, making him to sit in the upright position. So that will again may uh, second episode may occur. That is why we are shifting it into the slowly into upright positions. That is the management of synco. Next, we'll go for the hyperventilation. So in the hyperventilation, this is ventilation in excess of that to maintain the normal partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Increase frequency and the depth, and then. You have exacerbated by the stress and anxiety. And what is the, uh, re the because of the uh, respiratory ankylosis, it may be uh, increased the blood level of catecholamines and then decrease in the level of circulating ionized calciums. It may occur. And you can see the this hyperventilation may lead into spasm and then constriction of the smooth muscles in the airways that's what may lead to low carbon dioxide in the airways and that causes hyperventilation and there will be hypokalemia decreased in the decreased or maybe normal blood pressure levels and you may see that there will be numbness tingling of extremities and it may go into the seizures also and there will be increased irritability and anxieties and hyperlifluxes and the muscle camping we may be noted. And in the case of clinical features, we have a cardiovascular, neurological and respiratory and musculoskeletal clinical features. You have in the cardiovascular, we have palpitations, tachycardia, precordial discomfort and then neurological, you have dizziness, lightheadedness, numbness and the tingling of extremities. Tetany and it will be very rare tetany and then convulsions. Respiratory has shortness of breath, chest pains, and then musculoskeletal, you have the muscle pain, cramps, tremors, stiffness, and the tetanies. How to manage it? Mainly consciousness difficulty in and then position the patient. Positioning is by positioning the patient upright, supine position, not optimal, and then check for the airway breathing and circulation this is the basics in the basic health support and then monitor the vital signs check for the medical history part whether it is asthma or heart failure or if it is hyperventilation then you can calm the patient initially and then you have you have to correct the respiratory alkalosis by giving the breath carbon dioxide and this air then symptoms if symptoms persist then you can go for administration of nodazolam if symptoms relieve then you have a post 
hyperventilation management you need to go ahead and then you have a you have you have hyperventilation you have you have to breathe with the in bags that is what the picture is showing or video is showing then in the management you have a you can do the diazepam intravenous 10 to 15 milligrams and then midazolam iv 5 to 7 milligrams coming to the asthma we have a uh, very small like differentiating features in the asthma and the hyperventilation part you should be carefully diagnosing it during the time of emergency scenarios that is asthma the patient will be telling the history part before in the case of hyperventilation patient will not be telling one thing and then you have extreme sensitivity of the airways either it may be extrinsic or the intrinsic asthma and exaggerated by the stress you have acute asthmatic attack you have wheezing increased respiratory effort increased anxiety sweating and then flushing of face and the upper torso in case of acute asthmatic attack you like initial management you have terminate the dental procedures calm the patient and then make the patient whichever the position he is comfortable and then administering the oxygen when administering of inhaled bronchodilator bronchodilator if he is already using if system first is then you can start with the administration of epinephrine intramuscular 0.3 ml of 1 is 2000 if symptoms persist administration of iv hydrocortisones 100 mg and if symptoms then then you can activate the emergency medical service in your hospitals next you go with the foreign body obstructions next emergency most commonly seen that is foreign body obstructions in case of actual incidence of aspiration into trachea or lungs is very low and minimized by rubber dams assistant uh, suctions ligatures etc it can be minimized most commonly we see that either the uh, crown displacements or small uh, arteries may get displaced uh, and patient what are the signs signs and symptoms you see in case of foreign body or airway obstruction that is your coughing uh, choking wheezing dyspnea etc so in case of management part so ask the patient to cough repeatedly or encourage him to cough during the time of any obstructions and do not allow the patient to sit upright when he if he is stating if we are in if the obstruction uh, or if it is displaced in the oral cavity when we are treating and use trend line box position with left lateral decubitus encourage him to cough as we told earlier uh, if you have any uh, uh, foreign object like you have cotton pellets which has been placed placed inside you try to take it out and then if you suspect swallowing swallow do not discharge till you go with the chest x-ray and then medical concentrations in case of acute this is a universal sign of choking in case of choking the patient will be having this sign and as you showed initial management the object is seen you can go ahead with the invasive techniques like you have from the lateral part of the corner of the mouth you can sweep only if the object is completely visualized part of it is visualized you are going to push into the throat that is one more complication so if you have medical forceps anything you can retrieve it if not you have something called as ambulance manual where you are going to as the picture second has been shown that how it has been how to give the handwich manner that is you are going standing behind the patient and then you are going to use the fist of your hand and just below the navel you are going to give the inward and upward pressures so that the, the foreign object may be coming out through the whole cavity because of the pressure created from the diaphragm that is your accessory muscles of your respiration if we are doing time if the patient is loses his consciousness in choking then you start with your cpr that is your chest compressions and then you are going to remove the foreign body while doing the chest compression same like we are, what are the steps during the time of the basic life support we are doing like maintaining the airways breathing and circulations 
you are going to follow the same steps during the time of if patient goes into the loss of consciousness in the choking. Next, we have a seizures. Seizures is a seizure is a sudden surge in the electrical activity in the brain that causes an alteration in the sensation, behavior, or consciousness. Mainly, you have a grand mal seizures, that is your tonic clonic seizures, and then you have the management will be like positioning the patient in supine position, then maintaining the circulations, airway, breathing, initiate the BLS need as needed, and then prevent the injury to the patient as. And then if seizure terminates, administer the basic life support in the post ictal phase, and if continuous activate the emergency medical service then bls as needed then administer the metazolone intravenous that is 50 percent dextrose also later we can put the patient in a recovery position this is what what's the picture showing this is your recovery position of the patient coming to the allergies usually you have skin that is your itching flushing Eyes, utricaria, that is utricaria, swellings, and then eyes, nose, and mouth. If you have any itching sensation, swelling around the eyes, sneezing, redness, swelling of the tongue, and you have a metallic taste. These are all. And when you come to the lung and throat related, you have difficulty in breathing, coughing, chest tightness, and you have a wheezing or other sounds. Then you have throat swellings or itchings. Then change in the voice. These are all your. Uh, symptoms due to the allergies and then heart and circulation so you have rapid or slow irregular heart rate and then the low blood pressure may seems in case of anaphylactic reactions you have airway breathing circulation disability exposures that is mainly diagnosis look for the active onset of illness life-threatening airways or breathing and circulation problems and usually skin changes and if needed call for the uh, help and then lay patient flat you can administer the adrenaline one thousand concentration that is 0.3 milligrams when equipments available you can establish the airway that is high flow oxygen either it may be mask or laryngeal mask airways or ET tubes whatever is the options available or either nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airways whatever it may be and intravenous fluid IV lines and then injection of chlorpheniramal manic 10 milligrams injection of hydrocortisones then monitor the patient by using pearls ECGs and then the blood pressure monitoring this will and then next we have a called chest pain this we have a difficulty in identification like whether how what are the major differences between the angina pectoris and the myocardial infections? So, what is the basic differences? Some few differences which I have placed over here, uh, stating that uh, location of the pain it will be like substantial or across the chest, chest, and then it will be same in the case of myocardial infections. And next, you have a radiation of pain that is neck, jaws, or arms, it will be same areas. And then your nature of pain, you have a dull or heavy discomfort with a pressure or squeezing sensations and same but may, may be more intense. And duration will be usually last for a few minutes or two longer and it lasts longer time. And other symptoms usually none and the perception, weakness, nausea, pale, gray colors. And then factors giving relief that is your reducing stress, stopping physical activities, sublingual nitrates. And nitrates may give the incomplete or no relief in the case of myocardial infections. Next, you have chest pain. You have unconscious patient, conscious patient with no pulse and breathing, with pulse and breathing. And you can start with your basic life support course in case of no pulse and breathing. That is your maintenance of airway, breathing, circulation. The same step start with the chest compressions. If needed, you have you can use with your uh, AED machines if available. Then maintaining the pulse breathing and the circulations. In case of conscious patient, we can use with the aspirin, 325 milligrams, and activate your emergency medical service. And next, 
this take home message it will have like there is no medical emergencies unique in the dentistries or oral maxillofacial surgeries. When you prepare for an emergency, the emergency seizures to exist. And drug administration is not necessary for the immediate management of medical emergencies as well. And now primary management for all the medical emergency situations involve the basic life support. When mainly we are in a doubt or in a confusion situations, do not medicate the patients. Thank you for the patience listening. I thank the Vishnu Vaidya for giving this opportunity. And thank you. Thank you. Hello? I'll answer in chat box. It's okay. Okay, okay. Am I audible? Sir? Sir, we have a few questions from the participants. Yeah, please. First one is uh, why the tachycardia is initial than the bradycardia, right? Yes, sir. So thank you. It was a good question. So initially, there is, there is a compensatory mechanism for the body during the time of uh, syncope. So
so during the peripheral pull the heart tries to compensate the whatever the blood has been pulled peripherally so before it reaches that is why when heart heart rate will increases and that's why tachycardia will be seen in the initial cases and later on when the heart also try, tries to lose its maximum function maximum effort then it tries to goes down that's why there will be bradycardia in the later stages thank you so next question what is the difference between anaphylactic reaction and anaphylactic shocks the shock is after the re reactions in the sense like initially you are going to see the symptoms of the patient symptoms when it is showing that's why the the initial symptoms will be there shock is after the symptoms you are going to see the finally the patient is ending up with the shock that is what the basic symptoms clinical signs and symptoms which you see it will be the the initial last question what is the treatment of septic shock so septic shock septicemia or septic shock initially so because of the, mainly that causes because of the infections in the bodies okay so mainly we need to treat the pre existing or uh, causing of, which is the main cause for the infection then you are going to continue with the like whether we have to uh, based upon what type of infection which is occurring over there what is the severity of it based on that we are going to uh, continue the treatment plan initially we need to remove the cause of infection Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, the rest of the queries will be answered through email. Uh, we are very happy to display your certificate, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I thank uh, for uh, giving opportunity, uh, Kishore Motori, sir, Dr. Divya, and all the uh, 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 Vishnu Adhyan. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It is now time to introduce the speaker of today's second session titled Oral Manifestations of Systemic Diseases. Dr. M. Arvind Sir, Professor and Head, Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology and Special Care Dentistry at Savita Dental College and Hospital, Chennai. Dr. Arvind Sir completed his post-graduation in Oral Medicine and Radiology. He subsequently gained his diploma in Oral Medicine from the European Association of Oral Medicine MFTS from Royal College of Surgeons of Glasgow, FDSRCS in Oral Medicine from Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, and Academic Fellowship in Oral Medicine from American Academy of Oral Medicine. He received advanced training in Oral Medicine from Eastman Dental Institute London and Penn Dental School at University of Pennsylvania. Sir further undertook training in special care dentistry at Modestan Hospital, Swansea, United Kingdom. He has the distinction of representing India as an assistant reviewer at the fifth World Workshop on Oral Medicine at London and again as a reviewer in the sixth World Workshop on Oral Medicine at Florida. He is the recipient of 2021 T.C. White Travel Grant Award by Royal Colleges of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. Sir has been awarded the prestigious Ben Walton Research Grant Award for Oral Cancer Research by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow. Dr. M. Arvind Sir has guided four doctoral theses and has 85 plus indexed publications till date to his credit. Sir is actively involved in teaching, clinical supervision and research of undergraduate, postgraduate and doctoral students. Not only that, he is on the editorial board of various national and international journals. Sir has lectured extensively on a global platform regarding wide range of topics on clinical oral medicine and radiology practice. His special, special area of interest in clinical teaching and research include dental care of special need patients and medical management of immunobullous lesions. We, are very, we were very fortunate to listen to Dr. Arvind sir as he shared his expertise on the topic special care dentistry, impact of...
Vishnu Dental College in 2019 and CIS of the Jaw Clinical Radiographic Correlation during a webinar conducted by Triple VDC few months ago. A gentle reminder to the participants to kindly post your queries in the chat box regarding the topic and they will be answered by sir at the end of the lecture. We are overjoyed to welcome you back sir and request you to take over from here. Hello to everyone and greetings from the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology and Special Care Dentistry, Savita Dental College and Hospital Chennai. And I am Dr. M. Arvind, who will be speaking to you over the next 40 or 45 minutes about the oral manifestations of systemic diseases, or what I have slightly re-termed as mouth is the mirror of the body which reflects the systemic diseases. So I know the audience is mainly the first year postgraduate students who are just going to take your basic sciences exam. So it will be a brief overview how the oral cavity presents or how the changes in the oral cavity can be used to diagnose an underlying systemic disorder. Sir William Osler quoted, mouth is the mirror of the body which reflects the systemic diseases. Majority of the systemic diseases have their first manifestation in the oral cavity. And it is we dentists or we oral physicians who are the first to see this. Many a time a patient will not be aware of an underlying systemic disorder that he or she would have had. So it's our duty to pick up these signs and symptoms, diagnose it, either treat us or refer it to a competent physician to treat the underlying systemic disorders. So we have a moral and a professional obligation. Systemic diseases produces characteristic oral manifestations. Medical and dental practitioners have an important role to familiarize these oral manifestations. So a thorough examination of the mouth and the teeth is absolutely essential to identify the oral manifestations of systemic disease and to diagnose the underlying systemic disease. Let's go into each system and the most common, which all of us are going to see in our day-to-day -day private practice, irrespective of the specialty, what we are. First, let's start with the gastrointestinal system. The GI system starts with the oral cavity and then ends with the rectal cavity. So what are the common gastrointestinal disorders which would have an oral manifestation. God or gastroesophageal reflex disorder, peptic acceleration, jaundice, Peutz Jagger syndrome, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and malignancy. The most common is God or reflex esophagitis or gastroesophageal reflex disorder, where the esophageal sphincter is relaxed. And this causes a backward reflex of the gastric contents into the esophagus and it, the acid which is secreted seeps through the gingival margin, which can cause erosion of the teeth. So a person with GERD or a reflex esophagitis will complain of sensitivity of teeth. That's because of the erosion which is taking place. He will have an acidic taste in the mouth and he will also complain of halitosis. So hyperacidity, you need to talk about cervical erosion, an acidic taste in the mouth, and then an altered taste sensation with halitosis. Sometimes jaundice, if it occurs in children, because of a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia and deposition 
of the billiard open and the billiard word and pig bites that imparts a green color to the teeth. So characteristically, in addition to the scleral changes, a patient with jaundice would have a green color teeth if it occurs in an young individual where odontogenesis is still taking place. Fuse jiver syndrome or hereditary intestinal polyposis. The characteristic or the first symptom in this before even the gastrointestinal symptoms occur is circumoral pigmentation along the upper, around the upper and the lower lip. You will have either isolated brownish or blackish pigmentation or vacuous, then which becomes diffuse. Only after the initial onset of the circumoral pigmentation would you have polyposis in the intestine, which will lead to GI bleeding, pain, diarrhea, and finally malignant changes. So if you see a sudden onset of circumoral pigmentation, alert the patient and have him referred to a gastroenterologist. Crohn's disease, an acute inflammatory condition of the small intestine. Crohn's disease, celiac disease, or what we call it as orofacial granulomatosis or OFG. It's an inflammatory disorder, but a lot of oral changes are seen. Typically in the oral mucosa, you will have cobblestoning appearance or the mucosa turned into folds. You will have presence of a linear ulcer in the vestibular region, which is very, very characteristic. And then you will have tissue tags or mucosal tags. That's an early sign of a Crohn's disease. And in many cases, the oral Crohn's precedes the intestinal Crohn's by at least five years. So if you have a patient who has this kind of the mucosa turning into folds, the buccal mucosa presenting of elevated lobules or nodules, what you call as cobblestone appearance, think about a possible Crohn's disease. The other feature in a Crohn's disease is enlargement or swelling of the upper lip and the lower lip with a gingival enlargement. This is called as orofacial granulomatosis. So be it a Crohn's or a celiac disease or an orofacial granulomatosis, many people will get confused with angioedema and they will start on anti-inflammatory. Have a dietary history taken for this patient. And histologically, you will find multiple granulomas. So if it's going to be an oral Crohn's or OFG, we need to start the patient on steroids. So this is what we gave the patient. We gave intralesional steroids and we put the patient on azathioprine and usually it regresses and the whole disease is brought under control. Liver carcinoma is on the rise amongst the population now because of alcohol intake or a liver cirrhosis. One of the common sites for metastasis of a primary liver carcinoma is to the gingiva and to the skin. So if you have a sudden onset of a swelling on the facial skin or a sudden onset of a mass or an enlargement or a swelling on the gingiva, unexplained, you might think it's going to be a gingival carcinoma or it's going to be a pyogenic granuloma without any local factors. And if the history says that a cirrhosis or a chronic alcoholism, think that something possibly could happen in the liver Refer to a gastroenterologist, have an ultrasound. For example, this man came with a primary complaint of a sudden onset of swelling on the cheek, on the right side of the face, as well as a gingival enlargement. Both occurred on the same time with pain, mobility of the tooth. When he took a radiograph, there was a radiolucency or bone resorption. Then when he took a skull x-ray, there was an osteolytic lesion. Then when we took a chest X-ray, there were multiple metastatic lesion. A biopsy and a immunohistochemistry proved it beyond doubt that this is a primary carcinoma, which is arising from the liver, which has metastasized to the cheek, the gingiva, the lung, and the skull. The patient eventually 
collapsed because of multiple metastases. So we have seen the common gastrointestinal disorder and its oral manifestation. Let's go to the next system, cardiovascular system. Congenital heart disorders, stooge river syndrome, myocardial infarction, and hypertension. Congenital heart disorder, most commonly tetralogy of phallus. It's a combination of four disorders, pulmonary stenosis, left ventricular hypertrophy, overriding of the iota, and ventricular septal defect, or a pathology of phallic, or an atrial septal defect. In any of the congenital cardiac disorders, which is not corrected, you will have a central cyanosis and peripheral cyanosis, where you will have a reddish blue or a reddish pink discoloration of the mucosa of the gingiva. So a cyanosis is suggestive of a congenital cardiac disorder. Angiomatous lesions in the face or stooge Weber syndrome. Angiomas involving one or more division of the trigeminal lobe. It will not cross the midline exactly to the center, involving one or more division of the trigeminal lobe. You will have this kind of a reddish discoloration or a patch with or without an enlargement, strictly unilateral along one or more division of the trigeminal lobe what we call as an angiomatous lesion or a nevus flamus. Corresponding to the extra oral lesion, one this girl has got involving the ocular, ophthalmic, uh, the, uh, ophthalmic and the maxillary division. intra orally also, you will have a unilateral angiomatous lesion. It will never cross the midline. And patients with Stugerva syndrome, they invariably have intracranial calcifications or radiographically what we call as a tram line calcification. This would prone the patient to epileptic attacks or seizures. And these patients are on a long term of anti-epileptic drugs like dilantin sodium or sodium valproate. So automatically as a side effect of dilantin sodium, you're going to have a gingival hyperplasia. So systemic diseases you should know, each thing is related to the other. So manifestations can occur either directly as a result of the underlying systemic pathology or it could be a side effect of the medication what the patient takes for the systemic disorders. For example, this patient with Sudorba syndrome, he would give a history of epilepsy. So the patient would be on sodium valproate or dilantin sodium, which over a period of time is going to cause gingival hyperplasia. A patient sits on a dental chair or he reports with a sudden onset of gingival bleeding from the gingival margins, which is profuse, continuous, does not respond to local pressure or styptic measures. Suspect the patient could be a possible undiagnosed hypertensive patient. So very high blood pressure levels would cause bleeding from the gingival margin. So hypertension can cause a sudden onset of bleeding from the gingival margins. This is very, very characteristic. A patient with an impeding myocardial infarction or an ischemic heart disease would suddenly come with pain on the left side of the lower jaw. You know what is angina and what is myocardial infarction. Usually angina with sublingual nitroglycerin and aspirin, maybe two or three doses, it should settle down on rest. If it doesn't settle even after three doses of a sublingual nitroglycerin or an aspirin when you give it, if the pain becomes continuous, then think of myocardial infarction. Usually the pain will start in the left lower jaw along the premolar, then go to the side of the neck, the left shoulder, run down the shoulder and finally the tips of the fingers and then the patient will catch his chest with an excruciating pain. So any sudden onset of pain, especially the patient says my jaw is paining, my neck is pain, otherwise there is no odontogenic cause. Think about a possible myocardial infarction which the patient is likely to undergo or develop. So this finishes the common cardiovascular system. And the other thing as exam going students, you need to know that 
majority of the drugs which is used to treat cardiovascular disorders, say anti-hypertensive drugs or anti-anginal drugs, will cause side effects of xerostomia, sometimes burning sensation. Any anti-hypertensive drugs will have xerostomia as its common side effect. And especially calcium gel blockers, captopril, inalpril, can also cause gingival enlargement. For the postgraduates, I'd like to mention one specific drug which is called as lycorandil, which the physician or the cardiologist will usually give uh, for cardiac disorders. It's a potassium channel activator. Lycorandil can cause oral ulcerations or aptus ulcers, what we call as lycorandil induced oral ulcerations or N I O U is abbreviation. Side effect of a potassium channel activator called mycorandal. So next we move on to the respiratory system. You just need to know two conditions, lung abscess and a primary tuber, pulmonary tuberculosis. Lung abscess can usually cause severe halitosis in the patient. The other, the other common respiratory condition is maxillary sinusitis, a chronic inflammation of the maxillary sinus, where the patient will come with sudden onset of pain in the teeth, especially the upper premolar and the molar teeth, because the sinus just lies superior to the roots of the premolars and the molars in the maxilla. So, without any absence of odontogenic cause or periodontal cause, on tender on percussion over the premolar or the molar tooth, tenderness on palpation over the malar region and along the vestibule of the premolars and molars, think about a possible maxillary sinusitis. Go into the good history taking. And the other condition which causes a very, very severe halitosis is maxillary sinusitis. So halitosis can be caused both by lung abscess as well as by chronic maxillary sinusitis. Orofacial tuberculosis, very, very common in the Indian subcontinent. Most of the patients who have a primary pulmonary lesion, which then can cause oral manifestation. But nowadays, we have a lot of cases, even without a primary lung involvement, oral cavity or orofacial region can be the exclusive site of involvement of tuberculosis. So, for example, in students, there are five orofacial manifestations of tuberculosis. The first one is tuberculous ulcer. The second one is tuberculous gingivitis. The third one is tuberculous lymphadenitis. The fourth one is tuberculous osteomyelitis. The fifth one is tuberculoma. And the sixth one it involves the orofacial skin, it's called lupus vulgaris. So, five are common. Orofacial tuberculosis involving the facial skin is called lupus vulgaris. So, this lady came with a complaint of a generalized ulceration with disconnection. She had cough, she had fever. Then, we did the investigations. You will have epithelioid or giant cells or Langerhans giant cells. You do a one to test, you do a chest x ray, you cultivate the bacilli in low extent Jensen medium, or recently you have PCR, or you have the quantiferent gamma uh, assay, which can very fastly detect the tubercle bacilli. So, this is a case of a tuberculous ulcer. And we treat it with anti tuberculous drugs, either a four drug combination or a three drug. The four commonly drugs used are rifampicin, isoniazid. Uh, pyrazinamide and ethambutol. So, if it's a four drug combination, you call it as ATT4, and if it's a three drug combination, you call it as ATT3. The treatment is divided into two phases. The first two months is active phase. Once the lesion, active lesions are brought under control, the next four or five months is a continuation phase where the patient has taken the drug or given the drug twice or thrice in a week. For the first two days, it is daily and then it is twice or three or thrice in a week for the next six, five to six months. Next, what you are going to see is a case of tuberculous gingivitis. 
which clinically presents as a generalized gingival disformation involving the marginal interdental attached gingiva extending till the mucogingival junction. Again, if there are oral medicine students here, oral pathology students, oral surgeons, there are only six or seven conditions where clinically it can present as gingival disformation. One is chronic disformative gingivitis. Second is erosive lichen plants. Third is femphigus vulgaris. Fourth is mucous membrane femphigus. Fifth is hormonal induced gingivitis or gingival disformation, puberty, pregnancy, and menopause. Sixth is tuberculous gingivitis. Seventh is plasma cell gingivitis. Eighth is histoplasmosis. So if you see a gingival disformation in any patient, think about these eight possible conditions and then proceed accordingly with the investigations and the appropriate treatment based on the investigatory results. So second manifestation, what you have seen is a tuberculous gingivitis. Pre-treatment and post-treatment with a nine months of anti-tuberculous drug, what we treated. Sometimes it can occur as a localized swelling. This patient had an extraoral scar and intraorally there was a swelling. People are thinking it's a periapical lesion, but when we did the biopsy, it came out as a tuberculoma. So again, with anti-tuberculous drug, it gets cured. This is again an outgrowth or a gingival swelling, which proved to be a tuberculoma or a tuberculous lesion. So this is a case of a tuberculoma. Involving the submandibular submental nodes, it's called as tuberculous lymphadenitis. Usually, the lymph nodes initially are solitary. They are painless. As the disease progresses, these nodes, which were individual or solitary, they coalesce together and what is characteristically called as a matted consistency or a matted lymph node, which is seen in tuberculosis. So if it's a tuberculous lymphadenitis, the lymph nodes will be joined or matted together. Again, this lymph node can get infected and it can start discharging pus, what is called as a scrofula or a cold abscess. This is a typical tuberculous ulcer, a solitary ulcer, irregular, undermined edges, severe painful, bleeding, burning sensation where the patient or it would mimic a carcinomatous ulcer. So a differential diagnosis for a tuberculous ulcer would be a carcinomatous ulcer. And finally, tuberculous involving the joint. Here this gentleman came with a sudden onset of swelling on the right side of the plate of the face, severe pain, limitation of mouth opening. Then when we did an OPG, we did a CT scan the entire condyle on the right side was eroded or destroyed and biopsy showed the presence of epithelia, bank and cell, and it was confirmed as tuberculous osteomyelitis. Again, an young girl with total destruction of the left condyle because of a tuberculous infection. With just medical management, the whole thing can be cured. So we have seen all the orofacial manifestations of tuberculosis. I just repeat for the exam for students, Tuberculous gingivitis as disformation, tuberculous ulcer, tuberculoma, tuberculous lymphadenitis, and tuberculous osteomyelitis. Next is the urinary system. The common infection is chronic renal failure or a chronic kidney disease where there is an elevation of the serum, urea, creatinine level. So when there is an elevation of the urea levels, what is called as urinic stomatitis, the patient will have a uremic order. The patient will have a sweet order in diabetes. The patient will have a uremic order or a smell of urea in chronic renal failure, and especially patients who are on dialysis. So a uremic stomatitis appears as a yellowish weight froth or a patch on the buccal mucosa or the vestibule, what we call as uremic stomatitis. Once the blood urea levels are brought under control by the nephrologist. These lesions undergo a spontaneous regression 
or there is a mild burning sensation or a pain, you can just put the patient on a topical antiseptic like a chlorhexidine gluconate check. So the manifestation, what you need to remember is uremic stomatitis or a uremic frost. Another case of a typical uremic stomatitis, which with the topical antiseptic, anesthetic and controlling the uh, urea levels was brought under control. Hormonal disturbances or endocrine, very, very common in dental practice or encountering these kind of patients. Over secretion of the growth hormone is called hyperpituitarism. There are two terminologies what we use, acromegaly and jejantism. If the over secretion of the growth hormone occurs after the closure of the epiphyseal ends of the long bones, it's called as acromegaly, which occurs in adults, say after 18 years or 20 years. Whereas if the over secretion occurs before the closure of the epiphyseal ends of the long bones, it's called as pituitary jejantism. The features of common generalized enlargement of all organs of the body in the orofacial region, enlargement of the jaw, the skull, frontal pausing, the nose becomes enlarged, macroglossia, thickened upper and lower lips, skin becomes very, very coarse and enlargement of the mandible leading to a mandibular prognathism or a skeletal class 3, spacing of the teeth, malocclusion, macroglossia, enlarged tongue and the patient will have enlargement of all the sinuses. When you take a skull view, there will be an enlargement of the maxillary, frontal, sphenoidal and ethmoidal. And as there is enlargement, the optic foramen or the auditory canal will get narrowed down and over a long period of time, the patient will have ocular and visual disturbances. And finally, the death occurs because of cardiomegaly or cardiomyopathy. Hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease, over secretion of the thyroid hormone. Classic, classically, the patient will have exophthalmus and intraorally, there will be a premature exfoliation and an early eruption of the permanent teeth. The contrary, the vice versa. Under secretion or decreased secretion of thyroid hormone will cause hypothyroidism, which is called critinism in children and mixed edema in adults. Short stature, stubby, round bone face, lethargy, cold skin, macroglossia, delayed eruption of the permanent tooth, over retaining of the deciduous tooth, hypoplastic maxilla and mandible. So these are the orofacial changes of hypothyroidism. Macroglossia is a very, very common manifestation. There are only six conditions or five conditions which can cause macroglossia. Cretinism, myxedema, Down syndrome, amyloidosis, hemangioma and lymphangioma. So these are the six conditions where you will have an enlarged tongue or a generalized enlargement of the entire tongue called as macroglossia. Over secretion of the parathormone by the parathyroid gland is called hyperparathyroidism. It could be either primary or it could be secondary due to an underlying renal disorder or a renal failure. And long-standing uncorrected secondary hyperparathyroidism will lead to tertiary hyperparathyroidism. But whatever it is, it causes over-secretion of the parathormone, which increases the serum calcium level. So what are the orofacial manifestations of hyperparathyroidism? Number one, there will be a generalized alteration of the trabecular pattern of the bone. Number two, spacing of the teeth and malocclusion and mobility of the teeth. Number three, as you see on the x-ray on the right side, you have a lamina dura in a normal teeth. Lamina dura is a thin radio opaque line, which is a radiographic presentation which covers the root of the tooth, which denotes the alveolar bone proper. 
So as the steroid hormone increases, it starts resorbing the calcium from the bone and it increases the serum calcium level. So automatically the calcium from the alveolar bone is also resorbed. So when you take an X-ray in a hyperparathyroidism, there will be a generalized loss of the lamina dura. So the third oral manifestation is generalized loss of lamina dura. As the bone is, or the calcium from the bone is resorbed, there will be a cavity which is formed in the bone. So within this cavity, there is deposition of fibrous tissue. When an X-ray is taken, it will appear as a radiolucent or a cyst-like lesion. And this appearance is called as osteitis fibrosa cystica. Osteitis is because of inflammation of the bone. Because of the inflammation of the cavity and the space it is formed, there is fibrous tissue deposition, fibrosa. Since it appears like a cyst, it's called as cystica. As this fibrous tissue is constantly getting deposited, it starts resorbing the bone. It will perforate the alveolar cortical bone and come into the oral cavity as a growth, where within this growth, there is breakdown of the hemoglobin and the RBC, which imparts a brown color to the growth. That's why it's called as a brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism. As the resorption continues to occur, the patient will end up with a pathological fracture of the jaw or the mandible. So I repeat because oral manifestations of hyperparathyroidism is a very, very commonly asked short note in your basic science papers. Or calcium metabolism is a very, very important topic which can be asked under the physiology section for any postgraduate. So I repeat the orofacial manifestations of uh, hyperparathyroidism, generalized loss of lamina dura, alteration of trabecular pattern, spacing of teeth, mobility, osteitis fibrosa cystica, Brown's tumor, and a pathological fracture. Hypoparathyroidism, decreased levels of calcium, would lead to hypocalcification or hypocalcemia and tetany. Under secretion of the adrenal glands or because of the reduced cortisol level by a negative feedback mechanism, there is stimulation of the adrenocorticotropic hormone and this negative feedback mechanism also stimulates the melanocyte stimulating hormone to produce more and more melanin so characteristically, in Addison's disease or hypoadrenalism, you will have a dark circumoral pigmentation of the lips, some patients pigmentation of the tongue and the buccal mucosa also. Finally, hormonal changes which occurs exclusively in females during the three physiological states, puberty, pregnancy and menopause where there is gingival disformation, gingival bleeding, and pregnancy tumor or gingival growth. Once the hormonal levels come back to normalcy, these changes automatically start regressing or they come down. Diabetes mellitus, a sweet disease with a very bad companion. Diabetes mellitus by definition is a metabolic disorder where there is failure of the peripheral cells to utilize glucose, which is clinically characterized by polydipsia, polyphagia, and polyuria. So the characteristic oral manifestations would include multiple periodontal abscess, mobility of the tooth, exfoliation of the tooth, candidiasis, dry mouth, a painless bilateral compensatory enlargement of the salivary glands, which is called as silosis or siladenosis, prone to upper uh, infection of the salivary gland or the uh, infection of the uh, retrograde infection of the salivary gland is called as silodocitis and siladenitis and very, very serious condition. What you see on the top right side in uncontrolled diabetes, they are very, very prone to a, 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 a fulminating fungal infection called mucormycosis which can cause osteomyelitis 
and all of us know the amount of mucormycosis what we saw in uncontrolled diabetes during the first and the second wave of the COVID pandemic. So these are the oral manifestations of diabetes mellitus. Next, we go to the connective tissue disorders. The three main disorders are steroidema, lupus erythematosus, and Sjogren's syndrome. Again, an autoimmune connective disorder, steroidoma, systemic sclerosis, where the skin becomes really taut and tight, they lose its normal elasticity. The patient will have an expressionless or a mask-like face, or what is called as a monolisa face, and oh, there will be limitation of mouth opening, there will be stiffening or fibrosis of the buccal mucosa, and if you take a radiograph, you will have a generalized widening of the periodontal ligament space. So with an IOPA or an OPG, you can diagnose two conditions. Generalized widening of the PDL space, steroderma, whereas generalized loss of lamina dura, as I told in the previous slides, hyperparathyroidism. Postgraduates don't forget these two signs on a radiograph when you see or suspect a scleroderma or a hyperparathyroidism. Lupus erythematosus, again an autoimmune disorder where the autoantibodies are directed against various body tissues and organs. You have anti-nuclear antibodies. You have two types, a systemic lupus erythematosus and a discoid lupus erythematosus. Usually a systemic lupus erythematosus on the orofacial skin you will have a bilateral area of erythema or a red rash or a patch, which is typically called as a butterfly rash. Along with other connective tissue disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, these patients will have cardiac failure, renal disorders. If it occurs only the oral layer, or the oral site, or the lips, or the buccal mucosa, or the orofacial skin, without any systemic involvement, it's called as a discoid lupus erythematosus. Here you see a discoid lupus erythematosus of the skin of the face and the upper and the lower lip. This is a typical intraoral discoid lupus erythematosus. It's got a very, very colorful appearance. It appears as a central area of erythema surrounded by radiating white spray, surrounded by a gray, uh, a bluish border and the whole lesion encompassed by a grayish blue border. It's a very, very colorful picture, which is typical appearance of a discoid lupus erythematosus. Many a times, a discoid lupus erythematosus would mimic a lichen planus. So, common differential diagnosis of a discoid lupus erythematosus is lichen planus, and we treat it with this patient, we treat it with systemic steroids, with uh, hydrochloroxyquinone and uh, a short course of Dapson also. For about one, 18 months, the whole lesion would be brought under control. Jogren syndrome. You have a primary Jogren syndrome and a secondary Jogren syndrome. A primary Jogren syndrome affects only the exocrine glands, which is the salivary glands and the eye, where there is dryness of the mouth and there is xerostomia and there is xerophthalmia with an enlargement of salivary glands. Whereas a secondary Chagrin syndrome is xerostomia, xerophthalmia, along with an underlying connective tissue disorder, say a rheumatoid arthritis or a lupus erythematosus. It can be an accompanying feature. So a primary Chagrin syndrome will have the patient will complain of dryness of the eye, dryness of the mouth. Because of the dryness of the mouth, there will be secondary chemical infection, there will be burning sensation, and the characteristic thing is appearance of sudden onset of dental caries, usually in the teeth which were normal before, a peculiar appearance of caries over the cervical or the incisal edge. The occlusal surfaces will be spared. It will involve the incisal and the cervical margins. So you have the European diagnostic criteria for Jogren syndrome, where you should do seven diagnostic tests. First is for the salivary flow, you should do a silometry, estimated, the stimulated, and the unstimulated saliva. Then for the 
eyes, you should do a schemer's eye test or a split lamp test or a rose bengal eye test. And then you should do a minor salivary gland biopsy where you should show the lymphocytic focus. Then you should do uh, estimation of the autoantibodies, especially Rho and the La antibodies. Then you should do a salivary scintigraphy, which should show the functional activity of the gland. So out of these seven tests, if four are positive, then you brand the patient as Jogren syndrome. This requires a multidisciplinary treatment approach with oral medicine specialist to take care of the oral complaints, ophthalmologist for the ocular complaints, and a rheumatologist for the connective tissue disorder. Sexually transmitted diseases caused by trichoderma pallida, syphilis. It has got three stages, a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary. If an infected mother passes on the infection to the child, you have congenital syphilis, where you have a narrow shaped incisors with the notching of the incisor ledge, which is thought as Hutchinson's incisors, the molars going out of shape, the lot of lobules or nodules on the abcusal surface, hypoplastic molars, which is called as mulberry molars or moon's molars. A primary lesion of syphilis is at the site of contact, either the genital area or the tongue, commonly in the oral cavity, a solitary ulcer, which you call as shanker. The secondary stage, which is the most infective stage, pinpoint ulcers, which coalesce to form a snail tract ulcer, and the presence of condyloma, which is characteristic of secondary stage of syphilis. Finally, after 10 or 15 years, a tertiary stage where there is perforation of the palate with the exposing of the underlying muscle at the bone, which is called as a gamma, and it can also involve the genital areas and the tongue, which you call a syphilitic glossitis or lutic glossitis, which is a potentially malignant disorder or an OPMD from which cancer can occur. So lutic glossitis or syphilitic glossitis is an oral potentially malignant disorder. Finally, AIDS in the mouth is an aid to diagnose AIDS in the body. So the common oral manifestations of AIDS are candidiosis, pseudomembranous, erythematous, hyperplasis, hyperplastic candidiosis, angular chelitis, gangrenous traumatitis, non-specific oral ulceration, HIV gingivitis and HIV periodontitis, which is now re-termed as NUG and NUG, which is necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis and necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis, caused by a very, very fatal lethal malignancy caused by human herpes virus 8, Kaposi sarcoma. Usually it occurs if the CD4 count comes less than 50. Oral hairy leukoplatia, unilateral or bilateral, non scrapable horizontal weight patch on the lateral border of the tongue in the absence of tobacco. Her particular lesions, Veruca vulgaris or oral ward, non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Usually, if there are oral manifestations in HIV, that's an indication that the patient's CD4 count is less than 200 or 150. The patient should be started on active antiretroviral therapy. Next is vitamin deficiency. Deficiency of vitamin A can cause hyperkeratosis. Deficiency of vitamin B would cause angular chelitis, atrophic glossitis, glossodynia, glossopyrosis, stomatodynia, burning sensation. Deficiency of vitamin C can cause scorbutic gingivitis or a spontaneous enlargement and bleeding from the gingiva. Vitamin D deficiency causes enamel hypoplasia or what is called as racketic teeth or a typical pitting-like hypoplasia or defect on the teeth surface. Vitamin K deficiency, which is involved, important for the clotting factors exercised in the liver, can cause a spontaneous gingival bleeding. So if they ask you a condition, which are the conditions you can have a spontaneous gingival bleeding? You could talk about hypertension, you could talk about a vitamin K deficiency, you can talk about a scorbutic gingivitis or a vitamin C deficiency. Next, hematological deficiency, anemia, 
a disorder of the red blood cells characterized by reduction in both the hemoglobin as well as the total RBC count. A pale buccal mucosa or pallor because causing severe burning sensation, angular chelitis, glossodynia. There could be a viva question for the postgraduates. For anemia, why do we think, why do we check the peripheral or the extremities? A, a, a physician will ask you to put your tongue, he will check your eyes, he will check your nails. That's because in anemia, because of the decreased RBC and the hemoglobin, the available oxygen of the hemoglobin is redirected towards the central organs. When I say the central organs, it is the brain, the liver, the heart, and the kidney. So once the existing or the available RBC oxygen hemoglobin is redirected, the peripheral organs become devoid of they, their need or their quantity of hemoglobin or oxygen is reduced. So that's why there is a paleness or a pallor. A pale tongue or a bald tongue or an atrophic tongue because angular chelitis in anemia. An uncontrolled proliferation of the immature WB cells is called as leukemia. Characteristic the patient will have a gingival enlargement, a spontaneous bleeding from the gingiva, a purplish discoloration of the papilla, purpuric or ecumopurpuric spots on the skin, lymph node enlargement, loss of weight, and a uh, patient will have fever. So leukemia, all these things are the characteristic clinical findings. Enlarged gingiva, which bleeds spontaneously. Necrotic gingiva, again characteristic of leukemia, leukemic infiltrate with the alveolar mucosa. A granulocytosis or decreased in the WBC cell. Usually, A granulocytosis will occur in a cyclic manner, once in 21 days or once in 28 days. The characteristic feature is necrotic ulcers, which occurs in a cyclic fashion. Hemophilia, a classical hemophilia or a hemophilia A, which is due to factor 8 deficiency, and hemophilia B, which is due to factor 9 deficiency. Again, there is a prolonged gingival bleeding, bleeding into the joint spaces, bleeding into the skin, bleeding into the joints is called as hemarthrosis, which causes swelling and limitation of the joints. Purpura in the skin, again, is common in uh, hemophilia, as well as the next condition called as idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Dermatological, we are just nearing the end of the presentation. Coplic spots or white spots in the buccal mucosa, which precedes the skin lesion, is called coplic spots in measles. There's another measles called as German measles, which is more fatal. Even in German measles, you will have spots over the buccal mucosa that's called as Forscheheimer spots. So in measles, it's coplic spots, whereas in German measles, it's Forscheheimer spots. Hereditary ectodermal dysplasia, which occur, which affects the ectodermal structures, the hair, the nail, the skin, and the teeth. Hair becomes scanty, dry, the absence of teeth, partial anodontia, oligodontia, or total anodontia. The ridge becomes atrophic and thin. Skin becomes dry, absence of sweat glands. Chondroectodermal dysplasia, or ellis one chronodotrival syndrome. Again, partial anodontia, absence of the vestibule, fusion of the gingiva with the mucogingival junction, and extra fusion of the digits. Ellis Ward films provide syndrome or chondroectoderma dysplasia. Epidermolysis bullosa dystrophica, a vesicular bullous lesion. There are many clinical types. It can cause multiple ulcerations, recurrent chronic ulcerations, which cause scarring and limitation of mouth opening, or ulceration and scarring of the skin in the upper and the lower extremities. Erythema multiforme, an acute inflammatory condition of the skin or the mucosa, vesiculobulous lesion, characteristically crusting, bleeding from the lips, spontaneous bleeding. You will have concentric circles on the skin with a central red lesion, which is called as a bullseye or a target lesion. 
erythema multiforme is divided in two. If it occurs mainly because of a viral infection of what you saw in the previous case, it's called as HAEM, which is heme associated erythema multiforme. Or if it occurs because of drug, it's called as drug induced erythema multiforme. So this girl developed a sudden bleeding crustacean after taking amoxicillin. Femphigus vulgaris, an autoimmune mucocutaneous disorder involving the skin and the mucosa. Femphigus is mainly two varieties, Femphigus vulgaris, Femphigus foliaceus, and if there is an accompanying hematological neoplasm, it's called as paraneosplastic Femphigus. The commonest is Femphigus vulgaris, where histologically it causes an intraepithelial clefting or a bulla, which ruptures to form ulcers, are very, very painful conditions. You have a positive Nikolsky stain. You diagnose with a biopsy, which shows an intraepithelial split. You do a direct immunofluorescence and you do an indirect immunofluorescence. This is an intact bulla which ruptures seen on the skin. A femphigus vegetans, which causes a vegetative kind of growth. Erosive lichen planus, again, a chronic inflammatory immune mediated reaction you have a reticular and erosive a papular a annular a plaque and a bullous like a planus which can cause severe burning sensation a lichen planus of the lip with an ulceration at the peripheral radiating strain lichen planus of the skin various disease a hyperkeratotic lesion which is usually seen in children which subsides over a period of time Oral allergy syndrome is a kind of a mild type of hypersensitivity reaction, usually allergy to pollen or footsteps. The patient have a particular footstep, immediately he will complain of a burning sensation. He will develop an erythema over the buccal mucosa or the tongue. It will be slightly painful. So this is an oral allergy syndrome. Stopping the offending footstep with a topical antiseptic exigel or a course of antihistonic will totally correct it. Repeated ingestion of the same medication causing the same reaction at the same site is called as stomatitis medicamentosa. Whereas a lesion which occurs as a result of topical application and contact with the mucosa is called stomatitis veninata. This is again a contact allergic stomatitis to the hair dye what the patient is using. A very common side effect of the common anti-epileptic drug carbamazepine, which we use for trigeminal neuralgia, is called drug-related eosinophilia with systemic symptoms or drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome. The patient will develop a burning sensation, cracking, fissuring, ulcerations of the skin, oral mucosa, which ruptures will have to immediately stop the offending drug, admit the patient, start the patient on IV adrenaline, stop the patient on antihistamine and steroids to bring it under control. Excessive intake of lead or lead poisoning can cause a Burtonian line along the gingival margin. Bismuth poisoning again will cause a brownish black or a bluish black deposition over the neck of the tooth. Dilantin sodium or calcium channel blockers can cause gingival hyperplasia. Antihypertensive drugs, nifedipine, again causes gingival hyperplasia. Finally, rickets or renal rickets because of deficiency of vitamin D. Short stature, hot belly, uh, uh, stubby extremities, uh, dolichocephaly, brachiocephaly, short flattening of the nasal bridge anterior open bite, rachitic or hypoplastic enamel, osteopetrosis or marble bone disease, where the bone density is increased, the marrow spaces is obliterated, microdontia, malformed tooth, any extraction because of a reduced marrow space, the patient will go in for an osteomyelitis. So when you do an extraction for a patient with osteomyelitis, there is a very high chance that the patient will develop osteomyelitis of the jaw. Cledocranial disastrosis or dysplasia. 
absence of the clavicle, the patient can bring both the shoulders together and approximate that frontal mozzi, brachycephaly, and multiple impacted, unerupted teeth, cleidocranial disasters. If you take a skull x-ray, there will be open fontanet or the suture lines will not be closed. Paget's disease, a fibrosis lesion, enlarging skull, enlarging maxilla, enlarging extremities, characteristic bowing. The patient will report with ill-fitting dentures or ill-fitting caps and the patient will die finally of cardiomegaly. So, in a very brief, I've enlisted the prominent or the important orofacial manifestations in various systemic disorders. So, to conclude, make a careful diagnosis, discover the true cause of the disease, careful diagnosis of systemic disease, definitely mouth is a mirror or oral manifestations of systemic disorders is of utmost importance to diagnose the underlying systemic disorders. Thank you all for your patient hearing and wishing you all the very best in your exams and in your career future. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such an enlightening discourse on the topic. Queries will be answered before moving on to the next lecture. So, good morning, sir. Sir, good morning, sir. Sir, can you hear me, sir? So good morning, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, good morning. Good morning. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Sir, yeah. we have a few questions from the participants, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Kanti yeah, asks, is the oral manifestations, uh, we, can we see any early oral manifestations in pre-diabetic conditions when the HPA1C is less than 6.5? Sometimes the patient might report with a burning mouth syndrome or an, or an uneasy feeling. It's more of a BMS, which is usually seen in early pre-diabetic stage before the other lesions actually is visible. So if, if, a, if, a, if a complaint is uh, altered say, taste or an altered sensation, especially a burning sensation, think that, yes, you are looking at a possible diabetic patient. So thank you. Next, moving on to the next one. How much time does HIV virus from the saliva and blood become non-infectious when exposed to air or outer environment? Can you repeat the question? How much time does the HIV hmm. virus from saliva and blood become non-infectious when exposed to air or the outside environment? Uh, I think a microbiologist would be a better person to answer. I'm, I'm not able to give you the exact timing, how long it's, it's infective. Uh, one last question. 
if the patient yeah. has come with the symptoms of acromegaly or gigantism how will we know that yeah. the hyperpituitarism has taken place before or after the joining of the epiphyseal ends usually it is it is age related if it, if it's say in an young individual say about 20 or 25 then yes you you would suspect or below 20 you would suspect it's going to be a pituitary gigantism anything after 18 19 in a female or 21 in a male then you think more in terms of an acromegaly yes sir thank you sir uh, the rest of the questions will be answered through email um, sir we would like to uh, sure. certificate sir congratulations sir thank you very much thank you sir thank you we will now move on to the third session of the day and introduce our eminent speaker dr m shweta ma'am mbbs with a masters in pathology ma'am is working at vishnu dental college as a consultant pathologist as well as for various private hospitals in and around andhra pradesh and telangana she is a senior resident in manipal hospitals junior consultant at kamineni hospital consultant pathologist at bhimvaram hospital and lotus diagnostics She has been recognized for her selfless service at the time of COVID-19 pandemic in surrounding communities of West Godavari district. She has vast clinical expertise in diagnosing various rare medical ailments. Before ma'am begins her topic on the significance of blood parameters in dental practice, I request the participants to kindly post your queries in the chat box which will be subsequently answered at the end of the session. Over to you ma'am. This is Dr. Shweta Manthena, pathologist, who is presenting to you a topic of hematological parameters in dental practice. The importance of the uh, of the subject of hematology even in practice of dent dentistry. So, before we go into the topic proper, I would just like you like to give the importance of pathology. As Sir William Oslo once said, "As is our pathology, so is our practice." that is the importance of the subject of pathology which forms a major bridge between the uh, paraclinical subjects like our anatomy physiology to our clinical subjects so what the pathologist thinks today the physician does tomorrow so it is very very important for a clinician to provide proper history of Uh, what you are you are investigating in the case what you have seen what you have uh, done your examination you need to write properly and give the entire history which will help the pathologist help you in guiding towards a proper diagnosis so what the pathologist thinks today the physician can do tomorrow because the uh, pathologist will guide you in the right way to reach a final diagnosis uh, so Uh, i would like to stress on this point that if, uh, tomorrow as practicing clinicians tomorrow you should be able to give proper clinical history to all your pathologists so that they'll be able to help you in a right way so coming to the topic hematology this is a branch of medicine which is concerned with the study of the cause prognosis treatment prevention of diseases which are related to blood so it involves the production of blood and its components so all the cellular elements of blood like rbc wbc platelets hemoglobin are little rare so and what you need to do if you are seeing any clinically evident signs of any hematological disorders 
we will not go into the topic of coagulation that is the clotting and bleeding disorder so platelets will be dealt in a very small topic i'll just give you a brief outline of platelets but rbc and wbc will be our major topic of concern so as you can see here right from the fifth month of gestation throughout your adult life the only your bone marrow is the system which produces your blood cellular elements but during this fetal early fetal life that is in the first two months of gestation you have the yolk sac which is the only site for the production of your blood cells in the third and the uh, in the third month it is the liver again if you see the production of any of these blood cellular elements outside the bone marrow it is a pathological condition which we call it as extra medullary hematopoiesis right as i have already uh, told you the bone marrow takes up the production of the cells in young children as we grow old the amount of marrow the production part of the marrow reduces in size because we as you know the bone marrow has both yellow fat and your red marrow this red marrow is responsible for the production of the cells as we grow old the amount of fat is uh, keeps replacing the cellular content so uh, when you read a report of bone marrow you will see that ideally the amount of the cellular element should be 100 minus the age of the patient suppose if the age uh, age of the patient is 10 years we are, the per person is supposed to have 90 percent of cellularity in the marrow and as we grow if it is a 50 year old patient you will have only 50 percent cellularity and if it, they reach around 80 years they'll only have 20 percent cellularity all this is considered normal 20 percent cellularity for a for an 80 year old is considered normal but if you see an increase in the cellular content or the product uh, or a reduction in the cellularity it is of concern the bone marrow the, that is a red bone marrow which has cells in it uh, has the hematopoietic stem cells which can differentiate along different lines to give you your peripheral blood cells which are your red cells the white blood cells and the platelets these all these three constitute your peripheral blood system the peripheral blood unit the central unit has only immature forms of your uh, blood cellular elements we'll see what they are in the red bone marrow the multipotent stem cell or the hematopoietic stem cell broadly divides itself into the myeloid stem cell and the lymphoid stem cell the lymphoid stem cell can only differentiate into a b lymphocyte or a t lymphocyte the lymphoid cells are also produced by your lymphoreticular system that is your spleen and your lymph nodes whereas your myeloid stem cells as you can see in this picture it can again differentiate into different lines forming your final um, products of rbc's platelets all your granulocytes like your neutrophils basophils eosinophils and the monocytes as well so as you see in this picture all your cells of your bone marrow are derived from your myeloid stem cell itself and a small part that is your lymphocytes come from a different stem cell which is your lymphoid stem cell this differentiation is important because we again categorize leukemias which are blood malignancies hematological malignancies only in two differential lines one is your myeloid leukemia and the lymphoid leukemia okay that is the importance of the differentiation here as you can see your final products of your uh, granulocytes go through various phases of maturation starting from the blast phase which is a myeloblast it is very very difficult to say whether it is a myeloblast or a lymphoblast just by seeing the morphological appearance of a blast 
when you see it in a bone marrow or in the peripheral blood. It is not, it, it is not easy. We give you a number of differences saying this is a myeloblast, this is a lymphoblast when you're in your second year. But it is not that easy when it comes to clinical practice. So we have evolved over years. So hematology has gone very long. Uh, we have evolved a number of different tests to give you a final diagnosis of leukemias. So as uh, we consider it a blast, but uh, as you, we can differentiate it as a myeloblast, then it becomes a promyelocyte. If you can see in this picture, both the myeloblast and the promyelocyte have the presence of a nucleoli. So till the presence of the nucleoli, a cell has the ability to divide. So these two stages, both are considered as a blast stage. The presence of these blasts in the marrow or in the peripheral blood is always, always abnormal. Your myeloblast and the promyelocytes together constitute only less than 5% of your bone marrow cellularity. If you are seeing it more than uh, the given number, it should, it is a pathological condition. Then this promyelocyte becomes a myelocyte, a metamyelocyte, a band form. From the stage of the myelocyte, these cells start to accumulate number of granules within it. That is why these are called as granulocytes. Depending on the color of the granules within these cells, these are given different names like a neutrophil, eosinophil, and a basophil. So if you can see in this picture, the most uh, mature cell is towards your right hand side. The most immature cells are towards your left hand side. So if we see the presence of any of these abnormal cells or the more immature cells in the peripheral blood, we call it as left shift. We'll come to what, what are these terms again in the next few slides. These are your peripheral blood cells, all of which are your mature cells. As you can see in this picture, your RBC do not have a nucleus. An RBC will never have a nucleus in the peripheral blood. Mature RBCs do not have RBC, uh, do not have a nucleus. If they have any kind of nucleus, they are called as nucleated RBC or erythroblast, the presence of which is again considered pathological. Platelets are the fragmented forms of your megakaryocytes. These also do not have nuclei. So the rest of all these are called your, as your white blood cells. Again, white blood cells are broadly classified as granulocytes and agranulocytes. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils are your granulocytes. Your monocytes and your lymphocytes are your agranulocytes. Now coming to the defects in the RBC. So that is called as anemia. So from, it has been derived from the ancient term, which is anemia, which is lack of blood. It is defined as a reduction in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood designated by the reduction in the PCV as well as the, or the HP content, which is below the normal limit for the age and the sex of the individual. Coming to the symptoms of anemia. Most of the female patients must have experienced it at some or the other point of time. This is very, very common. Iron deficiency anemia is the most common anemia, which is encountered in young children and females. So it is, it will give you a feeling of weakness, dizziness, fatigue, shortness of breath, a climbing a few stairs can give you shortness of uh, breath, uh, irregular heartbeats, which can cause palpitations or uh, even hair loss. Specifically here, I would like uh, you to note that any change in the color of the stool, yellowing of the uh, yellowish discoloration of the eye and the various mucous membranes and the enlargement of spleen. If you have noticed any of these three features in a patient of anemia, think about hemolytic anemia. Hemolysis is nothing but the shorter survival of the RBC, which leads to increased breakdown of these cells, liberating hemoglobin, which again converts itself into bilirubin. This bilirubin gets uh, 
uh, accommodated in different mucosal surfaces and it causes yellowish discoloration of the eye. So if you are noticing any kind of yellowish discoloration of the mucous membranes, change in the color of the stool and hepatosplenomegaly in a patient of anemia, on and off episodes also, you must think about hemolytic anemia. Iron deficiency anemia is by far the most commonest in the clinic in clinical practice and even in in countries like in developing countries like India. So the patients, as I already told you, can give you complaints of severe weakness, shortness of breath, palpitations. You can also notice signs like coilonychia, which is called as spoon-shaped fingers, loss of hair can cause brittle hair. Glossitis is one important oral manifestation where you can see a bald tongue, which can be pale if it is iron deficiency anemia, or it will be red in color when it will be any kind of B12 deficiency anemia. It can also cause stomatitis and chelitis in all these patients. One more symptom which the patients can come to you with is plumber Vincent syndrome. It is because of difficulty in swallowing in patients of iron deficiency anemia because of the formation of post recoid webs so any of these signs and symptoms collectively or individually should give rise to a doubt of anemia and anemia is only a manifestation of a disease if you are trying to diagnose anemia if it is just iron deficiency anemia why is the loss of iron in, is it because of nutritional causes? Is it because of any chronic bleeds from any part of the body? Is it due to any malignancies where the patient is having a chronic bleed? All these are the questions that should arise even if it is a simple case of iron deficiency anemia. Then hemolytic anemias, it is a diagnosis by itself. Nutritional anemias, you can treat the cause. It is, uh, it is easy to diagnose and it can be easily treated. If any of these patients are not responding to the treatment, you should go and look for other causes of this anemia. So anemia is just a manifestation of the disease, internal disease. You should know what is the ultimate diagnosis for all these cases. So <clears throat> when it comes to smear reporting, we always give anemias in the name of normocytic normochromic anemia microcytic my hypochromic anemia or macrocytic anemia so these are the different terms that we use this terminology is used because of the size of the rbc the size of the rbc is normally compared to the size of the uh, nucleus of a small lymphocyte in a peripheral smear but today as we have got number of uh, instruments for this autom uh, for this automation in hematology we easily get red cell indices like mcv so if the mcv is between 80 to 100 then the size of the rbc is normal so it is called as normocytic cell if the size is smaller we call it microcytic if it is larger than 100 femtoliters then we call it as a macrocytic cell in all these cases is the hemoglobin will be low in females it will be less than 12 and in males it will be less than 13 gram per deciliter so when we are reporting it has a macrocytic anemia a normocytic anemia or a microcytic hypochromic anemia it should give you a clear uh, 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 clue to what could be the diagnosis. So if I write microcytic hypochromic anemia, most of the times it is going to be iron deficiency anemia. So you can treat the patient for with iron supplements. If the patient is not responding to therapy even after a month of treatment, then you must also consider these three causes like thalassemia, anemia of chronic disease and sideroblastic anemia, though rare, these could be the other causes for microcytic hypochromic anemia. Coming to normocytic anemia. Normocytic anemias are very common in acute bleeds. For example, a road traffic accident or a surgery could lead to normocytic, normocytic normochromic anemia. Otherwise, we can think about hemolytic anemia. Aplastic anemia is one a rare condition where 
not only RBCs, but also the other cells in the blood reduce in number. We'll come to that topic later. So when we are talking about normocytic anemia, the first thing is rule out any acute cause of bleeding and then rule out other causes of hemolytic anemia or, or anemia of chronic diseases which are due to various other organ uh, dysfunctions in the body like liver, endocrine diseases. So all these have to be ruled out. If we are saying macrocytic anemia, macrocytic anemia most of the times is only due to megaloblastic anemia which is because of B12 or folate deficiency or a collective deficiency of B12 and folate. In some of the smears we write it as dimorphic anemia where we are reporting both microcytic hypochromic cells as well as macrocytes. So it is giving a clinical indication to you that this is on a pure nutritional cause of anemia where you're seeing all iron deficiency, B12 and folate deficiencies in the same person. So he is having some kind of nutritional deficiency. It could be due to any other cause which has to be evaluated and treatment done based on that. Megaloblastic anemias, other than B12 and folate, you should also rule out one important condition which is called as myelodysplastic syndrome, which is a rare condition, but it is a pure hematological cause, which you have to refer it to a clinician itself. Aplastic anemia, alcoholism, liver disease are an, an, are few more conditions where you see this uh, cause of macrocytic anemias. So what are the tests you can advise in different cases of anemia? You can ask for a complete blood picture where you will, you will get the complete information about your red cell count, the hemoglobin, uh, your PCV, red cell indices like MCV, MCH, MCHC, RDW, your white blood cell count and its differentials. You, uh, you the number of platelets and also ask for a peripheral smear where you will get the type of this the size of the cell is there any anisocytosis are there different sh shapes of this rbc for example sickle cell anemia can be easily made out on a smear polychromasia polychromasia is nothing but if there is the presence of immature RBCs in the peripheral blood, you will see a different color of RBC, which are little larger in size than the normal RBC. Those are called as polychrom polychromatophils. So there is excessive production of immature RBC from the bone marrow. It could be a result of the treatment you're giving for any iron deficiency anemia or B12 or it could be because of some pathological condition in the bone marrow itself uh, or a hemolytic condition because of excessive breakdown of rbc in the peripheral blood your central system that is your bone marrow is trying to produce more number of cells the same thing this polychromatophils if you want to uh, easily study it you can ask for a reticulocyte count a reticulocyte count is a special stain where we use in vitro technique where we uh, incubate these rbcs with a special stain which all these immature rbcs take up the stain the nuclear material of the rbc you, as i already told you rbcs do not have any nuclear material so if you are seeing any nuclear material in the rbc in the peripheral blood then it is definitely an immature rbc so this immature rbc can be stained by reticulocyte count this reticulocyte count is very very important in investigating hemolytic anemias in hemolytic anemias there will be a massive increase in the number of reticulocytes iron supply studies to, uh, which is useful in differentiating your different kinds of uh, microcytic pictures like iron deficiency anemia, sideroblastic anemia, anemia of chronic disease. Even if you're not able to rule out, if you're not able to give a proper diagnosis for a cause of anemia, then we go for a bone marrow. I will also give you a list when you have to get a bone marrow done. Please do not write bone marrow for each and every patient. Patient having severe anemia, just a patient walking into your OP, you're seeing any of these conditions. Without doing any investigations, do not ask for a bone marrow. 
the bone marrow will be a final resort where you can get a proper diagnosis. It cannot be the first thing because even we cannot arrive at a diagnosis just by seeing the bone marrow. We have to get all the series of tests done and then we'll come to a final diagnosis. So till now we have covered the topic of RBC parameters. What are the different tests? What could be the likely presentation in the patients? And what you can do in these cases. Now coming to hematological malignancies, which constitutes your WBC disorders. So as I already told you, broadly, these are classified into myeloid and lymphoid. So myeloid, again, we are classifying them as acute leukemias and chronic leukemias. Acute myeloid leukemia, chronic myeloid leukemias. These are the broad classifications of your myeloid neoplasms. Coming to your lymphoid neoplasms, again, they are again classified as ALL, which is acute lymphoblastic leukemia or chronic lymphoid leukemia. Apart from this, uh, as already told in the previous slide, your lymphoid system, your uh, lymphocytes, they do not come only from your bone marrow. You also have solid tissues like your lymph nodes and your spleen, which constitutes the lymphoreticular system that produces these lymphoid cells. So you can also have lymphomas that come into this category. Again, we can have you mixed with myelolymphoid neoplasms and your histiocytic neoplasms, both of which are little rare. So coming to the classification of these leukemias, according to the clinical course, we have acute and chronic type of leukemias. According to the type of cells, they are again classified as myeloid, lymphoid, and one more category, which is important both for the uh, dentist as well as for the clinical practice is plasma cell dyscrasias, which constitutes your multiple myeloma, if there are number of lesions, if it is a single lesion, we call it as plasma cytoma. There are totally four different types of leukemias as elaborated previously told uh, as told. They are AML, ALL, CML and CML. Both acute leukemias, acute lymphoid and acute myeloid, they have common features. It is difficult to differentiate these conditions both clinically as well as hematologically also. When even when you write for the diagnosis just on a peripheral smear, we cannot say whether it is acute lymphoid leukemia or acute myeloid leukemia. So these have common symptoms like these three anemia infections and bleeding all these three are common in both the conditions anemia is because of impaired production of rbcs here in leukemias you see an abnormal proliferation of abnormal cells which are blast cells these blast cells do not have any function it the all these are neoplastic cells which do not have any function so even though the WBC number is high, they cannot have any function of, uh, the main function of our WBC is to combat different kinds of infections. So here the patients again fall sick because of varying infections due to oral cavity and upper respiratory tract infections and a fever. Always in children, remember acute leukemias are more common in the younger age group. ALL is very common less than 10 years of age. Again, it is again common in the elderly, which has a little insidious cause compared to that of the children. If any, uh, if you're in, uh, somebody comes to you with a history of fever and it is not responding to any kind of antibiotics or any treatment, even after a period of one week or 10 days, even uh, after getting all the tests done, if you have a doubt, just write for a peripheral smear. It could save the patient because a few number of blasts can still be formed, even if the count of the WBCs is normal because there are a number of times it is not necessary as we teach to you in classes we tell that leukemia there'll be a count of more than fifty thousand of or more than one lakh it is not necessary most of the times we have all also diagnosed leukemias at a normal wbc count even nine thousand there were blasts so ask for a peripheral smear which could be an important diagnostic approach to these cases bleeding 
petechiae, purpura, gum bleeding, hematuria, and CNS bleeding. All these could be different sites from there the patient can be. The reason for anemia, infections, and bleeding is reduced number of production of RBC, reduced WBC, and reduced platelets. Reduced WBC here means reduced functional WBC. One more important sign that you can see in these patients. This is particularly important for the dental group. Gum hyperplasia. Gum hyperplasia can be the only presenting symptom in cases of AML, which is in monocytic type. M4 and M5 have monocytes. These monocytes have a uh, in, uh, have a uh, uh, proliferation and they can uh, they have a predilection to go and sit in the tissues which will cause gum hyperplasia so if you are seeing patients with gum hyperplasia without any doubt please ask for first ask for the history whether they are using any kind of anti-epileptic drugs even anti-epileptic drugs can give rise to this gum hyperplasia you can also check if the patient is having any kind of uh, uh, all these uh, gum disorders, if not, definitely ask for a peripheral smear. Because I have seen in my early days of practice where the patient uh, who came for a dental, who went for dental treatment for about two months and presented directly to the emergency department. And before we release the report, he was just an 18 year old patient who just succumbed to this condition. Because he was not investigated for this. He was having severe gum hyperplasia for which he was going for treatment. There were no blood tests for this patient. The, the patients also can complain of bone tenderness or bone pains. A classical sign is sternal tenderness. If you just palpate on the sternum for these cases, you will the patients will give you a clinching type of wincing pain which could be another helpful sign in these cases. Abdominal distension, all, if you are suspecting any kind of, if for example, you have seen gum hyperplasia in these cases, also examine for the neck. You may be able to palpate lymph nodes. Okay, uh, uh, just ask the patient to be in supine position, palpate the abdomen, you can also see hepatosplenomegaly. Any of these three conditions, you can notice paler, all your mucosal membranes become pale you can ask the patient if he has any signs of bleeding they will usually tell you because they will have large echimotic patches or on the lower limbs or in the oral cavity they will show you small uh, bleeding sites and they will also complain of frequent bleeding when they brush their teeth or the uh, hematuria or blood in stool, these can be the various presenting symptoms in all these cases. If you have a doubt, just examine, just palpate for all your cervical lymph nodes and also examine the abdomen where you may be able to palpate for the enlarged spleen, uh, spleen and liver, which could be an important sign where you can also diagnose this as a case of acute leukemia. <clears throat> So various presenting features, non-specific symptoms like fatigue, shortness of breath, weakness, pain or tenderness, all these are just because of anemia. The patients can give you a history of weight loss, fever, frequent infections will give you. So please ask for all these conditions if you're suspecting any of these. Examine for the lymph nodes, enlargement of the spleen and liver, and in lymphoma cases, patients will give you history of night sweats, weight loss, easy bleeding and bruising, purplish patches on the spots. These, can, these are the various signs and symptoms of leukemia bar lymphoma in most of our cases. Platelet disorders. As I told you, we will not be discussing. Thrombocytopenia is reduced number of platelets. It is a quantitative disorder because of the decreased production, increased sequestration, and accelerated destruction of the platelets. Thrombocytopathy is because of qualitative platelet disorder. This results from de defect in any of the platelet reactions. So before we go into the oral manifestations, I want you to understand different terms that are used in your hematology reports. 
as previously i've already told you what is a microsite what is a normal site those are for your rbcs when it comes to wbc we you can see different terms terminologies that we use leukocytosis is a benign increase in the number of wbc your normal count of wbc is from 4000 to 12000 if the count is more than 12000 we write it as leukocytosis leukopenia is less than 4000 more than leukocytosis leukopenia is important and it should be investigated because it could simply be a viral uh, condition which can lead to the reduction of the production of these wbcs or it can be various disorders in the bone marrow that is re restricting the number of wbcs so it has to be investigated left shift as previously told if you are seeing more number of immature cells in the uh, uh, peripheral blood then we call it as uh, left shift leukemoid reaction this is again leukemoid it mimics leukemia when the condition can le mimic leukemia the parameters can also mimic leukemia but this is a benign excessive leukocytosis which is more than 50000 exaggerated predominantly by neutrophils more of the mature forms with mild left shift here you will not see any blast this condition has to be differentiated from chronic myeloid leukemia chronic myeloid leukemia the patients most of our patients 95 percent of our patients will present with gross splenomegaly you will never palpate a spleen in a healthy patient in cma you can palpate the spleen as far as up to the umbilicus that is called as gross splenomegaly along with other signs like fever or few other symptoms in such conditions you have to rule out cma leukemoid reaction you will not uh, see a grossly enlarged spleen only the count will mimic like that of a cml you can easily ask for new le leukocyte um, alkaline phosphatase levels in these patients which are elevated in cases of leukemoid reaction whereas it is low in cases of cml one more term is leukoerythroblastic reaction leukoerythroblast as the name itself says there are blasts so there are immature cells both in the lineages of leukocytes and erythrocytes so leukocytosis with left shift accompanied by nrbc this condition must be evaluated again because bone marrow usually in these cases shows infiltrative disorder this is a pathological condition so whether you are investigating the rest of it or not leukopenia and leukoerythroblastic reaction both mandate any kind of uh, most of these cases you we have to do bone marrow examination to see what is the cause of the reduction in the number or the more number of immature forms in the peripheral blood so i want you all of you to be familiar with these terms leukocytosis leukopenia left shift leukemoid reaction and leukoerythroblastic picture one more terminology is pancytopenia pancytopenia where all the three uh, uh, there is reduction in all the three lineages so hb will be low in these cases wbc number is low and platelets are also low then it is called as pancytopenia this condition of pancytopenia could simply be because of some medications that the patient is taking few infections or nutritional conditions like b12 folate deficiencies where if you just treat the case with b12 folate uh, supplements and also discontinue the medications the patient's counts will improve if you are if you are taking a proper history otherwise it is again a pathological condition where you have to investigate what are the other causes it could be due to various malignancies like as i told leukemia need not always present with a high wbc count it can come with a normal count it can also come with low counts it could be plain leukemia leuke leukopenia or it could be pancytopenia so it is important to investigate these cases 
multiple myeloma where this is a, where there is excessive production of plasma cells even there the plasma cells will uh, completely occupy the bone marrow not giving space for the production of the other cellular components myelodysplastic syndrome metastasis any other epithelial malignancies which can go and infiltrate the bone marrow also reduce the number of the uh, the normal uh, cellular components even non malignant conditions like fibrosis of the bone marrow infections storage disorders in young children can present with pancytopenia sepsis when the patient is having severe sepsis and also sequestration sequestration is all these uh, your bone marrow is producing good number of cells but they are not coming into the peripheral blood so they are going and hiding in a different place that is called as splenic sequestration in splenic sequestration the spleen enlarges in size enlarges in size to massive size again presenting with gross splenomegaly that condition is called as hypersplenism so in hypersplenism just remove the spleen the counts will automatically improve this is not because of the central disorder it is because of sequestration so these are the various pathological conditions where the patient is presenting with pancytopenia so it is a treatable condition in most of the uh, uh, in most of the disorders but we also have to know whether we are uh, uh, missing any kind of malignancies so these are all the different conditions where we see pancytopenia so any report you are seeing pancytopenia kindly refer this patient to a hematologist or a physician they will take care of the case so now i would like to give a list of what are the different indications for bone marrow just simply writing bone marrow for anemia or just platelets have reduced i want a bone marrow this is not the way so if we you we were not able to explain the cause of anemia you have done all your tests you have still not ruled uh, you have not given a proper diagnosis then you can ask for anemia that is unexplained anemia unexplained thrombocytopenia there are most of our cases are itp or due to different viral conditions once the fever comes down the patient's platelets will automatically improve itp could be due to different viral conditions again where it's it is suppressing for a period of time here you can just put the patient on steroids where the patient will improve automatically if even then they are not improving then ask for a bone marrow pancytopenias you must ask for a bone marrow lymphoproliferative disorders any enlargement of the lymph nodes which are pathological abnormal cells if you are writing any kind of atypical cells or reactive atypical cells in the uh, peripheral blood definitely ask uh, or i am writing there are nucleated rbc of good number just two or three um, nucleated rbc uh, not necessary in every case so abnormal cells in the peripheral blood definitely you must investigate diagnosis and staging of lymphomas and leukemias it must be done leukemias though they are diagnosed on peripheral smear see on a peripheral smear we will just give the report of acute leukemia we will not write whether it is all or aml for that we have to you have to again ask for this Um, bone marrow examination in the bone marrow again we will write it is thought to be aml or all after this again it is sent for various other studies where a final report is given to you and then the treatment is done if you are suspecting any metastasis then you can ask for a bone marrow in cases of lymphomas and leukemias after starting treatment again the patient after few cycles of chemotherapy we are asked to see for minimal residual disease is there any amount of residual disease in this patient for this regular examination of the bone marrow is done for these cases any chromosomal abnormality immunodeficiency syndromes and one more important reason where you can ask for this bone marrow is fever of unknown origin sometimes it is very very difficult to investigate the cause of fever where the patient will have a prolonged history of more than a month or two months who is not responding there we have uh, reported cases where malaria you will see the parasite sitting inside the bone marrow falciparum usually or 
tuberculosis, where granulomas are seen within the bone marrow. These are two various important conditions in India also, where even histoplasma can present with all these signs of fever, where you are not getting the peripheral cause, why the patient is having fever. Then you can definitely ask for bone marrow. Remember, bone marrow is a very painful procedure. So before asking for a bone marrow, do all your tests by non-invasive procedures when you are not able to reach to a diagnosis then you can ask for bone marrow aspiration and biopsy aspiration we only collect little amount of bone marrow which comes as blood for a biopsy we go little more internal and take a piece of bone which is little more expensive it is more painful to the patient so before asking all these procedures let's get all our investigations done prior to that and then go for the bone marrow what are the various oral manifestations in hematological diseases so the patients can present with gingival bleeding which could be spontaneous or just by gently probing the patient can give you a difficulty in controlling bleeding by usual procedures history of bruising easily with large ecchymosis, numerous petechial areas, marked paler of the mucous membrane, atrophy of the papillae, or a persistent sore or painful tongue. Even soft tissue lesions can be seen for various blood disorders. So we'll see a few examples of this. So simple nutritional deficiency can present. Your iron deficiency anemia, it will present as a pale, bald tongue which is called as glossitis and angular stomatitis and chelitis. Whereas a beefy tongue is seen in uh, megaloblastic anemia. Sickle cell anemia, mandibular osteomyelitis, enamel hypomineralization and diastema. As I already told you, when you examine these cases, the patients will have failure to thrive. They do not grow normally because of persistent attacks of this hemolysis, the patients will have on and off episodes of jaundice, which the parents will report to you. You can examine for the sclera, they will have jaundiced sclera. So all this will give you a hint of hemolysis. And these are very, very common in this part of Andhra Pradesh, <clears throat> the coastal areas. Thalassemia, you will see a classical thalassemic facy where there is overgrowth of the maxilla. They will have frontal bossing. They will have a large head. And when even if you do a simple test like an x-ray, you will see crew cut appearance of the skull. All these are important clinical features of uh, hemolytic anemias. So when we are diagnosing any, uh, when we are diagnosing anemia, if you, if you want to rule out the different causes of blood loss, if it is just a normocytic normochromic picture, it could be just because of acute bleed. Any chronic bleed, it could manifest as iron deficiency anemia with reduced MCV, MCH, serum uh, iron. So it will manifest more like microcytic hypochromic picture. Decreased production of the RBC from the bone marrow itself because of iron deficiency, B12 folate deficiency, aplastic anemia as already told, it will present with pancytopenia, not just as anemia. Anemia of chronic disease of different organ disorders. So see whether the patient is having any other organ disorder. Marrow infiltration. So you can ask for simple creatine bilirubin all these are various systems you can investigate simply by doing various uh, blood investigations so hemolysis you will rule out by doing a reticulocyte count and bilirubin these are two important tests you can ask when you are suspecting hemolysis bilirubin with a particular increase in the unconjugated bilirubin the, in the smear sometimes we may see spherocytes depending on that Afterward, after which, if it is sickle cell or thalassemia, you can ask for HB electrophoresis. Simply by collecting the sample, you can get the electrophoresis report. If there is any disorder, it will be reported in that. You can ask for a Coombs test or a, a direct Coombs test or an indirect Coombs test, which will help you to rule out autoimmune causes of hemolytic anemias. These are the most commonest kind of anemias we come across. The rest are rare. So first rule out iron deficiency anemia, B12, folate, hemolytic anemia. These are the commonest, after which you can, an anemia of chronic disease due to various other organs. 
So simple blood tests can give you a more clear diagnosis for what is the cause of anemia. Then you have to rule out the systemic cause, then the patient will start improving. Now, coming to leukemias, as already told, M4, M5, which is due to monocytic or monoblastic kind of leukemias, they have a predilection to go and sit in the tissues. So it causes gum hyperplasia. Gum bleeds, mucosal bleeds and petechia. Always rule out whether the patient is on any kind of drugs like calcium channel blockers, cyclosporins or any kind of anti-epileptic drugs. If not, again examine for the mucosa so that you will see any um, inflammatory conditions or infective conditions there. If not, definitely get a peripheral smear done in this case. A simple peripheral smear, 300 rupees, they can solve many of the um, different uh, hematological disorders. Lymphomas can present as cervical lymphadenopathy or tonsillar enlargement. Burkitt's lymphoma, which is less common in this part of the world, can present as a large extranodal swelling like a jaw swelling. So you must always exclude all other infective causes. Like any uh, abscesses also can present similar conditions. If you're ruling out, then examine and uh, get these tests done. Multiple myeloma can or eight to fifteen percent of the myeloma, multiple myeloma can present as primary jaw lesions. It usually manifests as a soft tissue or a bony hard lesion at the angle of the mandible, ramus, or the premolar region. So when you, uh, if you are suspecting something, first when you do a skull X-ray. It could be plasma cytoma. If it is plasma cytoma, it will present as a radiolucent area in the X-ray as a single lesion. If it is multiple myeloma, you will also be able to see number of other lytic areas in the skull. So if it is a single lesion, you also have to rule out other cysts, abscess. It could be a squamous cell carcinoma invasion or metastatic deposits, a brown tumor or LCH, which is Langhans cell histiocytosis. If for a single lesion, multiple myeloma, you will see number of lytic lesions. So these are um, various blood malignancies which have to be ruled out. So what is our approach? So first, if you are suspecting leukemia clinically, ask for a complete blood picture with a peripheral smear. If we are reporting any cytopenias or any blasts, at the end, we will give it as pancytopenia for evaluation. If you are, we are not able to see any blasts clearly, if we are reporting any blasts, then we just give it as acute leukemia. We do not classify the type of leukemia. Then you must ask for bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, which is again sent for higher studies like cytochemistry, which are simple stains. We can also ask for... Um, immunophenotyping that is flow cytometry and even immune uh, cytogenetics depending on this today we uh, previously we used to classify leukemias just based on the morphological uh, classification where we used to just write the type of the cell today we are going for who classification which is a more detailed classification where even cytogenetics is important and there is targeted therapy for each of the classified leukemias so immunophenotyping and all the cytochemistry with the cytogenetics and fish are done in these cases to classify and for a proper treatment. So a proper investigation, acute leukemia does not give much time. Uh, a case of AML M3, that is, um, it, uh, I was talking to you about M4 and M5. M3 is again a clinical emergency, where it has to be immediately referred. This is the only report we will write even on peripheral smear if you are suspecting AML M3. Plasma cell dyscrasias, this, is, this can be a little easy to diagnose, where simple X-ray can give you... Um, a clinical diagnosis. You can ask for a urine examination where we see Benstone's proteins. Here there is high production of light chains from the plasma cells. So these plasma, so these uh, light chains produce plasma proteins which go and sit in the kidneys. So they affect the uh, 
clinical uh, the functioning of the kidney so there is impairment of the kidney function there is increased number of m protein which can be done by uh, protein electrophoresis which is a simple test and it can be done creatine levels increase the patient has anemia in such smears we can we will always write about the formation of role uh, role formation if you are writing in any of elderly patients then always think about uh, plasma cell discretion. So we may not be able to see a plasma cell directly in the peripheral blood. Most of it, the times we, we are not able to see it in the peripheral blood. It is usually reported in the bone marrow. The levels of calcium come down, then you can ask for a bone marrow biopsy or an aspiration. This is one more important condition uh, which I wanted to tell you at the end of this session which is called as numb chin syndrome. This is a very, very rare manifestation of hematological malignancies where the patients may come to their dentist complaining of uh, anesthesia or paresthesia of the lower lip and this uh, area of the skin. This could be, uh, be uh, this is a pathological condition which is most of the times associated with malignancies and particularly lymphomas. Even other malignancies can also present with this Namchin syndrome. The patient will classically tell you a history, a unilateral history where the mental nerve is affected, where they have uh, loss of sensation, tingling or paresthesia in this part of the chin below the lower lip. So mostly uh, involved by lymphomas. This is a paraneoplastic syndrome. It, if you have ruled out all other conditions of uh, malignancies, it could also be due to a neurodegenerative disorder, which is called as multiple sclerosis. So these are the most important presenting signs and symptoms for different cases of uh, oral manifestations of these hematological disorders. If they are presented with Namchin syndrome, you can ask for a PET scan because most of the times, 95% of the times, there will be some kind of malignancy which can be detected on a PET scan. Or you have to individually do different kinds of scans in these patients. Thank you very much. So this, this is a final uh, slide which is uh, elaborates the same thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, for providing your expert knowledge on this topic. Uh, the interpretation of the blood report was uh, really useful to us as uh, dentists. Uh, we have a few queries, uh, one of which is, what is the reason for leukemic gingivitis? Leukemic gingivitis is particularly seen in M4, M5, which is because of monoblasts or monocytes. Monocytes, though they are present in the blood, they have a predilection to... Uh, uh, migrate into the tissues. So because there are more number of monocytes and monoblasts, normally we have only 2 to 5% or less than 10% uh, of cells which constitute these monocytes. When they are increased in number, they particularly migrate to the tissues. So we see tissue infiltration which manifests as gums, uh, gum enlargement. So you have to rule out even other causes of medications and all other gingivitis, then ask for a peripheral smear. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, due to the time constraint, we'll be moving on. Uh, the other questions will be answered later through mail. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll, we would like to display your uh, certificate. Thank you, ma'am. It is my privilege to introduce to you all the speaker of the topic corticosteroids in dentistry, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Ma'am, alumni of Vishnu Dental College. 
She completed her MDS in oral medicine and radiology in Vishnu Dental College and is now pursuing PhD from Maharashtra University of Health Sciences. Madam is also working as associate professor in the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology at Government Dental College and Hospital, Mumbai, and is a recognized undergraduate and postgraduate teacher. Ma'am has an experience of 10 years and is a research associate of the Research Society of Government Dental College, Mumbai. Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Ma'am has 10 national and interna 60 national and international publications, two patents and two copyrights to her name. She is the proud recipient of several awards for best paper and research at national conferences. Ma'am is competent in handling cone beam computer tomography and lasers and is the associate editor, ASDS and reviewer for various journals. Once again, I would like to remind dear students to post topic related questions in the chat box. I now invite Ma'am to take center stage. A very good morning to all the postgraduates. I hope all of you are having a wonderful learning experience at Vishnu Adhyaya. Myself, I'm Dr. Vijay Lakshmi and I'm here to present to you corticosteroids in dentistry. Before I start with the presentation, I would like to thank the organizing committee, VDC Bhimbara. The following are the contents for presentation. Corticosteroids are considered as important hormones that regulate various pharmacological actions in the body. They are the hormones that are secreted from the cortex of the adrenal glands. Collectively, they are either called as corticoids or steroids in general practice. The medicinal practice has been revolutionized by the use of corticosteroids. Dentistry is no exception to this. Corticosteroids are finding its own role in various diseases or the treatment of various ailments that the dentistry is facing with. A word of caution here is corticosteroids are considered as the double-edged sword. So you have efficient treatment and equivalent adverse effects with the use of corticosteroids. So C for corticosteroids and C for caution. By mid of 19th century, the importance of adrenaline glands were identified because of the corticosteroids which are considered essential for the existence. The Nobel Prize in Medicine was given to three people, the Kendall, Hench and Ritzstein for their contribution for the invention of corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are secreted from the adrenaline glands, a suprarenal glands that are present which secrete these steroids by the help of cholesterol. The, the physiology can be explained as an HPA axis, which can be depicted in the particular slide, wherein you can observe the higher centers, signal the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary gland, which is in response to the alteration or the stress the body is facing with. This particular stress or the response to the stress is the release of ACTH. ACTH regulates the secretion of the cortical hormones or the corticosteroids. There is a dotted line which you can appreciate in the slide which is uh, describing about the inhibition. So in natural process, once the corticosteroids that are required are produced or biosynthesized, they cannot be stored for longer duration of time. The stress period is over. There are free molecules which are circulating in the circulation which are detected by the receptors and the negative feedback is sent to the higher centers or the pituitary gland to stop the production of ACTH. Thus, this is the control or the synthetic and inhibitory mechanism that exists. Whenever you give corticosteroids to the patient, the, this natural process of production of steroids is hampered. It is slightly reduced. As the dosage of the synthetic corticosteroids are given continuously, there is a suppression of this HPA axis. So this is an important mechanism which everyone should understand whoever tries to use the corticosteroids in their general practice. If you see on this, this 
particular figure is showing the diurnal variations of corticosteroids. You have the maximum potency of production that is seen early in the mornings, which can be an important point to be noted when the particular dosing of corticosteroids have to be done for efficient working. So you have to give the dosage of the corticosteroids for it to be very beneficial early in the mornings. The structure of corticosteroid molecule is 21 carbon ring structure which is having four rings joined together or fused together. This particular four rings, three of the rings are the cyclohydate pen and the one ring is phenantherin ring. So it is described as cyclopentanoperhydrophenantherin nucleus. If you notice this particular picture is showing certain substitutes which are attached at different sites of this chemical uh, structure which give rise to various new or the uh, other corticosteroid molecules from this. There are various classifications available for corticosteroids but the one which is useful which can be uh, made available for the pioneers in the field to select an appropriate corticosteroid for the treatment is important. If you see the first slide the first picture in the slide that is uh, from our own very uh, textbook which we all have studied in the pharmacology which differentiates or classified corticosteroids into um, intermediate acting, short acting and the long acting depending on the duration of the action. The second classification is depending on the number of carbon atoms and the third classification is depending upon the chemical structure and the physiological effect of the uh, corticosteroid use. Among this particular classification, the most accepted one and which find the clinical relevance is the first one which is on the duration of the corticosteroid action. Corticosteroids are absorbed effectively by different, that is oral, parenteral and topical group. Bioavailability of corticosteroids which are synthetically produced and that is when we give a dosing of corticosteroids are considered to have a greater bioavailability and duration of action is also more. The distribution of corticosteroids is mostly plasma protein bound, that is 90% is bound to proteins. It is metabolized in the liver by conjugation and reduction reactions and they are excreted in the urine to major amounts and very small amounts are excreted in the bile. So revise again an important observation that I want you people to make here is the topical corticosteroids when given for certain duration of time can also result in systemic administration or systemic absorption. This has a effect on the HPA axis. So we as dentists, we use most of the corticosteroids either topical or local applications. So this forms an important point which we should note. There are various mechanisms of actions of corticosteroids, the pharmacological actions and the therapeutic actions. We will deal the pharmacological actions in detail, but this particular picture I have put specifically for the students to note how this particular sphere is divided into two halves. One half is showing how beautiful the actions of steroids are. And the second half, the below half is equivalently showing the side effects or the adverse effects that the steroids can exert. Mechanism of action of corticosteroids, in addition to what all we have seen in the previous slide, the majorly explored action is the anti-inflammatory action. This particular figure is depicting the cascade of events that are taking place at the anti-inflammatory action. The corticosteroids find its way into the cell structure and it enters or the penetrates the cell binding to the high affinity cytoplasmic receptors. Here are the cytoplasmic receptors that it binds to. There are structural changes that occur in the steroid receptor complex which allows the migration of this complex into the nucleus. Now here there is a transcription that is happening specifically to a specific mRNA which in turn you have to uh, note this, this particular complex that is your corticosteroid and the glucocorticoid receptor forms 
a combination of uh, uh, molecule that is entering the nucleus or the chromatin where in the transcription results in the production of proteins there are two protein synthesis one is the protein synthesis which exerts anti inflammatory action one arm can be a catabolic which can block the production of this protein synthesis so now these proteins which are produced exert the anti inflammatory action most of us are aware this particular picture which is uh, seen or we have all study in relation to the action of the nsx this cascade is anti inflammatory action of nsx if you notice nsx are known to be affecting the anti inflammatory known to have the anti inflammatory action and they affect the arm of arachidonic acid conversion the cyclooxygenase pathway is blocked whereas the steroids are known to block the arachidonic acid production by blocking the phospholipase a2 so both the arms of this particular chain are blocked by usage of corticosteroids so it is a potent anti inflammatory action when compared to nsx coming to the pharmacological action corticosteroids have metabolic effects on the carbohydrates and proteins so there is glycogen formation and gluconeogenesis that is happening in addition to this there is resistance to insulin so a diabetic like state is formed now this is uh, more of theory but a uh, practical application is very important to be understood in this aspect this is an experiment was done in the animal wherein adrenalectomy was done so pay, uh, this animal was subjected to starvation and then the particular results were very um, astonishing wherein they have found that the glycogen deposits were deplenished and the patient suffered with hypoglycemia and fatal complications occurred so this can be understood that the importance of this carbohydrate metabolism is providing continuous nutrition to the brain in uh, in the existence of no supply that is uh, if the person is starving still you have continuous supply of glucose coming to the protein metabolism you have the protein uh, breakdowns which can be depicted in the form of muscle wasting there is lipolysis that is seen with the use of corticosteroids which is a permissive action there are two actions of corticosteroids that is direct action and the second is permissive action this particular lipolysis results in redistribution of the fat so you have the truncal fat uh, very prominently seen which is uh, depicted as moon faces fish mouth or buffalo hump whereas peripheral structures are thinned up the reason for this could be the increased sensitivity of the adipocytes to the insulin and reduced sensitivity of this adipocytes to the corticosteroids that are used an important uh, aspect of corticosteroids is maintenance of electrolyte and water balance the ecf volume is maintained with the mineral corticosteroids that are used the mechanism is very uh, simply explained in the textbook as reabsorption of the sodium from the distal convoluted tubules this results in hyponatremia and further which can corresponding to hyperkalemia and other aspects cvs is been affected very much with the use of corticosteroids there is capillary permeability changes tone of the arterioles are changes changed and the contractility of the myocardium is changed there is also a pressure effect on the adrenaline which raises the bp with the use of corticosteroids skeletal muscles as i explained muscle wasting that is seen with the lysis of the protein that we have seen it also has a direct effect on the skeletal muscles central nervous system there are changes of the mood that can be appreciated with the use of corticosteroids a mild euphoria like stage is seen initially at the start or the beginning of the therapy the gastric structures because of the pro prostaglandin inhibition or the production of prostaglandin is uh, reduced there is more of gastric acid pepsin uh, secretion and peptic ulcer formation the cells of the blood rbcs 
neutrophils and platelets are unaffected whereas the other wbcs are affected they are reduced in number it is found to be an important or efficient immunosuppressant majorly because of its action on the cell mediated immunity it has affinity to t lymphocytes so this may be the reason why it can be used for different hypersensitivity allergic and other leukemias lymphomas that are associated with t lymphocytes the cell cell division and the growth are retarded with the use of corticosteroids so this may be the reason why you have the delayed wound healing calcium metabolism is affected by two ways either increased excretion or decreased absorption this is the reason why you have the decreased osteoid formation and osteoporotic changes so this completes the actions both pharmacological action and therapeutic action which we have discussed that is the anti inflammatory action coming to the indications of corticosteroids which can be broadly categorized into endocrine and non endocrine disease related indications the replacement therapy which can be targeted to acute adrenal insufficiency chronic adrenal insufficiency or addison's disease and the congenital adrenal hypoplasia the pharmacotherapy related to non endocrine diseases are depicted in this particular slide i am going to talk about the indications related to the non endocrine disease which can be at, uh, related to the dental perspective how we can use corticosteroids in dentistry before we start with the application part it is wise to understand what are the cautions or the contraindications that are there with the use of corticosteroids so this is a list of relative contraindications of corticosteroids you have to be very careful whenever you are giving corticosteroids to a person who is having history of having any of the following diseases this is a beautiful chart that i have come across in an article where in the contraindications are divided as per the mode of application or the route of administration of corticosteroids if you note majorly all the possible uh, uh, lesions required or the that are encountered in dentistry required topical application or intralesional application so the contraindications or the um, the manifestation the contraindications of topical applications are skin atrophy hypopigmentation oral thrush or secondary infections that are mostly encountered if intralesional injections are given mucosal atrophy is very commonly encountered you have to understand and again re capitulate the last slide which we have discussed the topical application can also result in systemic absorption of corticosteroids so this contraindications which are depicted under the heading of systemic should also be kept in mind these are the different side effects i think almost all parts of the body are affected with the corticosteroid use so we are in a position to justify whether the benefits are weighing more or the side effects to remember the side effects easily a mnemonic can be given that is again corticosteroids wherein c is cushing syndrome osteoporosis reduced growth thinning of the skin immunosuppression cataracts edema suppression of hpa axis teratogenic mood disturbances rise in the blood pressure obesity increased hair growth diabetes try on the skin these are the different corticosteroids which are commercially available and which we use in the dental practice their trade names and the dosages and mode or route of administrations are given one important and interesting finding that i have found in spite of using corticosteroids for many years we still see the patient to use corticosteroid in the form of ointment or a local application telling them that you take this medication apply into the area two to three times you have to use it but we have never seen the particular uh, aspect that is given in this particular slide wherein they have given the trimsulosan acetonide which is again is a commonly prescribed the corticosteroid topically of 0.1% can be applied for 10 applications per day if the contact time is around 5 minutes 
on the other hand the most potent clobetazole the corticosteroid of 0.05 percent should be advised for two to three applications per day and the contact time or the application time should be five minutes so hereby there is a small correction we can make instead of asking the patient or relying completely on the patient's response of application and how long he is going to keep we can advise that the particular application should be kept for five minutes and after that they can switch them out so here we complete with the basics and coming to a dental application part before going into the implications of corticosteroids in dentistry i would like to refresh upon certain important guidelines of use of corticosteroids in dentistry Corticosteroids are very important molecules. They are naturally occurring and you are going to give the patient some synthetic corticosteroids. So here you have to understand the HPA axis. Synthetic corticosteroids when given, slowly they reduce the production of the natural corticosteroids. In due course of time, you may find the HPA axis is suppressed completely and you do not have corticosteroid production. It is completely on the synthetic corticosteroid that you are giving. So in this case, if the patient is coming and you are scared that there is delayed wound healing, there is infection spread, and you ask the patient to stop the corticosteroids, it may result in HPA suppression and the fatal complications related to that. So never ask the patient to stop the corticosteroids completely or abruptly. There is a guideline which are given in the textbook. Again, I am sticking to the textbook because it is very important that the basic exams has certain aspect of your textbook reading too. So routine dental procedures, if the patient is having corticosteroid usage within one month period of time, then you can ask the, to continue the maintenance for that dose that patient is taking. If it is beyond one month of time and the dosage is around physiological limit, that is 20 to 30 milligrams, then you can give, uh, if it is beyond one month, then you can need not worry about it. This may not be the scenario in the cases where there is more of stress. That is in the cases of multiple teeth extraction or surgeries or extensive procedures, wherein definite stress is found in the patient. In that cases, if the patient is taking corticosteroids two weeks and he has reported to you within one month of time, you have to double the dose. This particular doubling of the dose is very important to combat the stress. In addition to the uh, dosage changes, you have to remember that the corticosteroids are associated with a lot of adverse effects. So pay attention and monitor the patient very carefully critically whenever a corticosteroid is given. Coming to the different branches of dentistry that we have applications of steroids, one branch that is found most commonly utilizing the corticosteroids is oral medicine and radiology. For us to understand and remember them easily, these categories have been given as ulcerovesiculobulus, precancerous lesions, benign lesions, salivary gland diseases, neuralgias and lesions of temporomandibular joint. Coming to the ulcerovesiculobulus lesions, this is the main area where corticosteroids have been used as the etiology is commonly an autoimmune or inflammatory in origin, corticosteroids are found to be very useful. Again, a word of caution here, always remember corticosteroids are given either as a palliative or empirical therapy. The etiology of the disease is still existing. So you have to make efforts to treat the etiology in addition to treating the symptoms associated with the disease. Coming to the precancerous lesion, oral submucous fibrosis precancerous lesion, lichen planus, can be treated very efficiently with corticosteroids. Benign lesions like hemangiomas, central gen cell granulomas can be treated with steroids. Salivary gland disease like mucosal, neuralgias, post herpetic neuralgia, Bell's palsy, arthritis, that is temporal arthritis, diseases of temporomandibular joint, that is osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis can be treated very efficiently with the use of corticosteroids. Coming to the second branch, which is being uh, utilizing corticosteroids, not to the extent of oral medicine and radiology or oral pathology is endodontics. 
here corticosteroids are used as a dressing that is the restoration or the dressing a cavity liner and also as intracanal medicam the basic principle of using uh, steroids as a liner is reducing the thermal sensitivity associated with the restoration using it as the intracanal medicament has been associated with reduced post operative pain and the resorption that is seen in the roots they are commercially available as leather mix there are some more combinations that are available in the market which are utilized but a continuous studies or the rcts in relation to the usage of corticosteroids are still awaited the next branch wherein corticosteroids have been utilized is the periodontology there are uh, this particular uh, studies related to the periodontal aspect is very sparse in relation to periodontology corticosteroids induced osteoporosis osteoporosis or the periodontium that is affected is a major complication or observation that is seen in relation to the periodontal applications of steroids one another application of steroids is in the treatment of desquamative gingivitis that is a in the domain of periodontology applications of corticosteroids in orthodontia it might be very interesting one to understand how the tooth movement is taking place inflammation is considered to be a prerequisite for the orthodontic treatment and the corticosteroids are actually stopping the inflammatory process all the molecules all the elements that are involved with the inflammation are suppressed or reduced so there is more bone resorption less of bone formation so the treatment that is going to be taking place is not according to the force that is applied but it is upon the corticosteroid drug dosage and its frequency or the duration for which the patient is taking so in a nutshell the final consideration for orthodontic related corticosteroid you say it is essential that the patients are questioned about the use of corticosteroids in the orthodontic practice orthodontic treatment patient should give uh, patient should be given a differentiated treatment intervals wherein longer visits longer duration intervals can be given because the expected outcome may not be given uh, expected outcome cannot be observed when the person is on the corticosteroids there is a need for ordering a regular radiographic examination when the patient is using corticosteroids and where the orthodontic treatment is undergoing second important branch where corticosteroids has established its importance is maxillofacial surgery it is a regular practice that the oral surgeons inject corticosteroids in the vicinity of the uh, surgical area that is third molar disimpaction or minor surgeries it is very important that one should understand that particular strategy or the guidelines that are given to enumerate the guidelines please uh, note the table that i have given here if it is a conservative dentistry or dental oral surgery which is under under local anesthesia steroids if the patient is taken in previous 12 months that is before 1 year no cover is required if the steroids the patient is taking within the 12 months of period give the oral dose that the patient is usually taking double the dose if required if the patient currently on the corticosteroid use you have to double the dose on the day of surgery to combat the stress if the surgeries are considered to be intermediate or moderate in intensity that is they produce moderate stress like intermediate surgeries multiple extraction or the surgeries under ga if the patient is currently on the steroids you have to double the steroid dose a day before on the day of surgery and maintain the dose following to the surgery you always remember to taper the dose and do not abruptly stop stop the use of steroids the stressful situations here the corticosteroid supplementation protocol in the stressful situations the mild cases as we have discussed moderate cases and the severe cases the basic principle wherein this corticosteroids have been utilized is reducing the post operative pain and the swelling associated with this 
The next branch where corticosteroids have been utilized is orthodontia. The important uh, ac uh, application of corticosteroids is the healing of healing rather than healing. It is the pre-prosthetic surgeries wherein uh, the inflammatory inflammatory aspect is addressed. But there is an hypothesis that is uh, made wherein corticosteroid use has resulted in implant failures. This needs a long-term studies and a an, uh, randomized control trials, which is lacking in the literature. But uh, because of the osteoporotic change or the effect of corticosteroids uh, on the bone, it is presumed that the implant failures can be attributed if the person is having a history of long-term use of corticosteroids. Pediatric dentistry, again, it is uh, seen that corticosteroids have been used for many uh, various medical ailments that the child suffers and he may be one of the dental patient to you so you have to be cautious in treating this patient with, with remembering all the actions that the corticosteroids have there is a newer corticosteroid which is called as delza Paco, which is considered to be um, good in pediatric population because it doesn't have direct effect on the growth so growth modifications are not seen with this newer corticosteroid. So we have done with the basics and now there are a lot of questions that are coming to your mind about the interesting facts, what will be asked in the examination. So they will be asking you very common questions that is rule of two. What is rule of two? Adrenocortical suppression is suspected when the patient reporting to you has history of use of corticoid therapy for 20 milligrams of the dosage or equivalent or above of the cortisone is taken via oral or parenteral route for continuous period of two weeks or longer. And the patient has this particular usage within six months to two years of therapy. This is important as the HPA suppression can be suspected in this patient. So you need to modify or tailor your treatment depending upon the history that the patient is giving. Pulse therapy. I think all the oral lesions uh, related uh, to the chronic inflammatory changes, PEM figures, I think you must have all heard this term pulse therapy. This is a therapy wherein the high concentration of the steroids are given for shorter period of time. If you see this particular picture here, this is the DCP, the dexamethasone and cyclophosphamide pulse therapy that is given in the treatment of pemphigus. The advantage of using the pulse therapy is you gain greater efficacy of the drug and faster response. It avoids the need for long-term usage of corticosteroids which are associated with actual adverse effects associated with the duration of the treatment. It also has an effect of corticosteroid sparing action because you are combining some other immunosuppressant act, uh, active ingredient into your protocol. There are some more pulse therapies which are clinically used. They are DAP therapy, which is dexamethasone azathioprine pulse therapy. There is a DMP therapy, which is dexamethasone methotrexate therapy, which is used in the chronic inflammatory conditions. To minimize the effects of corticosteroid therapy, that is, you have a secondary infection or super added infection of candidal function, uh, candidal infection, you can use probiotics, which are seen to be very crucial in minimizing these effects. Some more facts cortisol is called as life protecting hormone. As HPA axis is suppressed, so the response towards the life threatening actions or the stress is disturbed. So cortisol maintains this particular response, the SPA axis stimulation and inhibition. Aldosterone, that is a mineral corticosteroid, has a life-saving hormone. As I have explained in the pharmacological actions, the ECF is maintained because ECF or electro, uh, electrolyte balance is maintained with the aldosteroid. Before starting with the steroid, there is a checklist that you all must be knowing and must be noting down. That is, you have to take a complete history related to the medications taken, blood pressure, 
blood sugar should be monitored and measured every visit the patient comes to you keep a check on the viral infections and bacterial infection which can grow or flourish when the patient is on this immunosuppressive therapy osteoporosis is seen so keep a regular watch on the vitamin d levels and dexa scans can be ordered peptic ulcer diseases as most of the side effects which have been described the disturbing side effect is the peptic ulcer during the follow up of the patient which can be done monthly or six monthly you need to watch uh, keep a watch on the patient's bp weight height if it is a patient or child patient and then every six months you can have a ophthalmic evaluation because it is associated with glaucoma steps of weaning corticosteroids always remember that dividing each daily dose is very important that is you have to give a considerable amount of the dosage in the morning for it to be effective in treatment and then you can give the afternoon dose begin reducing the afternoon dose don't try to cut down whenever you want to stop the cortical steroid when you are tapering it pay attention that the dosage that is given in the morning should not be cut down initially rather the afternoon dose should be cut down when taking 10 mg in the morning 10 mg in the afternoon begin reducing the afternoon dose by 2.5 mg every 7 days till you come to a zero afternoon dose then you divide the morning dose all right at 5 mg per day it is usually advisable to reduce half mg at a time take 2.5 mg in the morning 2.5 mg in the afternoon when afternoon dose is again reduced to zero split the morning dose in the half and follow the same protocol again an important uh, question that was um, asked to some of the post graduate students uh, during their exam is uh, how do you measure the dosage of a uh, topical medicament that you give we always say you take the tube you put it on the finger index index finger and uh, then apply onto the region so this particular measurements is very important when comes to when it comes to the corticosteroids and it is measured in the terms of finger tip unit a finger tip unit is the application of the medicament from the first dermal crease to the tip of the index finger and this measures to uh, 0.5 grams of the drug that you are giving two finger units can be uh, is equal to 1 gram of the topical steroid that is advised so next time when you give any medication to the patient so you can uh, measure the particular dosage of the drug and particular effects in relation to that dosage that you give i would like to conclude my presentation by saying that corticosteroids in spite of being very wonderful very adorable very efficient in treating various ailments so nicely so effectively are associated with wide range of adverse effects so we being healthcare professionals who have taken oath to do no harm to the patient should be in a position to decide whether the effects of usefulness effects are more or the adverse effects so the last statement i would like to say that for the base for this particular knowledge is all uh, this particular knowledge is knowledge so invest in the knowledge because investment in knowledge will definitely yield you the best interest in the future thank you all for the patient listening thank you vishnu dental college for this wonderful opportunity thank you ma'am for providing such a great expose on the topic it was a wonderful lecture um, hello ma'am am i audible yes yes you are audible dear okay thank you ma'am uh, we have few questions from the participants uh, the first one is are there any side effects while using steroids in endodontic <laughs> procedures as a cavity liner yeah the literature has reported its usage in very meager uh, applications in endodontics one of them is the cavity liners they have seen wonderful thermal sensitivity reduction with the use of it but they have not reported any side effects maybe it may be one of the interesting topic which post graduates can take up in future so right now there are no as such side effects 
because the amount is less and the studies with the use of it is again less okay thank you ma'am next one going on to the next question corticosteroids are they useful in how are they useful in the treatment of hemangioma and mucosities right okay benign lesions uh, we have done uh, there are very good reports in the literature wherein they have seen the use of corticosteroids instilled uh, intralesionally in the hemangiomas then uh, the pyogenic granulomas and then mucosities basically it uh, does the sclerosing effect is what is seen so once the size of the lesion is reduced either the lesion is excised if it is a bigger size or it can be itself used as a therapeutic modality over there Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question: What happens if corticosteroids are used for a longer duration? Okay, this was the soul of the presentation. As I have been explaining the HPA axis, anybody who is using more than two weeks of corticosteroids, they are intending to have the suppression of HPA axis. All right. So that is uh, the conventional uh, natural corticosteroids are slowly depleting, and the HPA axis the adrenal glands are not providing with that stimulus and the production of corticosteroids so the person is completely relying on the synthetic corticosteroids that the person is consuming so in due course of time there is atrophy of adrenal adrenal gland so the production of natural corticosteroids which are very important or important for one slide are reduced so long term corticosteroids a big no for that but if the system uh, if the condition demands for long term corticosteroids a continuous monitoring uh, is required in this case yes ma'am uh, one last question uh, are there any pre operative lab investigations for patients on corticosteroid therapy pre operative lab investigations depending on the disease they are provided all right for a uh, patient who is like diabetic so you have a definite uh, indications which are required like what all things to be seen are different from a person who is taking a replacement therapy for corticosteroid so it will be tailored according to the need for which or the dose with which the person is loaded with okay ma'am thank you so much ma'am uh, we would like uh, to present your certificate uh, congratulations ma'am thank you for the lecture thank you so much Thank you, Sudhakar sir. Thank you, Ramesh sir. Ma, good afternoon. How are you? I am fine. Thank you so much, sir. I hope students must have be enjoying and benefiting because I attended two three lectures, and yeah. it is also refreshing again. Very nice lecture, ma. Very. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Responses from the audience. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. it is time to move on to the last session before we break for lunch i hope all of the participants are as energetic and enthusiastic as you were when we began on that note it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to dr g uma revathi ma'am professor shri venkateshwara dental college and hospital chennai ma'am is going to share her invaluable knowledge on the topic development and growth of maxilla and mandible Ma'am pursued her undergraduation and postgraduation from Tamil Nadu Government Dental College and is now pursuing PhD from Savita University. She secured state first rank in postgraduation entrance examination in 2006 and 55th rank holder in All India PG entrance examination. Ma'am was a topper of MDS examination under Dr M G R University with many national and international publications to her credit. I would like call the part over to you, ma'am. A very good morning to you all. I understand that you've been listening to wonderful lectures uh, since yesterday. In line with that, I have tried to make this presentation as informative and as short as possible. 
So the topic is the development of maxilla and mandible. How much ever we have progressed in the knowledge regarding to the science and technology, it still remains a mystery how this uh, two-cell stage is going to evolve into a beautiful human fetus. The most important event considered uh, very significant is uh, the gas relation, which is the formation of uh, the three germ layers, your ectoderm, mesoderm, and then the endoderm. As far as uh, the cranial development is concerned, uh, the nuclear crest cells, a group of cells which are derived from uh, the neural plate, which is again in turn formed from uh, the ectodermal layer, this is considered to be the fourth germ layer. Uh, in fact, it was considered as one of the primary organs of embryo by Dr. Raven. And it was uh, Ms. Julia Platt who recognized the importance uh, the neural crest cells play in the development of the cranial patient system. This is one interesting article which talks about uh, the cranial uh, neural crest cells. Uh, interested uh, students can go back and check on it. I have given the reference here. So the neural crest cells are divided into four major groups, the cranial cells, the vagal, the trunk, and the sacral cells. And the cranial neural crest cells are involved in the formation of almost the entire craniofacial skeleton, uh, in addition to forming the cranial ganglia, teeth, and then the thyroid cells. So, this uh, picture from the letters atlas uh, gives you a rough uh, uh, indication of uh, the, or the pictorial representation of how uh, the uterus is going to look uh, between the week five and week eight. As you can see here, the various processes involved here, we will talk about more in detail. Uh, the neural crest cells, I told you, they are going to form two streams of cells, the one uh, in the anterior and one in the posterior. The anterior stream of cells becomes the bronchonasal process, the posterior stream of cells, which forms the branchial arches. Now, for technical purposes, I'm dividing the frontonasal into the frontal process, which is forming uh, the forehead region, and then the nasal process. And then uh, your maxillary and mandibular process from the first pharyngeal arches. Now, I, I'll just give you a very gist uh, of how uh, these processes uh, contribute to the various structures. The two nasal processes, the two uh, uh, medial nasal processes. Uh, nasal process uh, divides into medial and then lateral nasal process of both the sides. The medial nasal process of both the sides uh, unite to form something called as the globular process. This uh, globular process uh, gives rise to the midline structures of uh, the midface, uh, which forms uh, your uh, dorsum of uh, your nose, the bridge of the nose, uh, columella, philtrum, and then the premaxilla. Uh, the lateral nasal process forms your lateral part of the nose along with the anna. So the rest of the lateral part of your uh, face, the midface, is formed by a maxillary process, and then the entire lower mandible by the mandibular process. So these are the five important processes involved in the development of the face. Now we are more concerned about uh, the skeletal system development, so I'm going to divide it into the cranium and then the face. Uh, technically, it is uh, divided as the neurocranium and then the visceropranium. So neurocranium again is divided into membranous neurocranium and then the cartilaginous neurocranium, and then the face which hangs from it is the visceropranium. When, you, when we are going to talk about membranous and then cartilaginous, it is important for us to understand what is endomontral and what is intramembranous bone formation. See, uh, when uh, the processes are uh, forming the bones, uh, by means of processes, I say that uh, they are uh, just cells, okay? Uh, so the mesenchymal condensation of these uh, cells lay down the matrix, the collagenous matrix, and uh, when the collagenous matrix is invaded by the blood vessels, which is going to bring the black uh, bone forming uh, uh, cells like your chondrocytes or the osteocytes. So they are going to lay down the bone uh, matter. I mean, uh, the ossification is going to start. So there are two kinds of ossification. One is going to be your endochondral and one other is going to be your intramembranous. In intramembranous, uh, there is direct bone deposition layer by layer. Whereas in the endochondral form formation, there's going to be a cartilage precursor, which is going to be later replaced by bone. Now, why at all nature has designed it this way? Why there should be some uh, cartilaginous precursor, anyway it is going to be uh, converted into a bone in later stages of life. Now, why exactly it happens? This is because of uh, the beautiful, beautiful phenomenon that uh, bone is uh, incapable of uh, growing under pressure being a hard tissue. Whereas cartilage being a soft tissue, it has the capacity to grow under pressure. Now imagine the cranial base. Now where are the primordial cartilages present in the fetus? You have it in the cranial base, you have it in the sternum and ribs, 
and then the growth place of your long term. So these are the major areas where you experience pressure during most of the times. For example, cranial base is under pressure because of your development. your growth plates are under pressure because of the movements of the child so it has to grow under pressure and one more thing is that cartilage is capable of volumetric growth unlike the bone bone is capable of growing only layer by layer whereas cartilage can grow volumetrically so time saving so these are the major reasons why endochondral bone formation happens at all now uh, talking about the cranial base first so we will talk about the cranial base and then the axillary mandible Cranial base has its origin from the neural crest cells as well as the paraxial mesoderm, which is the occipital. So, means. the part anterior to the pituitary is from the neural crest, the part posterior from the pituitary is from the occipital. So, means. now uh, the cranial base, as I told you, it is going to form as a cartilage in this and uh, anlet. So, this forms as a 14 separate islands which are later going to ossify. And then in between the ossified bone, you have something called as the sipchondrosis, which are uh, the remnants of the cartilaginous area. So, uh, uh, major sipchondrosis that are present in between these bones or your sphenoethmoidal uh, sipchondrosis, which is going to be present between the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone, intersphenoidal between the two sphenoid bones, pre sphenoid and then the basic sphenoid, sphenoid you know, occipital sipchondrosis between the sphenoid bone and then the occipital bone. So these are major synchondrosis that is present in the cranial base, which is contributing to the major sagittal anteroposterior growth of your cranial base. After after the growth, they are going to fuse. Okay, so this fusion happens for a range of sphenoidal uh, synchondrosis at around the two to three years of life. For the sphenoethmoidal, it is nine to three years. The most important synchondrosis as far as the cranial base growth is concerned is the sphenoxpital synchondrosis because it grows for a longer period. Till 16 and 18 years of life, it has the capacity to grow. The cranial base length reaches uh, about 56% of adult size prenatally by around the 38 weeks of gestation, 70% of the adult size by 2 years and full adult size by 2 adolescents. 60% of cranial base growth occurs in the embryonic stage, 40% postnatally, especially in the first two years. Cranial base is described as the skull girdle, which is responsible for the forward displacement of your nasomaxillary segments. Since the maxilla is attached to the cranium by means of various circumaxillary sutures, and along with the circumaxillary sutures, the most important component will be your uh, septal cartilage, nasal septal cartilage. So this along with the structures or the responsible structures which are displacing the maxilla forward whenever the cranial base is growing. Now studies have proved that when we are going to uh, apply pressure so that the cranial base development is hindered, that also affects your maxillary position, mid-face position. This is, these are some of the references you can go back and uh, see if you are interested. Now we will talk about the prenatal development of the maxilla. So we are done with the cranial base development to know how it forms and then how it is it is anchoring the midface. So uh, with regard to the prenatal development of the maxilla, the basal kind of your first parental arch is the one which is contributing. Now we are more interested in how this it is possible. So after the uh, basal thermal condensation of cells laid on the matrix, so we will see how it's possible. For the pre-maxilla, there are two centers. For the maxilla proper, as you can see here, you have two ossification centers for each half of the maxilla. So that contributes to four ossification centers, which forms a trapezoidal pattern. Now, what do I mean by ossification center? The ossification thickens start here and then slowly, slowly it spreads. Uh, I, I told you before the maxilla and the uh, uh, mandible are formed purely by intramembranous ossification. That is, the cranial base ossifies by endochondral mechanism. Your jaws, your maxilla, and mandible majorly grows by intramembranous deposition. So, the bone has to deposit and then layer by layer it moves up. So, the ossification is the first uh, area of your uh, bone deposition, which is going to slowly progress. As you can see here, it, this happens between 16 to 25 weeks and then 28 to 40 weeks. This picture uh, changes. You can see the radiating patterns here, especially. You can see the radiating patterns, peripherally radiating patterns of trapezoid. So, 
So this, uh, your uh, ossification centers, it, they, they're going to establish your maxillary width prenatally. The histological sections through the primary ossification centers have also shown how the uh, radiating pattern happens. You can see here, the, this is the growth center, ossification center, and then uh, radiating patterns of trabeculae is evident here. So this is how the maxilla ossifies prenatally. Now, um, coming back to prenatal development of mandible, around only five a pair of metal cartilages, cartilages of the first terrestrial branch develop, and in the middle of week six of fertilization, the mandibular ossification appears as intramembranous deposits, a very in close approximation, lateral to the metal cartilage at the area of the division of your inferior alveolar nerve, or approximately at the level of the deciduous first molar, apical area of your deciduous first molar. In week seven, the linear trabeculae of mandible developed anteroposteriorly towards all the other processes. So this is how this is again between six, uh, 16 and 25 weeks of uh, uh, your ossification, I mean intrauterine life. You can see that uh, the MDPDC is the mandibular primary growth center. So from here, the ossification spreads anteroposteriorly, superiorly, as well as anteriorly towards the symphysis. So you can see the radiating patterns of trabeculae here, here. Uh, this is the histological section through the mandible in the fetal period. You can see the MT is the metal cartilage here, and then the mandibular ossification develops here, the dental lamina. And in this section, you can see, again, the metal cartilage, how the ossification center uh, happens lateral to the Meckel's cartilage. Uh, I would request you to note down uh, the uh, uh, muscular part, the genioglossus muscle, the tongue course here, the lips course here. The significance of all this we will uh, talk later. Now, this is again another section in the anterior part. You Can you see this inside this uh, area here? Uh, this is a separate island of cartilage. I'll tell you how. So, and, and here, uh, both the sides of the mandible also. Now, even though the mandible develops purely intramembranously, majorly, there are three different areas of cartilaginous ossification that uh, happen separately, and then later on they get fused with the mandibular problem. These three areas are your symphysial cartilage area, cartilage in the condylar area, and cartilage in the peroneal area. So these three processes they separate as they develop as separate islands of uh, uh, cartilage, which later on fuses with the mandible proper. As you can see here, this is the symphysal cartilage that separates, uh, I mean, that develops uh, separately. And here also, you can see the symphysal cartilage, how it uh, separates from uh, the mandibular uh, intramembranous ossification. And then in the condylar area, it happens around the seven week of uh, uh, intrauterine life, and around the 14th week, it merges with uh, the mandibular proper. And you can see here uh, the car CD, CD is the condylar cartilage here and how it slowly slowly progresses to join the intramembranous ossification here. This is how the radiating patterns uh, happen from the mandibular primary growth center, the trabecular radiating from here towards the periphery and then the condyle uh, ossifying as a separate unit and then slowly merges into the mandibular proper. So this is with regard to the uh, prenatal development of your maxilla and mandible. So the, before I uh, uh, now we will talk about the remodeling, uh, postnatal remodeling of your uh, uh, maxilla and then mandible. Uh, as uh, the maxilla grows, see, majorly we've done the prenatal part, uh, the maxilla uh, and the mandible are formed in proper shape. Now, what happens uh, postnatally is majorly remodeling process happens. Now, what is this remodeling? The purpose of remodeling uh, is to maintain the position and then the shape of the bone. As and when the entire organism is growing, the shape should not change, the constitution should not change. So uh, the remodeling happens to maintain it. So basically, there are areas of deposition and then resorption. We'll see the one by one uh, where and all it uh, gets deposited and where and all it gets resorbed. The overall maxillary growth is the maxilla on the whole is getting displaced anteriorly and then uh, the, the, we, we call it as downwards and forwards pattern of growth, isn't it? So displacement is primarily downwards and forwards, whereas remodeling happens primarily in the reverse direction. There is more posterior growth and then anterior resorption. Deposition happens more posteriorly and resorption happens more anteriorly. It's just a mild reverse. 
Now we can see uh, maxillary tuberosity. As you can see here, the I represents the maxillary tuberosity. Major deposition happens here. Since it is posterior and also lateral, deposition here uh, lengthens your maxillary uh, arch length as well as it widens slightly because of your lateral position. But this is how uh, remodeling happens in this area. Now, with regard to the zygomatic process, the zygomatic process, again, it has anterior resolving surfaces and then posterior depositing, uh, depository surfaces, and then it uh, recondens backwards, posteriorly. With regard to the lateral process of your zygomatic arch, the face has to widen. So what happens is the lateral surfaces become depository and median surfaces become resorptive so that the process migrates laterally on both sides. This contributes to increase the width of the face. Now, with regard, to, with regard to the maxillary arch proper, this also, as you can see here, the shaded portion represents your maxillary arch. This remodels posteriorly, anterior resorption and then posterior deposition. Uh, with reference to the palatal process of the maxilla, as you can see here, the pre-maxilla, anterior surface of the pre-maxilla is taking a step back, posterior resorption, and then the palate is migrating downwards. Here you can see the V principle of growth. What happens to the V principle is uh, the inner surfaces of the V always faces the growth direction and then the outer surfaces are away from the growth direction. So what happens is the inner surfaces are depository in nature, outer surfaces are resorptive in nature and then as it grows towards the direction uh, of growth, the widening happens. So this is the V principle. Now this V principle applies uh, to the bones which are having a V-shaped configuration. As you can see here, the palate is a V-shaped configuration and it grows as per the V principle. So the palate is migrating downwards. Your nasal aspect is resorptive and then the oral aspect is depository and then it widens towards the arches. So and then it progresses down. So pre maxilla as I told you earlier, the anterior surfaces are resorptive. Orbital process of the maxilla, as you can see here, the, the orbital process of the maxilla is uh, facing in three dimensions. One is uh, cephalic and there is posterior and there is anterior. So it grows in all these three dimensions. The medial walls of bodo orbits move farther apart because the nasal bridge is expanding, the orbital process has to move apart. Accordingly, your uh, uh, bridge of the nose increases. Now, what happens to the floor of the orbit? With, re with reference to the floor of the orbit, the endosteal surfaces, that mean the inner aspect of uh, the orbital pore has to resolve. The outer aspect, which faces towards the eye, has to deposit. Because your in in endosteal resorption is contributing to your maxillary sinus enlargement. So this is how your orbital process develops. And one more important thing as far as your orbital rims are considered, as you can see here, this is the skull of an infant, the skull of an adult. Uh, the superior and then the inferior orbital rims, initially they were, if you connect a line, they were inclined posteriorly. But what happens in the adult is this inclination changes. That is how your forehead prominence increases. This is again a sort of remodel. The nasal region, the lateral wall of your nasal cavity is oriented similar to the orbital floor. It has to grow laterally, anteriorly, as well as superior. Now, the alveolar process, the most important process which contributes to majority of your vertical development, as you can see here, see here. So, uh, here you can see the height and here you can see the height. This is the adult phase. So how much of uh, vertical development is contributed by your alveolar process? Alveolar process are going to develop along with the tone and then they erect an increase in height along with the tone. So this is your remodeling of your maxilla. So most of your maxillary surfaces anteriorly are resorptive, posteriorly are deposit, depository, but on the whole the displacement is in the following direction. Now remodeling of the mandible, it happens uh, similar to the uh, remodeling of your uh, uh, maxilla which is uh, posterior deposition and anterior resorption. Uh, remodeling backwards, but uh, the displacement is in the anterior direction. Most of uh, V principle, because mandible is a V shaped bone, so majority of uh, V principle happens in the mandibular remodeling. Something called as area relocation, which means that the areas which were occupied by uh, some other part uh, later becomes part of another uh, uh, structure. So we'll see how. Uh, condyle and then neck remodeling. 
the growth direction in the condyle is primarily superior and then cephalic. I mean, posterior and then cephalic it grows back as well as superiorly. Now, when you when you see here, the uh, it 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 follows the principle of V. But the thing is, the endosteal surfaces, the inner aspects of your condyle are more depository, whereas the outer aspects are resorptive because you have to develop this shape. The condyle neck is narrow, the uh, superior surface is wider. So in order to gain this shape, the endosteal surfaces are depository and then the periosteal outer surfaces are resorptive. And then the, moving on to the coronoid process, both the uh, coronoid process together forms the V, means the uh, inner aspect, the medial surfaces of both your coronoid processes are depository, uh, lateral surfaces are uh, resorptive, and it grows uh, in a superior direction as well as widens. That contributes to the width development as well. Now, with regard to the ramus, what happens is, uh, uh, as the condylar neck is uh, joining the ramus, grades the ramus, uh, instead of endosteal surface uh, getting depository, it, it is the periosteal deposition here. I told you the neck, uh, it is inner deposition and outer resorption. When it joins the condyle, that area, it becomes the reverse. So outer surface deposition keeps on happening. In the ramus, especially the posterior borders, in line with the maxillary tuberosity, the posterior borders are always depository. Anterior border of the ramus is always resorptive, so that the mandibular body increases in length. This is called as area relocation. What was once the ramus it becomes the mandibular body. That's that's what you call it as area relocation. Now this is the section uh, through the coronoid process of your mandible. As you can see, the coronoid process medial. Uh, area is the depository and lateral is uh, resorptive, whereas in the mandibular ramus, in other parts of the ramus, it is outer depository and then lingual surface is resorptive. Uh, one more thing that you have to see here is the lingual aspect, the lingual tuberosity, lingual tuberosity, that's called as uh, uh, lingual tuberosity, which is in line with the maxillary tuberosity. In that area, uh, the mandible uh, ramus is more depository in nature. Uh, otherwise, I'm told it is resorptive, but only in this area it becomes a depository, as you can see here. This is to accommodate the body of the mandible. As you can see, the, when the mandible is growing, uh, the body is uh, medially oriented compared to the ramus aspect. That is the reason why this area converts into a uh, depository area on the lingual aspect. Otherwise, the rest of the area is uh, the lingual surfaces is the depository in nature, and then the labial surface is resorptive, and then it grows as a V, widens as a V. So this is one of other uh, remodeling that you have to uh, notice. The ramus undergoes a sort of uprighting from the neonatal. The shaded area is your infant mandible, and then you can see how it uprights in the adult mandible. Uh, simple that uh, there, there is less of resorption in the upper segment and more of resorption in the lower segment. Similarly, more of deposition in the lower area and less of deposition in the upper area. So again, the remodeling happens, purely resorption and deposition, and then the ramus uprighting happens, which also contributes to increase in the vertical uh, height of the field. Uh, again, I've told you about the mandibular body, how it assumes a V-shaped configuration of growth. Now, all these uh, remodeling areas are areas of deposition and then resorption, which is secondary to the functional demands. So, as per the dictation of your function, be it respiration, mastication, or speech, or any other function that is performed by your oral cavity, as per the functional demands, the remodeling happens. Now, pre prenatally, when these functions are not happening much, it is the intrinsic factor of growth which plays a role, like your cartilaginous growth, which has the innate intrinsic potential to grow. So, prenatally, majority genetically controlled intrinsic growth happens, whereas postnatally, this is going to be influenced by the extrinsic factor, which is which are the functional demands. Now, uh, there is, um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell about the, the chin area. Uh, the chin area is a particular uh, exclusive feature of the humans. It is not uh, present in the primate species. So this is mainly formed by resorption of this area. Because I told you mandibular body is resorptive on the labial aspect and lingual deposition, right? So it is because of this resorption, the prominence increases here and you get the aesthetic feature of your chin. So going back to the functional aspect, this is a very beautiful article by uh, Keen and Host. 
Portal. So, uh, uh, interested uh, people can go back and read on this. This uh, uh, gives you a rough picture of uh, how uh, the cranial patient development is uh, uh, contributed by the functions of the oral cavity. So, as per this article, uh, it uh, says that the brain stem flexure is what determines the, uh, the flexure of the cranial base. You know, the anterior cranial base and the posterior cranial base are oriented at an angle. This develops because of your flexure in the brain stem. So that happens around four weeks and two weeks after that, the cranial base flexure happens. Uh, so this is a, in, uh, dependent on the brain uh, development. So uh, for uh, technical purposes, uh, they have divided uh, the cranial base into uh, central core part and then the lateral part. The central core part growth is determined by your nervous system development, whereas the lateral part of the cranial base is dependent upon the masticatory system of the individual. The heavier the masticatory demand the muscles, more will be the lateral development of your cranial base, lesser function, lesser development of your cranial base. So uh, your cranial base in turn determines your facial form, how an individual, whether he has a broader face or a narrower face, uh, more commonly depends upon your muscular factors. Uh, so the effect of the muscle on the base and the face development is uh, showcased in unilateral trigeminal palsy. This is another article which says that if there is going to be muscular underdevelopment in one side of the face because of impalities, there is going to be a deficient skeletal development on that particular part. That's, that's what is reflected in this article. So it throws light on how the function, especially the muscular functions, affect the cranial base development as well as the development of the face. Now, uh, uh, moving on to the mid face, the maxillary part, uh, we have seen that uh, the cranial base uh, suspends the maxilla. So, uh, as this uh, progresses, this also progresses. Now, uh, in addition to being influenced by the cranial base position, the maxilla uh, is influenced by major functions of uh, respiration as well as constipation. Let's see how. Uh, see, the uh, upper face, uh, as I told you, uh, in addition to being influenced by the position of your uh, cranial base, it is also influenced by airway. Uh, the width development uh, happens as per the demands of your uh, cranial base, whereas uh, that is completed earlier. Uh, so you cannot alter the width majorly, whereas your respiratory system development affects majorly your vertical part. So as per the demands of an individual, if an individual has more demand for respiration, more demand for oxygen, the uh, nasal cavity has uh, to be uh, more volumetric. So, more volume increase contributes to more vertical development of a face. That's how you see when you have a mouth breather or a respiratory uh, uh, demanded individual, they have a vertical development of face, a vertical pattern of face. Uh, so, lateral to this, uh, uh, in addition to the respiration, the flattening, the filling and flattening of the maxilla develops as per the masticated demands. There are two important functions which are going to influence the development of the mid face. One is your respiration, which contributes majorly to the vertical part, and another is your masticatory muscles demand, which increases the width of the face. Uh, when you notice the individuals with horizontal pattern of growth, that means patients who have a broader face have a very strong musculature. This is the reason. So, more stronger musculature, more uh, width of your uh, face, your uh, your cranial base, as I told you, uh, develops more in line with the cranial face. The zygomatic process, your uh, uh, nasal widening, also happens. So, the individual tends to have a wider base. Uh, so, this is how the function influences your upper face. Uh, this, this is an interesting finding. Uh, you can see uh, there's a sexual dimorphism which occurs uh, in the vertical development of face. Uh, after about 12 years of age, both females and males have a similar muscle mass. But after 12 years, uh, since in males, the energy demand, the oxygen demand, uh, as well as the energy demand is more, the muscular development is more, respiratory demand is more. Accordingly, in supplementary studies, especially after 12 years of age, in males especially, the vertical increase is much more compared to the females. So this is a sexual dimorphism which goes in line with favoring your functional matrix theory. Function influences the facial skeleton. Now, how the mandible adapts to this function? Uh, the cranial base positions the maxilla, 
uh, respiration and then mastication influences the width as well as the vertical development. Now, this changes your occlusion. So, the mandible automatically based on uh, proprioception, your uh, Petrovic's theory. So, the mandible has to adapt automatically. So, that is how all those remodeling things happen. Accordingly, the mandible also grows in line with the maxilla. This is, this is how uh, it adapts. The ramus lengthening happens and then the body lengthening happens. So, all this postnatal remodeling or primarily because of your functional demands. So your developing brain and then the flexure determines the form of the cranial base, which in turn influences the mid-face position. Subsequently, airway along with masticatory demands determines the vertical and then the lateral developments. Thus, you have a holistic model. So I have tried, growth and development is a, a huge subject. In 45 minutes of presentation, I have uh, tried to condense it as early as possible. Your take home point is uh, function plays a major role in the postnatal remodeling growth of your jaws. So uh, I thank uh, the Vishnu Dental College management and all the staff for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity to interact with your uh, postgraduates. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. You're audible. Quite audible. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation, madam. Thank you. Thank you so much. Madam, there are no questions for this session. Thank you again. Thank Here you. is a certificate, for, uh, certificate of appreciation for your presentation, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yes. We will break for lunch. We'll sharp at two o'clock. We'll join back. All the del all the participants kindly log in. Sharp two o'clock. Thank you. Vishnu Dental College and Hospital is in Bhimavaram, West Godavari district of Andhra Pradesh. Established as a teaching institute and service-oriented hospital in 2002, it renders the best quality oral health care to the population in and around the Godavari Delta.
students learn in small groups, enhancing their focus of attention and encouraging proactive participation using e-learning facilities. Well-equipped simulation labs expose the students to practical hand skill proficiency using simulation models and dental mannequins. A wide variety of multi-speciality inpatient, outpatient and emergency oral health care services are provided with stringent infection control protocols. A state-of-the-art comprehensive clinical setting facilitates multidisciplinary treatment approach under one roof. Students are exposed to world-class dental instruments, instrument tracking system, digital radiography and many more. Dental Hospital has employed electronic dental record system for a centralized patient data management. Specialty-wise services rendered include oral medicine and radiology, equipped with digital radiography and the dental CT scan facility to obtain 3D radiographic images. This department also supports 30 plus rural dental clinics through teledentistry facility. Oral and maxillofacial surgery section that has advanced surgical care facilities to perform a variety of minor and major oral surgical procedures. A well-equipped 20-bedded inpatient facility includes operation theatres, intensive care unit and wards. Emergency services are also offered 24 by 7. Restorative dentistry and endodontics housed with dental operating microscopes for high quality care anticipating the best possible treatment outcomes. Orthodontics and maxillofacial orthopedics that provides various types of braces for the correction of irregularly placed teeth and also smile correction for all age groups. Department of Pediatric Dentistry provides wide range of dental treatments to children with special emphasis on prevention of oral diseases in a child-friendly ecosystem. It has the facility to treat children with special care needs and highly anxious children under sedation. Periodontology section takes care of tooth supporting structures with advanced surgical and non-surgical approaches. It also provides fine gum surgeries using lasers and surgical microscope. The Department of Prosthodontics rehabilitates patients lost teeth and damaged facial parts using novel jaw tracking methods electromyography and text scan to achieve promising reconstructive outcomes. Implantology section performs surgeries with various implant systems. This section also offers basic and advanced implantology training program for dental graduates. Oral and maxillofacial pathology section supports diagnosing wide array of oral and jaw diseases at cellular level to identify the root cause and treat them appropriately. The department has high-end equipment like the research microscope and the pentahead microscope to facilitate research and academic activities. The institution has a novel proprioceptive derivation clinic which fosters ergonomic principles among students to inculcate working in stress-free for fabrication of high-quality dental prosthesis. The lab 
has CAD CAM facility which includes the laboratory model scanner, 3D printer and a high-end Ivoclar PM7 for 5-axis milling. The institution runs a unique dental technology twinning program in collaboration with the University of Bolton, United Kingdom. The central library facility provides unrestricted access to national and international dental journals, books, reviews and magazines with e-borrowing option. A state-of-the-art three-tire central sterile supply department CSSD facility is established for reprocessing and uninterrupted supply of sterile instruments to all the clinical areas. World-class instruments from Finland-based company LM Dental are a part of the centralized instrument repository. The RFID technology is used for instrument tracking. VDC employed high capacity centralized suction system from Der Germany for efficient liquid biomedical waste disposal and aerosol control in the clinics. The medical center provides 24 by 7 medical support with a well equipped clinical laboratory and pharmacy facilities. The outreach wing at VDC actively engages in conducting free community screening and treatment camps using mobile dental unit to reach remote, rural and tribal places. There are various program initiatives developed as per the oral health needs of the area including free preventive dental treatments to the needy. The service orientation of Vishnu spreads beyond the boundaries to eight districts of Andhra Pradesh and one district of Telangana with 32 satellite clinics offering basic and expert consultations to the rural areas. In brief, Vishnu Dental College is an epitome of transformation in dental healthcare education and service provision towards realizing their vision oral health care for all on par with the global standards.
the biggest challenge for any educational institute is to equip the students with practical knowledge and skills effectively. Thus, institutes are particularly emphasizing on curriculum process characterized by approaches to teaching and learning which are both experiential and engaging. Vishnu Dental College, one of the leading dental institutes in India. The institution is making sustained efforts towards consolidation of the state-of-the-art infrastructural facilities for teaching and learning. As you know, dentistry is both an art and a science. And uh, that's where, um, right from the beginning, we were wondering how to bring in uh, technology into dentistry. We always believe in the motto, strive for excellence. In this process, we update ourselves to the current trends. In this endeavor, we have partnered with Apple by introducing their iPads and their proprietary educational software in both classroom as well as at patient care. Vishnu Dental College e-learning team has customized a system which promotes flipped class learning methodology for undergraduate students using their iPads. Students will come prepared with the basic concepts to the class. The professor will facilitate learning by conducting activities and instantly evaluate if the student's learning is adequate and competent. The Apple iPads had really provided us a great platform for classroom activities. Vishnu Educational Resources for Neat Aspirants, we call it as Varna in our Vishnu Dental College, is to provide the coaching for the competitive examinations. In this system, we use iPads for conducting online examinations and retrieve the results instantly. We are utilizing iTunes U, iBooks and other third-party applications from the iPads to gain access to the academic data in the form of lecture keynotes, PDF handouts, supporting videos, images, charts, etc. Apps like Bonebox, Dental Anatomy Mastery are providing us with a 3D or micro scan of the, all the teeth with a comprehensible explanation. Although using technology in education is beneficial, it has its share of cons. To curtail any limitations, we have employed a mobile device management solution that monitors any irrelevant usage of the iPads. To facilitate the ease of instructing students, the teachers of Vishnu Dental College are being trained in Apple technology adaptation in a novel approach. Now it's not just enough for the students to have an iPad, it's extremely important that all the faculty, the 100 faculty we have in our dental college also are on board. When we are in the clinics, especially the comprehensive clinical setup, we use these iPads to secure the data digitally. And these iPads help us to record the data into our patient management system. We are probably the only dental college in India which is running a chain of 25 hospitals in the rural parts of Andhra Pradesh, predominantly in the Godavari districts. And uh, we have a plan to take it up to 100, 100 hospitals throughout coastal Andhra Pradesh. We conduct uh, various community outreach programs in remote areas and these iPads are very useful in collecting data instantaneously. In case of difficulty in diagnosis, we connect to our remote management system that connects to our closest satellite clinic doctor. When you have these number of hospitals, you generate a large volume of data. And one of the things we generate a lot is radiographs. And that's where again, we use the iPads, we use the Apple iPads to actually transmit these radiographs through teledentistry to our main hospital. And one new project which is very close to our heart is using artificial intelligence and then analyzing all this data which we are generating from all these clinics to come out with a product which will enable a doctor mostly in the rural areas and the remote areas uh, to actually look at those templates to actually diagnose uh, an oral health problem. I would like to thank Apple for providing all their resources and support 
in our journey to provide oral health care for all. Conquer and Apple have supported us in taking a leap towards the digitization of our teaching and learning process. I'm very happy to see our students and faculty all carrying iPads. They go to the classroom, they go to laboratories, they go to the satellite clinics and we see a lot of efficiency in the system.
the biggest challenge for any educational institute is to equip the students with practical knowledge and skills effectively. Thus, institutes are particularly emphasizing on curriculum process characterized by approaches to teaching and learning which are both experiential and engaging. Vishnu Dental College, one of the leading dental institutes in India. The institution is making sustained efforts towards consolidation of the state-of-the-art infrastructural facilities for teaching and learning. As you know, dentistry is both an art and a science and uh, that's where um, right from the beginning we were wondering how to bring in uh, technology into dentistry. We always believe in the motto, strive for excellence. In this process, we update ourselves to the current trends. In this endeavor, we have partnered with Apple by introducing their iPads and their proprietary educational software in both classroom as well as at patient care. Vishnu Dental College e-learning team has customized a system which promotes flipped class learning methodology for undergraduate students using their iPads. Students will come prepared with the basic concepts to the class. The professor will facilitate learning by conducting activities and instantly evaluate if the student's learning is adequate and competent. The Apple iPads had really provided us a great platform for classroom activities. Vishnu Educational Resource for Neat Aspirants, we call it as Varna in our Vishnu Dental College, is to provide the coaching for the competitive examinations. In this system, we use iPads for conducting online examinations and retrieve the results instantly. We are utilizing iTunes U, iBooks and other third-party applications from the iPads to gain access to the academic data in the form of lecture keynotes, PDF handouts, supporting videos, images, charts, etc. Apps like Bonebox, Dental Anatomy Mastery are providing us with a 3D or micro scan of the, all the teeth with a comprehensible explanation. Although using technology in education is beneficial, it has its share of cons. To curtail any limitations, we have employed a mobile device management solution that monitors any irrelevant usage of the iPads. To facilitate the ease of instructing students, the teachers of Vishnu Dental College are being trained in Apple technology adaptation in a novel approach. Now it's not just enough for the students to have an iPad, it's extremely important that all the faculty, the 100 faculty we have in our dental college, also are on board. When we are in the clinics, especially the comprehensive clinical setup, we use these iPads to secure the data digitally. And these iPads help us to record the data into our patient management system. We are probably the only dental college in India which is running a chain of 25 hospitals in the rural parts of Andhra Pradesh, predominantly in the Godavari districts and uh, we have a plan to take it up to 100. Good morning everyone and this is Anil, Anil Babu S and Department of Microbiology, Vishnu Dental College, Bimwaram. And uh, today I will be going to talk about micro microbial culture, media, cultural methods. So we will see in this session. Good morning everyone. And this is Anil Anil Babu S and Department of Microbiology, Vishnu Dental College, Bimwaram. And uh, today I will be going to talk about micro microbial culture, media cultural methods so we will see in this session does not provide any nutrition to grow of uh, for the organism organisms and it will melt at the temperature of 98 degrees celsius and solidifies at 42 degrees celsius coming to the classifications the culture media classifies in many ways 
that are based on oxygen requirement and physical state and nutritional factors coming to the according to oxygen requirement and it was divided into two groups of microorganisms aerobic uh, medium and anaerobic medium according to physical state there are three types of uh, uh, medium medium available for the physical state first one liquid media uh, i gave the examples pepton water and nutrient broth and you will also give glucose broth and second thing semi solid medium nutrient agar stamps and uh, mannitol motility medium also and third thing uh, solid medium solid medium dar hintanagar according to the synthetic media special media and let's elaborate uh, suppose the 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 patient is visited to op opd for the uh, physician the physician and suggested to collect the stool sample further proceedings for identification of fibria colorae and during sample during collection of stool sample the sample may get contaminant contaminant the finally the sample it reaches the uh, it reaches the microbiology lab further findings and and then we have to inoculate the stool sample for alkaline pepton water i i gave the example here alkaline pepton water the alkaline pepton water having enrichment substances and these substances will grow allow only vibrio colore if any uh, uh, contaminants in the sample for suppose that contaminants will be inhibited by enrichment substances it is liquid medium and which favors as we already discussed which we favors the multiplication of a particular species either uh, and that suppresses competitors competitors i mean contaminants examples of enriched uh, enrichment media selenate f broth and uh, tetrathionate broth alkaline pepton water selenate f broth only for isolation of salmonella and shigella and tetrathionate broth for shigella alkaline pepton water only for vibrio cholerae isolations selective medium the methyl example of bacteria king whether the process of working anaerobiosis it was success coming to the biological indicators and uh, pseudomonas aerogenosa will grow if anaerobiosis is not maintained thank you
Dear participants, we will be starting the session in 10 minutes. Please log in.
Welcome back one and all to our post lunch day 2 session. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Shiva Shankar sir who has done his BDS from Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences Puducherry and masters in public health dentistry from Savita Dental College Chennai. Currently he is working as assistant professor at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences Pondicherry. Sir completed a distance education course on intellectual property rights conducted by the World Intellectual Property Organization. He has five patents and eight copyrights registered on his name and is a peer review reviewer for many national and international journals. In addition to that, sir has 23 publications to his credit. Sir is now going to throw light on the topic of sampling and planning, sampling methods and statistical analysis. Kindly post your queries on the above mentioned lecture in the chat box. I hand it over to you sir. A very good afternoon to one and all present here. Myself Dr. Shiva Shankar, Reader Department of Public Health Dentistry from Indira Gandhi Institute of Dental Sciences. Today's topic we will be seeing about sampling methodology and also about the statistics and statistical tests. So I have just broken the seminar or the presentation into two different uh, parts. So in the part A we will be seeing about the sampling methodology. The main objective of this presentation is to help you to write your basic science exams for the first years postgraduates and also to employ the knowledge that you gain from this particular topic during your uh, research like thesis and other short terms so these will be the contents under which we will be covering the topic a basic introduction about what is sampling and uh, what is the need for the sampling then few terminology so that we will be getting more accustomed with the concept of sampling and finally a few references so to give, give an introduction about sampling most of us do this process of sampling in our day to day activities while you take about uh, think about your mom she does it in the morning when she cooks she just takes a few uh, pieces of uh, whatever she cooks and then puts in her mouth to find if the taste is proper and if the salt is adequate when we go out with our friends to ice cream parlor we just ask them for some samples so that we taste before we purchase something and then to not waste our money in the process of uh, purchasing a whole cup of ice cream and then finding that the taste is not good or we don't like it so this process of sampling is going to help us in restricting the number of samples that we are going to select and also to restrict the number of uh, the amount of time that we are going to spend in doing the research and also it is going to be helpful or the number of samples that we are selecting is sufficient enough to give a valid results that is just by selecting a small spoon of ice cream we can find out whether the whole uh, tub of ice cream is uh, really tasty or the taste is not that good so this is what is basic about the sampling and there are a few questions which might help you to think what is the importance of sampling the first thing is will it be possible for me to find out to go door to door to each and every person in india and to estimate the prevalence of oral cancer no it's absolutely not possible because india is a country which has a very large population and for me to go and knock each person's house is not literally possible thing and the second thing is uh, if i want to test the efficiency of a new mouthwash Uh, in reducing periodontitis do i need to find each and every person who is having periodontitis and give the mouthwash to him and then find out whether it is effective or not no that is also not possible so these are all the few questions which might help us to understand the importance of the sampling now what is basically the need for sampling first thing is always the population is infinite the world is full of people when we need to do some ecological study there are different countries the air uh, quality is different in different places when we need to do some studies with water water is enormous and all those things show that world has infinite resources and it is not possible for a single person or a researcher to study each and every one of those things and then to come up with a conclusion so first thing is because the population is infinite we need a sample of the infinite population the second thing is 
it is very time consuming for me to go and find out each and every person and then to read uh, about each and every person so definitely i need to restrict the number of people whom i am going to study and the third thing is when i am able to get the same result which i will get by reading each and every person in the world just by reading 100 people why shouldn't i take it because it is easy for me to select the 100 people or the representative of the population study them and then i can generalize the whole result to the whole world and also it is easy in terms of supervising the research when we are including only selected number of people so these are all the basic needs which shows us that we should go for a proper sample now that we have seen about the needs and the basic introduction of sampling before going actually into the different types of sampling method we will learn a few terminologies which will help us to write our article as well as to um, write the essay question that is being asked in our exam so the first one is sampling that is the process by which we are going to select the samples is known as sampling and sampling frame is the whole population or the set of people or the elements or the households that is there as our study uh, subjects and then comes the sampling unit that is the smallest non-divisible part example an individual person when you want to read about a person an individual person becomes a sampling unit when you want to read about the individual teeth then the teeth becomes a sampling unit which cannot be further divided into smaller parts and the final one is the sample that is a finite subset of the population or a portion that is chosen from a defined population is called as a sample that is whomever we are going to include in our study the group of people who are going to include in our study is known as a sample so just for a recall the method by which we are going to select the samples is known as sampling and samples are the subjects who are being included in our study sampling unit is the smallest part of the sample that is individual person or individual tooth from the sample and sampling frame is the whole lot of population so that is a bigger part so from the sampling frame we will be selecting the sample and from the sample we will have individual sampling units then we will see about what are all the factors that determine a proper sampling methodology the first one is the representativeness so when we see the first image we can see that initially only red colored dress people are being selected so it is not a proper representativeness whereas in the second one red colored uh, dress wearing people are completely eliminated whereas in the third one we can see people with dress uh, like uh, people wearing dresses with color red green blue yellow and then um, other things so in this way we should select population which is or sample which is representative of the sampling frame the second thing is a unbiased selection that is whenever we are going to select a group of people we should not be biased i like this person so i will select them or this person will give me all the favorable results so i will select them so just by employing some amount of uh, ideas or just by thinking that this person will be favoring my study i should not select the population and also selecting study population should not be based on any kind of other uh, discrimination like uh, blacks or whites or based on any caste or gender so all those things should not be completely followed when we are going to select a sample and the final one is the adequacy that is even though we follow a proper sampling methodology and doing all those things we should have adequate number of samples we cannot say that uh, out of uh, total indian population i will select only one person to find out the prevalence of the oral cancer so that is also not possible so we should take adequate number of people maybe from each state i should select these many number of people so that i can come up with the overall prevalence rate for the oral cancer in india so these are all the three factors representativeness unbiased selection and now that we have seen a basic introduction about the sampling we will go into the different types of sampling methods which is a very important 10 mark question for the exam going batch so the first one is known as the probability sampling in which each member of a population has an equal chance of being selected and it provides the most valid and a credible result and always we can make sure that it is a proper representative of the population whereas the non-probability sampling it does not give equal chance for every person to be included in our study so that it is not a true representative of the population 
and also it is less desirable when compared to that of the probability sampling. So that is whenever I am not able to adapt to a probability sampling method, I go in for a non-probability sampling. So inside the probability sampling methods, we have five. That is the simple random sampling, systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, cluster random sampling, and then the multi-phase or the multi-stage random sampling. Simple random sampling is the most common as well as the most important method of uh, random sampling methods, which will be used for other samplings also. So in this sampling method, each and every unit or element in the population has an equal chance of being included in the study. Simple random sampling can be done just by using a lottery method. So just write in the chits 50 uh, names of all the 50 people who are there in a classroom and then put it in a bowl. And then we will ask a person to select 10 people randomly or 10 sets randomly. So those 10 people will be included in the study. So this is one of the method by which we can conduct a simple random sampling using lottery method. The other methods includes table of random numbers and computer generated simple random. So for example, here a researcher wants to know the efficiency of a mouthwash in rheumatoid arthritis patients. And it was calculated or decided that 45 patients would be enough for conducting that particular study. Then the researcher has to prepare a complete list of patients who are eligible for the study. And this list is known as a sampling frame. So that is people who are having this rheumatoid arthritis is the sampling frame. So let us assume that there are 200 patients in the sampling frame or we have prepared a list of 200 people. Now we need to select only 45 people from the 200. So we can either go with the lottery method. As we have seen earlier, we can write the name of all the 200 people and then put it in a bowl which can be mixed and then we can take 45 slips from that particular bowl. Or we can go for computer generated random numbers. These are all few sites which might help you in generating. So that is we will write the name of 200 people and then it will randomly pick 45 numbers. So we can just pick out the people with those particular numbers to be included in our study. The basic merits and demerits of this method is that personal bias will always be eliminated using a simple random sampling because we don't know whose name will be written in that particular set. And a random sample is general, uh, it is generally a representative of the population. And also this methodology is being used for the forthcoming methods. The demerit is that uh, we need to have a complete list of the people whenever we have to collect samples from geographically uh, distinct areas and other things, we will not have the complete list. So we cannot uh, make a lottery or we cannot uh, uh, feed the list to the computer and then select random number of uh, random numbers and other. The second method is known as a systematic random sampling. This is one way of convenient, uh, conveniently selecting samples and it will help us to select samples at uniform intervals. What we have to do here is that we need to arrange the samples based on their name or based on their roll number in either ascending or a descending order and then finally we need to select them in uh, particular intervals for say every fifth patient or for say every fifth person enrolled in that particular class will be selected in that study. But how do we arrive at that fifth or fourth person? So we will see it in the forthcoming. So here the methodology is that we need to identify the sample size and then we need to put the population in a sequential or a sequential order either in ascending or a descending order. Then we need to identify the total number of units in the population that is the sampling frame which is represented as capital N here. Then we need to divide the capital N that is the sampling frame divided by our sample size which will give us a number uh, that is known as a sampling interval. So in the previous example I have said you write for say fifth every fifth patient or the fourth patient. So to calculate that fifth or the fourth that is known as K here we have followed the procedure. So we will take the previous scenario only that is uh, the case of uh, periodontal disease and uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients. In the previous example we have mentioned that we have a list of 200 people. So our sampling frame or the capital N becomes 200 here and then 45 is the sample size that we wanted to achieve so 45. So if we divide 200 by 45 I reach a number of 4.4 which can be rounded as 4. 
So thus, here we can see that every fourth patient out of the 200 will be selected to achieve a desired sample of 45. So uh, in the previous uh, sampling method, I said that this simple random sampling will be employed in all the other sampling methods, right? So the same way what here we are going to do is we need to write a chit from 1 to 4 and then we need to draw a random number using a simple random method. So if the number that we draw is 2, the first patient that we will include is second patient, then we should just uh, add it by 4, 6th patient, 10th patient, 14th patient and so on till we have a decide number of 45. So here the example that they have given us from random employing a simple random sampling method they have derived a number of 2. So we will take every fourth patient from number 2 include a, to be included in our study. So 2, 4, 10, 14 and so on patients will be included in the study still uh, we uh, have 45 number of this, the third method is known as stratified random sampling. So in this stratified random sampling, we will be dividing the uh, sampling frame into small subgroups based on either gender or based on their uh, socioeconomic status or some other thing. So the problem here is that we need to have a basic information about the population already so that we will break them into different groups or uh, known as strata. And from each stratum, we need to employ the simple random sampling method to select the individual patients. So here, we will just take the example of, uh, there are two methods basically of a stratified random sampling, which is known as the unequal size or also proportional stratified random sampling or the equal size. So first we will see the example of the unequal size. A researcher wants to measure the overall health status among workers in a cotton mill. So he has a total of 500 workers where they can be divided into uh, a sample of uh, 21 to 31 years or 31 to 40 years. So I basically have the data of the age of each and every patient collected from the industry's office. So I have that particular data. So I group them into different strata or subgroups based on their age group. So in this example, the population size is 500 and the desired sample size that I need to achieve is 50. Now I need to calculate something known as a sampling fraction which can be derived by dividing the sample size divided by the total population size which is 50 divided by 500 that is 0 0.1. So number of samples from each strata can be calculated by number in each strata into the sampling fraction. In this example we have seen that the different age groups are divided and in the first age group 110 people are there so i need to multiply the 110 into 0 0.1 which is 11 and in the second strata there are 100 and 140 80 and 70 so i will multiply each of them with 0 0.1 wherein i had the number of people to be taken into my study from different groups so i will select 11 people aging between 21 to 30 10 people from 31 to 40 14 people from 41 to 50, 8 people from 51 to 60 and 7 people from 61 to 70. So here we need to do the other way around that is we need to divide the total number of uh, subjects needed divided by the number of subgroups that we have. So we have 5 different subgroups or we have classified people into 5 groups based on their age. So totally I need 50 samples from 5 age groups. So 50 divided by 5 is equal to 10. So according to this, I need to select 10 patients from each subgroup to have a derived sample size of 50. So the main difference between the previous uh, disproportionate and the proportionate sampling is that in disproportionate sampling method or the equal sampling method, we will have equal number of people from each subgroup. Whereas in the proportionate sampling method, we will have sampling, we will have people based on the number of people in that individual subgroup. The other one is known as the cluster sampling method, which is also known as area sampling or block sampling. So population that is being sampled is divided into groups called the clusters and each cluster will be a representative of the population and we will randomly select the clusters, not the individual patients. 
so for an example if you want to know the prevalence of smoking among auto drivers in bhimvaram we don't have to go and then uh, collect a list of all the auto drivers in bhimvaram and then we need to do a random sampling or a simple random sampling method what we can do is we can just like that spot out different auto stands which are located in bhimvaram and we can consider each and every auto stand as a individual cluster and now we need to employ the simple random sampling in selecting the clusters and every auto driver who is there in that particular cluster will be included in the study the other two methods of random sampling method include multi stage and multi phase random sampling so this is nothing but an extension of the previous all four methods of random sampling in the multi stage random sampling we will do sampling into different stages for say if we need to study the uh, attitude of dental students who are there in india then what we do is that we need to collect the list of dental surgeons or uh, dental colleges in india and then we need to select two different states for say like andhra and telangana or andhra and tamil nadu by employing a simple random sampling and from the states we need to identify how many dental colleges are there and from the dental colleges again if there are 30 dental colleges together in andhra and uh, india we need to employ again a simple random sampling method to select the number of colleges that we need to study in and finally if there are only two colleges where we need to study in in that two colleges we need to collect the name list of the students and then employ a systematic random sampling or a clustered random sampling in finding out the total number of people or in identifying the subjects to be employed in our study so in this method the sampling method is being done at different stages wherein we take a whole unit and then start sampling from the whole unit to derive at the individual person or the sampling unit so as we have as i have stated earlier we can see here very clearly that we divide the population into states and then into different uh, colleges or districts and then we go into the individual the other method is known as a multi phase random sampling for say if we are going to do a study to find out the effectiveness of uh, fluoride mouth washes and my inclusion criteria or one of the way that i need to include people is that is people who are having a dmft score less than 2 i will screen 90 people and from the 90 people i will gather only the people who are having the selection criteria and then i will go and then do the sub phase of the classification so this is known as a multi phase random sampling we will see here in what scenarios what sampling methodology can be best used simple random sampling can be used when the whole population is available stratified can be used when the subgroups are being uh, available or we need we have a basic information about the previous group and systematic random sampling can be done when we have a total list of the people who ever is being enrolled in the study and finally clustered sampling can be do, uh, done when we have uh, to do or conduct the study in different geographical areas. in non probability there is no equal chances of being selected by each and every person then it will be selected based on the convenience of the examiner so that the cost involved will be very less in doing the sampling procedure and finally we cannot generalize the results that is being derived from uh selecting population using a non probability sampling the types include accidental or convenience judgmental or purposive quota sampling and network or ball sampling so in convenience sampling we just uh, look for our convenience and then select every person based on our convenience so for say if uh, let us just take the example of uh, vishnu dental college here there are different entrances for vishnu dental college if i need to assess the attitude of people studying in vishnu dental college and i have access to one particular entrance only or that is very close to the dental college so i can just wait there near the entrance and then give my uh, performer to every person who is exiting or entering to the entrance to fill it so that is because i am very convenient with it and i know that the students that are going to come through that particular gate will be more cooperative to me so that is one way of conducting a convenient sample the second one is purposive sampling that is i will know that these people will be responding in a very positive manner to me so i will select only those people in to be to be included in my study for say if i am taking a class 
today and then i know that these particular students they already like me very much so while i want to collect the feedback i will give only the feedback form to those people so that i will get a very good remark for my class the third one is known as the quota sampling this is somewhat similar to that of the uh, stratified sampling in which we need to divide pe people into different subgroups or strata or proportions and then we need to select them but in this case we need to select them not based on any simple random sampling we can just select the people however we like and the final one is known as a snowball sampling when we want to study about some disease or some conditions which are not socially acceptable or which is of more uh, stigma in the society we can adopt this snowball sampling in which we will just approach a single patient uh, who is smoking for say smoking prevalence of smoking in uh, among dental students if i want to conduct a study then most of the students uh, will feel very uh, awkward to come and then say themselves that they are smoking so what i can do is i can just identify one student who is smoking and he will give sir uh, that person is also smoking so that i'll go and then include them into the study rather than people themselves accepting and coming and then getting uh, enrolled in our study we need to find out them based on the lead given by the first person so this can be used in uh, studying some things related to hiv wherein we will not have a very clear data and people are so much stigmatized so that they don't give the data just like that finally we will just try to recap within 2 minutes what we have seen in the sampling why sampling is basically needed because we cannot study all the population and population is always infinite then we can have the desired result within uh, desired result by selecting a smaller number of population and it reduces the total time that is being required for us to conduct that particular study and also it is easy for me to manage a less number of people when compared to that of the whole population and there are four basic probability sampling along with two other methods and there are for non probability sampling the probability sampling methods include simple random sampling systematic random sampling stratified random sampling and cluster random sampling the other two methods that are included are multi stage and multi phase random sampling the non probability sampling techniques include the convenience purposive quota and the snowball sampling these are the references in which we can study about sampling even more in so with the previous slide we can uh, we are towards the end of sampling methodology and the second part of my topic will be on statistical analysis and tests of significance uh, sorry that i could not give any break in the middle because uh, we were given only 45 minutes to 50 minutes to complete the topic and you know that the topic is more vast than what uh, we try to think about it so without wasting any further time to the different statistical tests so to give an introduction about different statistical te tests statistics is a mathematical science which deals with the methods of collecting compiling presenting interpreting the numerical data and making inferences or drawing conclusions based on the analysis of data so it deals with all the process of collecting the data compiling it and presenting it in a readable manner and also to interpret the data which will be understandable by any other person and also from the data we have collected we need to make inferences or to find conclusions which will be useful for the population the uses of uh, statistics in uh, biomedical sciences are three that includes to find the difference between different groups let it be one group two group or more than that in case of one group we can find the difference between that particular group and the normal value in case of two and more groups we can find out the difference between those groups the second thing is to find the association between the groups or to find the association between the etiological factor and the disease that is being studied the third one is to find the time to event data basically statistics can be of two types you will be very well aware of the different types of statistics and all but this will just be a prologue of whatever we are going to see or this will just be a recap so that whatever i am going to talk about test of significance can be of a very good understanding to you so in descriptive statistics we will just find out or describe the population in terms of percentage or mean or standard deviation whereas in inferential statistics 
we will try to generalize the results whatever we get in our study population to the whole population or the sampling frame and also sampling is completely necessary step in the process of inferentials so as we as i have said you that this will be a prologue we will just see the different types of data here data can be classified basically into qualitative and quantitative data so qualitative is anything that is not measurable is qualitative anything that can be measured is quantitative and this qualitative can be divided further into nominal and ordinal so nominal is anything that we can nominate a value to is known as nominal for say race religion they doesn't have a particular order we will just like that nominate some value to those particular things for say gender so there is nothing like uh, inferior or superior in terms of gender we will just like that nominate a value one to male and two to female so that becomes a nominal data ordinal data it will already be arranged in an order for example pain it can be arranged from mild moderate to severe and very severe also so anything that is already arranged in a particular order is known as ordinal and for anything that we need to nominate a value and it doesn't have any meaning is known as a nominal in quantitative data it can be either divided into discrete and continuous discrete is nothing but old numbers whereas continuous can be any number with points or decimals in it for say in discrete the dmft scores it can be 1 2 3 till 32 it cannot be 1.2 or 1.3 whereas continuous variables like mouth opening or distance between two teeth it uh, it can be 1.2 cm 1.5 cm and so on this continuous can be again divided into two types which is ratio and interval any value that doesn't have a true zero is known as interval for example temperature temperature does not have a true zero we consider that a uh, boiling point or the freezing point of water as a zero and then we have uh, given values for the temperature and temperature can go in negative also whereas ratio can never go in negative height of a person it will start from centimeters feet and inches whereas it can never be below zero so these are all basic different classification of data and their classifications and we are already are very familiar with this things like the mean median and mode which are used to represent the measures of central tendency and then comes comes the measures of dispersion which include range mean deviation and standard deviation and then we are also familiar about this particular concept of normal c curve or the normal distribution in which the curve follows a symmetrical uh, distribution and it is uh, following it is in the shape of a bell the mean median and mode falls in the middle and all those things so i am just trying to give you a recap of whatever you know in the bd and now we will enter into the test of significance so again i'll repeat you types of data the measures of central tendency dispersion and normality curve will be again and again helpful for you to decide on which test you are going to choose in your study and so on okay so with this we will go into the tests of significance tests of significance are nothing but they are all statistical procedures to draw draw inferences from the samples about the population and then why it is basically required because we need to study whether there is a significant difference between two different groups or not because always it can be said that uh, boost is equal to that of bone vita but until we conduct a test of significance to find out whether a boost is giving us more energy or bone vita is going to give us more energy it is waste of time as as boost and bone vita we can also compare water with boost drinking boost is also a liquid kind of drinking and drinking water is also liquid kind of drinking but until the company proves that drinking boost gives you more energy it is totally waste for us to spend the money in drinking the boost so to find out whether there is a significant difference between two groups we need to conduct a test of significance and also to find out whether the difference is real or when can we can uh, generalize the results to the population also this test of significance is there are basically five steps for conducting a test of significance which includes stating a null hypothesis choosing the levels of significance that is the alpha value which is a constant always it can be kept to be 0.05 and then the third one is to decide the test of significance how to decide it we will see in the forthcoming slides 
and then to calculate the value of test statistics that is we will calculate the statistics uh, using uh, different formulas and so on and then we will represent it in terms of uh, mean median and mode or using uh, standard deviation and interquartile ranges and finally we will have something known as the p value which will help us to tell whether there is a significant difference or not Okay, now that we have known about different steps in conducting a test of significance, we will see what are all the important assumptions of So that is we need to check for the distribution of the data. So whenever the data is quantitative, we need to check for the distribution, whether it is normally distributed or it is non normally distributed. So that can be done by doing few tests, which includes the Shapiro Wilkes and Kolmo Gross Mirnhoff. But the concept is that the test will try to plot all the values in the graph. And if the graph is following a symmetrical distribution with mean, median, and mode at the center, then we will follow the it is assumed to follow a normal distribution and we will use a parametric test test whereas if it is not following the normal distribution then we will be using the non parametric test then the finally is the number of groups or the data sets that is being involved in the study so based on the number of gro groups that are there we will select the test so we will see a basic introduction about the parametric test According to Robson's, a parametric statistical test is a test whose model specifies certain conditions about the parameters of the population from which the sample was drawn. That is, there is an assumption that is being already made in terms of parametric test and the assumptions are like norms. So the population is assumed to follow all those things, then we will go for the probability or the parameter. Test. The parametric test includes PSN's correlation coefficient test, t test, z test, and so this PSN's correlation test is used to find out the relationship between two variables, whether they are uh, uh, having a positive relationship or whether they are having a negative relationship. This is somewhat similar to that of the inverse relationship or the direct relationship. So here we can see that whenever there is a perfect positive correlation, the value of uh, PSN's correlation coefficient will be in positive numbers. And whenever there is no relationship, the PSN's correlation coefficient will be zero. And this is how the graph will appear. And whenever there is a negative correlation, the graph will go or show a downward trend and the values will be ranging from minus one to zero. So a PSN's correlation coefficient value can range from minus one to one through zero. Zero means there is no relationship between two parameters and when it goes in positives, then there is a positive relationship and when it is going negative value, then it means that there is a negative relationship. This can be used to find out the relationship between age and the dental carry status of the population, age and periodontal disease state and status or number of cigarettes smoked per day and the nicotine dependence of the patient. So in these conditions, we can use the correlation coefficient test the next one is a t test so whenever we assume that there are more than 30 samples then it it might follow a normal distribution and then we go for the uh, t test and also we should check using the test also instead of assuming we can go with the normality test and then confirm whether the data is quantitative and it is following a normal distribution as well there are two different types of t-test. The one, first one is a pair t-test. The other one is known as the unpaired or the independent t-test. So whenever there is a, uh, whenever we need to compare between a single group before and after the treatment, we can go with the 
pad t test so there will be a single follow up and the baseline data that is available for us to compare the data and in case of unpaired t test we can compare the data of two completely independent groups so few examples for uh, or conditions where we can use the unpaired t test are to compare the height of boys and girls because boys and girls so the height the height of one parameter does not have any relationship with the other parameter so to compare between boys and girls we can go with the unpaired or independent t test and in terms of uh, using two different methods to uh, for stress reduction we can use the unpaired t test the second commonly or the third most commonly used test is the one way anova analysis of covariance so this is almost similar to that of the t test but we will use this anova when we have more than two groups for example when we need to compare the effectiveness of herbal homeopathic and fluoride toothpaste in preventing dental caries we can go with the anova and then uh, instead of repeated uh, instead of using a pad t test when we are having more than two follow ups that is baseline first follow up and then when we have the second follow up we will go for something known as the repeated measures anova so these are all the basic tests which is considered to be the parametric test the second part is the non parametric test so to have a basic introduction about the non parametric test we have few criteria that is if the sample size is less than 30 we can go for non parametric test if we run a normality test and the normality is being shown as that the distribution is non normal then we will go with the non parametric test and if we have used a non probability sampling method we will go with the non parametric test so the sampling methodology the sample size as well as the distribution of the data can help us to choose whether we need to go with the non probability sampling tests or not but the problem here is that it requires more data for us to conduct a non probability sampling method and it is also less efficient when compared to that of any probability sampling method so there are different tests and like the probability sampling method uh, tests the non probability sampling tests are named after each and every person so it might be a bit uh, difficult initially for us to remember the name of the test but as and when time goes on you will automatically keep remembering it and then you can use it as well so the most commonly used test is the chi square test and then other tests that are used are mcnimeth test wilcoxon sine rank test man witney u test kruskal valleys and so chi square test is being invented by carl pearson and it is the most common or sim simplest non parametric test that is being used and this is the formula that is being used to calculate so chi square test can be used for three different purposes one is to test the association that is to find out the association between two factors which can be smoking and cancer treatment and the outcome of the disease vaccination and immunity it can be used to compare the uh, proportions between two different groups that is to compare the frequencies of diabetes and non diabetes in groups weighing between so based on weight uh, weight whether people are diabetic or not so to compare between those things we can use a chi square test and finally to find out the goodness of it the other test is known as the fisher's exact test so this is similar to that of chi square test but whenever the sample size is less than 20 then we will go with the fisher's exact test and more than 20 if more than 25 percentage of the cells in your chi square test or the 2 into 2 table that you derive has a frequency of less than 5 then we will go with the fisher's exact test. then comes something known as the mcnimeth test it is used to compare between before and after findings in the same group so it is also uh, it is something similar to that of a pat t test but here we will use it for a non parametric purpose as well as for the qualitative data so example here is comparing the attitude of medical students towards confidence in statistics uh, analysis can be done before the session and after the session where you can give your uh, confidence level into very confident confident or slightly confident or not confident so they are all a uh, ordinal data and before and after comparison we will be using the The next one is known as the Wilcoxon sine rank test which is the 
exact non parametric equivalent of the pat t test even for a quantitative data when it is not following the uh, rules of uh, or when it is not normally distributed we will go with the wilcoxon sign rank test we will compare with baseline and the follow up period man whitney u test it is the exact replica of the independent or the unpaired t test wherein we can compare between the two groups and then we can tell whether there is a difference existing between the two groups or then comes the kruskal valley test which is exact replacement of the <coughs> anova test wherein for any quantitative data that does not follow normal distribution we will follow the kruskal valley test and it is also uh, an extension of the man whitney u test in man whitney u test we will have only two groups this is an extension wherein uh, the group numbers will be more than two then comes something known as the friedman test friedman test is equal to the repeated measures anova in which we will have more than two follow ups example baseline follow up one in 14 days and follow up to 28 days then we have something known as spearman's correlation coefficient which is again a non parametric version of the psn's correlation the value here also lies between minus 1 to plus 1 through 0 zero means there is no relationship between two variables and uh, when the variables are in positive signs then it means that there is a positive relationship and whenever it is in negative it means like there is a negative relationship here we will have a chart which will help us to identify or to spot out what test we can use at what uh, time so we need to first of all identify what kind of data we have collected so if it is a qualitative data and only we have two different groups we can go for chi square test or fisher's exact test so chi square test is the most commonly used test but when we have a sample size even less than 20 and if we see that the Uh, cell frequencies uh, like 25 percentage of the cells have a frequency of less than 5 we can go with the fisher's exact test whereas when we have pad data that is before and after data we will go with the mcnema test so these tests can be used for only qualitative and when it comes to quantitative data we need to check for the normalcy of the data so the first step for assessing a quantitative data is that we will check for the normal distribution whether it is normally distributed or non normally distributed in case if it is normally distributed when there are two independent groups we will go with the unpaired t test or the independent t test and if it is more than two groups we will go with one way anova if it is a paired group that is before and after treatment then if it is only a before and after we will go with paired t test if we have more follow ups then we will go with repeated measures on over if the data follows a non normal distribution in case of two independent groups we will use a man whitney u test and if there are more than two independent groups we will go for kruskal valley test in case of uh, pad data before and after we will use a wilcoxon sign rank test if we have more than two follow ups then we will go with friedman test so with this we can conclude this particular topic that that is it is essential for us as medical researchers to know about statistics and different statistical tests and when to use what test and also it helps us to provide generalizations to the population because whenever we need to publish an article the first thing that the reviewer will see is that whether we have uh, we can generalize our results that is to india or towards the world population so if we cannot generalize it then they will ask us to go with publishing in a local journal so to generalize the results definitely we should have a proper idea about the statistical test and also it will help us to critically evaluate whether other articles or other treatment modalities can be incorporated or not incorporated and it will also provide us information about the methodology of the research design whether it is valid or not valid if they have used inappropriate test then we cannot completely rely on the data that they have given us and we cannot uh, implicate or we cannot mention those uh, results or we cannot use those results in treating our patients these are all the few references which i have and finally thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to vdc as well as uh, to the faculties of vdc and thank you to the students for your patient listening 
i hope that this would have helped you a bit uh, kindly go back and then try to read again else it will be uh, a bit more dry for us but as they say that uh, when we keep doing something uh, over a period of time we get more expertise in it so if you keep reading this definitely i hope that you will also gain a lot of expertise in this as well as uh, wish you all the best for your exams thank you Thank you, sir, for sharing your expertise on sampling and statistical analysis. We have a few questions, sir, by the participants. Sir, am I audible? Yeah. We have a few questions by the participants, sir. Yes. Sir. Yes. Uh, the first question is: uh, Can you explain mixed binomial mode? So there are there are all regression statistics. So when we need to eliminate the effect of other complementary variables or other variables that might influence the relationship of two variables, then we will go for the regression. And binomial we will go when we have. Two categorical variables. That is, the different variables are categorical. Then we we'll go for binomial regression. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, the next one is: What can be the most commonly expected, uh, or what can be more concentrated in case of uh, exam view, sir? The topics. And this book, uh, I think, mean, so is it? different types of uh, sampling methods. We have seen right the four uh, probability and the not probability mapping. And they are also asking about the steps in conducting the uh, steps in uh, conducting a statistical or uh, tests of significance. What are all the steps? So they were the most commonly asked questions to be used. But I'm also not aware about it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Shivashankar, how are you? Thanks, how are you, sir? Yeah, good, good. Uh, and lecture was very nice. Uh, thank you very thank much you. for uh, taking it. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll be in touch with you. We'll be displaying your uh, certificate, sir. Thank you, sir. Moving on to the next lecture, titled Development of Tongue, Blood and Nerve Supply, Muscles of Tongue and Muscles of Mastication. It is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Kusum Rajendra Gandhi, Ma'am, Assistant Professor at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. Ma'am completed her undergraduation from Gajraraja Medical College, Jivaji University and post-graduation from Rural Medical College, Pravara Institute of Medical Sciences, Loni, Maharashtra. She has immense knowledge in the field of anatomy and has 14 years of teaching experience in various colleges of Madhya Pradesh. Ma'am has national and international publications to her credit and is very active and instrumental in research activities. Before ma'am begins, a gentle reminder to post your queries to the topic and they will be answered subsequently at the end of the lecture. Ma'am, I welcome you to begin the session.
afternoon students uh, so in this series of lectures of revision my topic will be uh, muscles of tongue embryogenesis of tongue uh, role of tongue in mastication blood and nerve supply myself dr kusum gandhi assistant professor from department of anatomy aims for part next please so in this revision plan we will uh, study under under following subheadings first we will see the introduction and gross anatomy of tongue uh, we will uh, study all the extrinsic as well as uh, intrinsic muscles of tongue the arterial supply venous drainage the innervation of tongue and the development of tongue along with few of the applied anatomical aspects so as we all know tongue is a uh, next please as we all know tongue is a highly mobile highly sensitive muscular organ in the oral cavity it lies partly in the oral cavity and the partly in the oropharynx it bulges from the floor uh, of the mouth and its posterior part forms the anterior wall of the oropharynx so it is essentially a mass of skeletal muscle covered by mucous membrane and the muscle mass is separated into right and left halves a uh, halves uh, by a midline fibrous septum okay so you will see it is located in the oral cavity uh, with two parts so the anterior two third of the tongue is uh, on the oral part and the uh, posterior one third is, is the pharyngeal part of the tongue the basic functions of the tongue are uh, perception of taste Uh, it also helps in articulation or speech, and the uh, the first phase of mastication that is uh, deglutition and the respiration. So basically, the shape of tongue is conical as shown in this figure. Okay, and therefore it has, as it is a muscular organ, it has uh, a dorsal surface and a ventral surface. Okay, so it has a dorsal surface and a ventral surface. Next, please. Next slide. The presenting parts of the tongue are basically its root, by which it is connected to the pharynx, okay, and the tip. Okay. and the part between the root and the tip of the tongue is the body of the tongue the tip is also named as the pharynx the root uh, is attached to the higher bone okay uh, higher bone and the tip the anterior part is uh, of the genioglossus muscle is attached to the mandible and to this here we can see this is the attached attached part of the tongue so anteriorly it is attached to the posterior surface of the uh, symphysis mandibular and posteriorly it is attached to the higher plane and the nerves and vessels to supply this tongue they enter through its root so basically they enter through the root Now the tip or the anterior end is free end, which comes into contact with the center incisor tooth. The body is between the uh, root and the tip. We have already seen, and this body of the tongue has two surfaces and two borders. The two surfaces are the dorsal surface and the ventral surface, and the two borders are the lateral borders, right, and the left lateral borders. Now this dorsal surface is convex. The dorsal surface is convex, okay, and it is divided into two parts by sulcus terminalis, which which starts from foramen cecum. So this depression you can appreciate as a depression. This is foramen cecum, and from here this sulcus, which is uh, a V-shaped sulcus, and extending from the foramen cecum to the lateral border of the tongue, has sulcus terminalis. So this is sulcus terminalis. On the dorsal surface, this part anterior to foramen cecum and sulcus terminalis to the tip. 
is the anterior two third of the cup. Posterior to this foramen cecum and the attachment of tongue to the epiglottis. This is epiglottis to which the tongue is attached by medial glossoepiglottic fold and the two lateral glossoepiglottic folds. Okay. So this part is named as is called as posterior one third of the tongue. So am I clear? The dorsal surface of the tongue is divided into two parts: the anterior two third and the posterior one third, demarcated by foramen cecum and sulcus terminalis. Next slide. So the same is shown in the zoom view. Just anterior to sulcus terminalis, you can appreciate these circumvallate papillae, rounded papillae. With the sulcus around. Okay, so these are the circumvallate papillae which lies just anterior to the sulcus terminus. Okay. And this blind foramen is foramen cecum. So from this foramen cecum, thyroid diverticulum, medium thyroid diverticulum. So here you can see this is foramen cecum, this is dorsum of tongue, anterior to the and posterior one third, and this foramen cecum. From here, there is origin of medium thyroid diverticulum, okay, which extends up to the thyroid gland of the neck. Please go to the previous slide. Yes. So, this is thyroid diverticulum, which is connected to the thyroid. Okay. So, foramen cecum, it has origin from the second pharyngeal arch. Which does not participate in formation of tongue, in development of tongue. It helps in formation of the thyroid gland. So, this is thyroglossal duct, remnant of the thyroid diverticulum. Next slide, please. Now, this dorsal part of tongue, the anterior tooth, has a median furrow and lingual pattern. These lingual papillae are projections of the epithelium over the dorsal surface of the tongue. Okay. And there are four, uh, four types of papillae, four types of lingual papillae. They are named as circumvallate or valet papillae, filiform papillae, fungiform papillae and foliate papillae. First we will see the details of valet papillae or the other name is circumvallate papillae. These circumvallate papillae are 10 to 16 in number located just anterior to sulcus terminalis okay and they have a deep trench so this is the histological section of circumvallate papillae this is a deep uh, trench okay this is the medial portion this deep trench and the uh, part of circumvallate papillae okay so these circumvallate papillae are roughly V shaped. The lattice diameter is 1 to 2 millimeters, and each papillae is, uh, is surrounded by a circular, this circular uh, trench or sulcus. And this central sulcus is bounded on its periphery by a wall. So they are bounded by a wall. Now there are few ducts, a uh, few uh, salivary glands which are uh, present just deep to the sulcus of this circumvallate papillae, which is named as von Ebner's gland. And these glands secrete their serous secretion within the trench of this circumvallate papillae. Go to previous slide, please. Yes. So they secrete the secretion within this trench. Okay. Now, circumvallate papillae has plenty of taste buds in its lateral wall. So, these yellow shapes are the taste buds which are responsible for perception of taste in the circumvallate papillae. So, we have seen that these circumvallate papillae are 10 to 16 in number. They are truncated cone. They have uh, the main uh, substance of the circumvallate papillae and the deep trench within which the secretions of von Ebner's glands are secreted so that the taste can be appreciated in the in the uh, in the food which we take. Okay. Next slide, please. 
Then the second type of uh, lingual papillae is the filiform papillae. So filiform papillae. The shape of filiform papillae is uh, finger-like or uh, sharply pointed tips. They are most numerous types of. Go to previous slide, please. So they are most numerous types of uh, lingual papillae over the dorsal aspect of the tongue. They are scattered all over the dorsal surface and they does not possess taste buds. Okay, so these filiform papillae are not responsible for perception of taste. So what? Uh, so their function is to perceive the general features of the ingested food in the form of temperature or form. Like we can appreciate whether the uh, food which we have taken is rough or it is soft. Okay. Whether it is cold or it is hot. So these perceptions are taken or uh, perceived by these filiform papillae, which are most numerous, present all over the dorsal surface of the tongue. The next type of papillae is the fungiform papillae. So here you can see the fungiform papillae. It is mushroom shaped, rounded head, and a narrow base. The maximum diameter is almost uh, approximately one millimeters, and uh, they are mostly located at the apex or the margins of the tongue. Okay, so visible as discrete pin, uh, pink pin heads over the dorsum of tongue, and taste buds are present on these uh, on the form papillae. Okay, so these are the fungiform papillae which are scattered in between the filiform papillae, mostly present over the apex of the tongue and the lateral. Next slide, please. So here we can see the tongue from the superior aspect. This is a lower lip showing various types of papillae. This is sulcus terminalis, okay. and these are the circumvallate papillae, the filiform papillae, the fungiform papillae on the lateral aspect and the apex, okay. and the orocaris. Now coming to the dorsal surface of pharyngeal part of uh, the tongue or the base of the tongue. So this is the pharyngeal part of the tongue. It forms the anterior wall of the orocarix, okay? but it does not possess lingual papillae. But there is presence of large number of lingual follicles in the submucosa, also known as lingual forms. The mucosa on the surface is reflected into onto the front of the epiglottis. So this is the front of the epiglottis where the mucosa of the posterior one third of the tongue is. Please go to the previous slide. Okay, so uh, it is mucosa is folded over to the anterior surface of the epiglottis and uh, by the in the form of median uh, glossopiglottic fold and two lateral glossopiglottis. Okay, so the region between the median and lateral dorsal epiglottic fold is named as epiglottic reticulum. Epiglottic reticulum. Now here you should appreciate the palatoglossal arches. So this is palatoglossal arch, okay, by which the tongue is connected to the soft palate. Next slide, please. Now from the dorsal surface, you will see the Move on to the ventral surface of the tongue. So this region is the ventral surface of the tongue. The mucosa, a mucosa of this surface is thin, smooth, and purplish. The main features are this is frenulum linguae, by which the tongue uh, it is a fold of mucous membrane by which the tongue is connected to the floor of the oral cavity or the mouth. So this is the uh, frenulum linguae. Diagrammatic representation of ventral surface. Just later to this, we can see a, a bluish structure. This is deep lingual vein. This is deep lingual vein. Further later to this is like a fimbriata, which is a fringe fold of mucous membrane. Okay, just later to the deep lingual veins. So these are the structures along the ventral surface of the Tongue. Further, uh, as we proceed to uh, posteriorly, we can see the sublingual fold, sublingual fold, which is a mucous fold covering the sublingual ducts and the sublingual uh, gland for its secretions. Coming to the muscles of the tongue, 
these muscles of the tongue are uh, categorized into extensive muscles and intrinsic muscles. Extensive muscles take origin from structures outside the tongue and insert within the tongue. Basically, it produces movements of the tongue and changes the shape of the tongue. And intrinsic muscles are the muscles which take origin within the abductions or parenchyma of the tongue and they are inserted there. So, therefore, they are named as intrinsic muscles. They help in lengthening the uh, size of the tongue as well as changing the shape. Next slide. The extensive muscles are named as the genoglossus muscle, hyoglossus, styloglossus, and palatoglossus. So the names of the uh, extensive muscles are derived from the uh, bony region from where they are taking origin. Like genoglossus is taking origin from the superior genial tubercle. Hyoglossus is taking origin from the uh, greater corner of the higher bone. Go to previous slide. Styloglossus is taking origin from the styloid process and palatoglossus is taking origin from the soft palate. So these extensive muscles are named according to uh, the bone from where they are taking from uh, or region from where they are taking origin. The intrinsic muscles are uh, grouped into superior longitudinal, inferior longitudinal, transverse, and the vertical muscles, which we will, we will see in the section of the tongue. Okay, so this muscle is genoglossus, this hyoglossus, styloglossus, and palatoglossus. So these are the four extrinsic muscles and intrinsic muscles. I will show you in subsequent slides. Next slide, please. We will study the details of genoglossus muscle, which is also named as the safety muscle of the tongue. It is a fan shaped muscle, forms uh, the most bulk, uh, most of the bulk of the tongue. It takes origin from the superior genial tubercle on the posterior aspect of the symphysis menti, and its fibers radiate backwards into the corresponding half of the tongue, extending from the tip to the base of the tongue or the root of the tongue. So you can see over the screen that the lower fibers of this genoglossus muscles, the inferior most fibers are inserted into the body of the higher bone. The intermediate fibers are passing beneath the anterior border of hyoglossus and extend up to the stylohyde ligament and the middle constrictor of the pharynx. The superior most fibers turn upwards and forwards extending up to the tip of the tongue and therefore this fan shaped muscle helps in protrusion of the tongue when both sides of the muscle contact together so in this figure you can see that the girl is protruding her tongue this is because of the contraction of the genioglossus muscle and as this muscle uh, prevents backward fall of the tongue it is also named as the safety muscle of the tongue. Next slide, please. Hyoglossus is the key muscle of the suprahyoid region. Hyoglossus, as the name suggests, it is taking origin from the upper surface of the greater corner of the higher bone and is inserted over the lateral side of the tongue between the styloglossus laterally and the inferior longitudinal muscle medially. So, this is you can appreciate that it is a quadrangular muscle flat muscle extending from the higher bone to the lateral side of the tongue. So when these fibers will contract on both the sides, they will lead to depression of the tongue and make the dorsal surface convex. So in this figure, you can appreciate there is retraction of the tongue. After uh, the genoglossus and hyoglossus, we will see the uh, next muscle that is the styloglossus muscle. Styloglossus is taking origin from the styloid process and is inserted along the whole length of the side of the tongue. And when these muscles will contact, they will lead to retraction of the tongue. Now, in between, we can see the relations of hyoglossus muscle, the superficial and deep relations. Uh, please show slide number 18. 
So superficial relations of hypoglossus are hypoglossal nerve. So here you can see this is the hypoglossal nerve. Then the lingual nerve, along with lingual nerve, there is submandibular ganglion and the submandibular duct. Then for the superficial, uh, in the superficial relation of hyoglossus, there is styloglossus muscle and the mylohyde muscle. So in this part, you can see inferior figure, the lower figure is showing the mylohyde muscle. Okay. So these are the superficial relations, hypoglossal nerve, lingual nerve, deep part of submandibular gland, submandibular duct, submandibular ganglion, styloglossus muscle and the mylohyde muscle. The deep relations of hyoglossus are commonly asked and you should know very well. So just deep to hyoglossus are the inferior longitudinal muscle of the tongue. Then there is genioglossus muscle which we have seen in detail. Further in this figure you can appreciate the middle constrictor of the pharynx along with the glossopharyngeal nerve. Okay. So this one is the glossopharyngeal nerve which is passing deep to hyoglossus. The stylohyde ligament is also shown along with the lingual artery. So this lingual artery passes deep to the posterior border of hyoglossus towards the tongue. Lingual artery is the branch of external carotid artery. Now coming to the palatoglossus muscle, please show slide number 21. As the name suggests, palatoglossus is the muscle which is taking origin from the soft palate. So it takes origin from the uh, oral surface of the palatine aponosis as shown in this figure inserted over the side of the tongue at the junction of anterior two third and posterior one third which we have seen in the previous slides. So when it will contact it will lead to approximation of the palatoglossal arch. Okay so it pulls the tongue upwards. Coming to the intrinsic muscles of the tongue, intrinsic uh, muscles of the tongue are superior and inferior longitudinal muscles uh, which go along the length of the tongue and therefore when they contract, they lead to movement of the tip of the tongue up and down. Okay? The transverse muscles go across the tongue and uh, so as these muscles are transverse, when they will contract, they will lead to narrowing of the tongue as well as lengthening of the tongue okay now vertical muscles go up and down in the tongue okay vertical they are named as vertical muscles so they go up and down in the tongue and flattens and depresses the tongue okay the role of tongue in mastication basically is in the first stage of deglutition because mastication is a coordinated process integrating central control sensory input the muscle function so the food which is introduced into the oral cavity in bite-sized pieces, it is positioned on the occlusal surfaces by the cheek and the tongue. So the tongue helps in keeping, uh, in positioning the uh, food, bolus of food between the cheek and the tongue. And finally, it is collected in the oropharynx to form the bolus ready for the swallow. So basically the deglutition is, uh, deglutition is the uh, conjoint function of jaw, hired and the tongue complex which is shown in this figure. Coming to the embryogenesis of the tongue. So the uh, embryogenesis of the tongue can be studied under uh, following heading. Uh, first, the development of muscles, development of uh, fibromuscular stroma and development of the mucous membrane. So the muscles of the tongue which we have seen, they develop from the occipital myotomes formed by the fusion of four pre-cervical somites. Okay? So they are formed by the fusion of four pre-cervical somites which are present uh, just cranial to the cervical vertebrae and therefore these muscles are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve which is the 12th cranial nerve and also the nerve of the occipital myotomes. Okay, so these 
muscles develops along the uh, pre cervical somites and then, then these uh, there is migration of these muscles towards the oral cavity carrying their nerve supply with them therefore you have seen the hypoglossal nerve towards the lateral aspect of the muscles of tongue the fibromuscular stroma or the connective tissue of the tongue develops from the mesoderm of the adjacent pharyngeal arches so the development uh, of the mucous membrane of the tongue is basically from the uh, pharyngeal arches first third and fourth so in this figure we can very well appreciate the pharyngeal arches which de develops around around the neck of the developing embryo and there are six pharyngeal arches out of which first third and fourth contribute to the formation of the mucous membrane of the tongue so we can see a swelling along the midline of the first pharyngeal arch which is also named as the uh, the median tongue bud now uh, during the end of fourth week okay and we can see a copula or elevation of the second pharyngeal arch and tuberculum impar or the hypopharyngeal eminence at the median region of third and fourth pharyngeal arches okay so during further development of the fifth week the and there is formation of two lingual swellings along the median plane of the first pharyngeal arch okay and uh, we can appreciate that the second pharyngeal arch is not participating in formation of tongue and the third pharyngeal arch is overgrowing the second pharyngeal arch leading to formation of posterior one third of the tongue okay so along the sixth week the second arch has been submerged and the third arch pharyngeal arch is uh, overgrown the second pharyngeal arch to form the posterior one third of the tongue so we can appreciate two lingual swellings of the first pharyngeal arch and the tuberculum impar of the tuberculum impar of the second pharyngeal arch has been submerged and this is hypobranchial eminence of third pharyngeal arch which is forming posterior one third of the tongue and then the posterior most part of the tongue so next slide that is 26 number so here we can appreciate the two lingual swellings forming anterior two third of the tongue the tuberculum impar is forming foramen cecum and the uh, third pharyngeal arch which is shown in yellow shade is uh, uh, leading to formation of posterior one third of the tongue but at this moment you should appreciate that the circumvallate papillae, which lies anterior to the surface terminalis, are also developing from the say, third pharyngeal arch. Okay, so this development is shown in the nerve supply of the tongue. tongue. So the anterior two third of the tongue. The sensory innervation of the mucosa is carried via the lingual branch of the mandibular branch of trigeminal you know, nerve. The taste innervation, taste sensations are carried via the corda tympani branch of the facial nerve, and motor innervation of the intrinsic skeletal muscles is via the hypoglossal nerve. Whereas uh, for the posterior one third of the tongue, the sensory innervation of mucosa as well as taste sensations both are carried by the glossopharyngeal or the ninth cranial nerve okay and the motor innervation of intrinsic muscles is by the hypoglossal nerve coming to the arterial supply of the tongue so here this uh, figure is showing the arterial supply and venous drainage of the tongue this is external carotid artery and this is the lingual artery which is uh, branch of the external carotid artery okay so it will give the dorsal artery dorsal lingual artery so here you can see the dorsal lingual artery is taking origin from the main lingual artery just along the posterior border of hyoglossus muscle to supply the tongue then further in its course it gives a large branch that is deep lingual artery which we can see along the ventral aspect of the tongue 
so the veins usually follows these uh, branches of arteries and they drains into the internal jugular vein okay so there will be deep lingual vein and there will be vena comitans around the hypoglossal nerve also okay so these branch uh, these uh, tributaries will join to form the lingual vein which will drain into the internal jugular vein so um, on the right side the motor innervation is shown all the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles which we have seen are supplied by hypoglossal nerve that is cranial nerve 12 except the palatoglossus muscle which is supplied by the branches from the 10th and 11th cranial nerves okay so 10th cranial nerve is vagus now and 11th cranial nerve is the spinal accessory nerve okay so uh, palatoglossus is supplied by 10th and 11th cranial nerve whereas the extrinsic muscles of tongue are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve we have already seen now coming to the sensory innervation the anterior two third of tongue the general sensations are carried by the uh, lingual nerve branch of the mandibular division of trigeminal nerve and special sensations or taste sensations are carried by the cordial except the circumvallate papillae okay so circumvallate papillae and the posterior part of the tongue posterior one third of the tongue both general and taste sensations are carried by glossopharyngeal nerve whereas the posterior most part of the tongue the uh, sensations are carried by the 10th cranial nerve so this is uh, this figure uh, please go to slide number 31 so gustatory pathway gustatory pathway is shown in this uh, figure so from the anterior to third the general sensations are taken by the lingual nerve and special sensations by the facial nerve okay and from the posterior one third, the special sensations and general sensations both are carried by the glossopharyngeal nerve. Posterior most part, the sensations are carried by the vagus nerve. So these sensations will travel to the solitary nucleus of the medulla oblongata, and from there, the sensations will relay in the in the thalamus nucleus of thalamus. From there, they will relay in the gustatory cortex of the insula insular cortex. So like this, we can trace the gustatory pathway and detect whether the path is intact in that particular patient or not coming to the applied aspect tongue tie is a common clinical uh, situation which is observed in the clinics where the frenulum extends towards the tip of the tongue okay actually frenulum does not extend uh, till the tip okay so in this case if the frenulum extends till the tip of the tongue this condition is named as tongue tie and uh, because of this it inhibits movement of the tongue and may interfere in normal speech uh, the sublingual route of oral medication is commonly used in cases of uh, myocardial infarction because uh, the lipid soluble drugs can diffuse through the thin mucous membrane of sublingual region on the oral cavity okay and few other conditions are uh, the oral thrush or glossitis so these pictures are showing the infection the causes are many i am not going in detail just you should know that these are few conditions which are related so uh, students we have seen the gross anatomical aspects of tongue we have seen the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue in detail along with their origin insertion and action we have seen the vascular supply nerve supply okay and we have also seen the gustatory pathway i think this will remove your uh, doubts and help you in one or the other way i thank the vishnu dental college for inviting me for this guest lecture thank you all all the best thank you It was a great experience to hear your views on this topic, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we have few queries from our participants. The first one is, uh, ma'am, am I audible? 
Ma'am, kindly unmute your... Uh... Ma'am, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Uh, we have some questions, ma'am, from the participants. Yes. Uh, the first one is, what are the consequences of a patient who has undergone hemiglossectomy or glossectomy? What are the consequences? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so it will the consequences will depend upon the uh, process and the part of tongue which is uh, hemidissected. Okay. So if it is dissected, so the functions of the tongue will be uh, hampered, or the speech will be there will be difficulty in speech. There will be difficulty in deglutition. So all the functions will be hampered on that side of the tongue organ. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Shall I move on to the next one? Yes, please. Yes, ma'am. Why are different tastes perceived on different parts of the tongue, ma'am? So basically, I have taught you in the lecture itself that uh, there are various four various types of papillae. Okay, and so uh, the various uh, perception of taste is depending upon the development of taste buds. So the uh, we know that filiform papillae does not have any taste bud. So the fu uh, fungiform papillae and the foliate papillae and the circumvallate papillae are responsible for the perception of taste. Okay. So the receptors over the various parts of the tongue are designed are having those um, particular perception function. Therefore, we perceive different tastes at different segments of the tongue. Okay. Um, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for uh, giving your uh, great uh, experience on this topic, ma'am. Uh, we would like to display your certificate, ma'am. Kindly accept it, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, will you please email the certificate? Yes, ma'am. We'll do it shortly, ma'am. It was you. wonderful to have you on board, ma'am. Okay, thank you. All the best to the students. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to introduce the last guest speaker of today, Dr. Madhusudan Reddy, sir, a proud alumni member of Vishnu Dental College, who is currently working as reader in Army College of Dental Sciences, Second Rabat. Sir was recently awarded as best teacher at institute level, and sir has served as journal reviewer for well-renowned journals and has several national and international scientific papers to his credit. We welcome you, sir, and all of us are eager to hear your views on bleeding disorders and coagulopathy. coagulopathies. Over to you, sir. Participants, myself, Dr. Madhusudan Reddy, leader, Army College of Dental Sciences, Kimrata, want to discuss the topic of bleeding and clotting disorder. So, before going to the topic, learning objectives for today's session is to learn about normal hemostasis, bleeding disorders due to vessel wall and platelet abnormalities, correlation disorders, and applied pathology related to dentistry.
introduction so dental surgeons should have a detailed idea of bleeding and clotting disorders which can cause a medical emergencies on the dental chair and also know how to prevent this situation so dental procedures uh, resulting in bleeding can have a serious consequences of patient having a bleeding disorders which may uh, cause severe hemorrhage or death of the patient in the dental chair before going to the uh, bleeding and clotting disorders uh, the viewer should know what is hemostasis so hemostasis occurs in four phases vascular phase platelet phase coagulation phase and fibrinolytic phase so in the vascular phase after soon after the injury there is an immediate vasoconstriction uh, the, the secretion of histamine uh, uh, serotonin prostaglandins which cause vasoconstriction in the microvascular bed and thereby leading to a decreased loss of blood next one is the platelet phase in this in this phase the there is a uh, aggregation of platelets in a circulation uh, circulating uh, platelets aggregate onto the area of injury and they form a primary vascular plug so this primary vascular plug decreases the blood loss from the small blood vessels and capillaries so this a primary vascular plug adheres to the exposed basement membrane thereby leading to the clot formation next one is a coagulation phase generation of prothrombin and fibrin takes place in this phase uh, this involves uh, various proteins such as fibrinogen prothrombin and clotting factors such as factor 5 7 9 10 11 12 13 and along with this vitamin k dependent uh, factors such as uh, 2 7 9 and 10 so this clotting uh, phase takes place in three pathways intrinsic pathway extrinsic pathway and common pathway at the end of the coagulation phase there is a uh, fibrin poly polymerization uh, takes place and this it forms a gel and stabilizes the uh, platelet plug thereby reducing the uh, bleeding so these are the clotting factors and this is the uh, a representation of intrinsic pathway extent and there is a cascade of uh, intrinsic pathway, extensive pathway, and common pathway. Last phase is a fibrinolytic phase. So, in order to prevent the uh, propagation of uh, clot, fibrinolysis uh, takes place. So, tissue plasminogen activator releases the endo, uh, released by the endothelial cells will convert the plasminogen into plasmin. This plasmin degrades the fibrinogen and fibrin to fibrin degradation process. So hemostasis takes place by two ways: primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis. Primary uh, in the primary hemostasis, there is a formation of platelet plug, and in the secondary hemostasis, the uh, whatever the platelet plug is formed, that is stabilized. So with this knowledge, we are going to learn about bleeding and clotting disorders. Bleeding disorders. Uh, what is bleeding disorder? So bleeding disorder is due to capillary or platelet defect and clotting disorder is due to defect in a mechanism of coagulation. So what are the features, clinical features which you can expect in a bleeding and clotting disorders? Bleeding from the superficial cuts and scratches, delayed bleeding, spontaneous injured bleeding, petechia, ecchymosis, epistaxis, deep dissecting hematoma, uh, hematomas and hematrosis. So in order to uh, go ahead with the surgery, so initial evaluation which is required is bleeding time, clotting time, platelet count, prothrombin time and activated partial thromboplastin time. So bleeding time should be in the, norm, uh, the normal range of bleeding time is 2 to 9 minutes and clotting time is 5 to 11 minutes. Platelet should be 1,50,000 to 4,50,000 and the prothrombin time is assessed uh, to uh, know the extrinsic and common pathway, activity of extrinsic and co uh, common pathway and act activated partial thromboplastin time is assessed due, uh, in order to know intrinsic pathway and activity of factor 8 and factor 9. So classification of bleeding disorders. So bleeding disorders are classified as under so vessel wall disorders, platelet disorders and co uh, coagulation disorders. Under the coagulation disorders, you have uh, congenital coagulopathies and acquired coagulopathies. 
Congenital polyphthis include hemophilia A, hemophilia B, factor 9, 11 deficiency, 12 deficiency, 10 deficiency, and factor 5 deficiency, factor 13, and 1 deficiency. Last one is a von Willebrand disease. So, under the acquired uh, coagulopathies, we have anticoagulant related coagulopathies when using heparin and coumarin, and disease related to coagulopathies. Uh, acquired coagulopathies include liver disease, vitamin K deficiency, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and fibrinolytic disorders. First, we are going to learn about vessel wall abnormalities. So, all also called as non thrombocytopenic purpura, it is not uh, usually serious. So, well, the clinical features include petechia, purpura of skin, and mucous membrane. Nosebleed, menorrhagia, GI bleed, and hemorrhage, hemorrhage into the joints, so superior periosteum, and muscles. So, routine test for a Brazil wall abnormality will be normal. So, what are the causes for a Brazil wall abnormalities? Infection, infection due to meningiopopemia, infective endocarditis, ketosis, and drug reactions, which include immune leukocytic vasculitis. Scurvy and Ehlers Danlos syndrome. In the scurvy, there is an impaired collagen, uh, collagenous support. So, this is a picture which is indicating a scurvy. Uh, under the vessel wall abnormalities, you have Henoch Shanle Parthura, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, systemic amyloidosis. Under the Henoch uh, Shanle Parthura, you have a clinical features of bulky abdominal pain, poly polyarthralgia, acute glomerulonephritis, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia. Uh, the, it is a disorder of torture skin blood vessels. Uh, clinical features include nose bleeding, bleeding of oral cavity and eyes. Under the systemic amyloidosis, there is a perivascular deposition of amyloid and weakening of the uh, vessel wall. This will, this can cause uh, mucocutaneous petechia and uh, Allergic or Henoch uh, uh, Papura. Pathogenesis include immunological damage of the cell wall. It can be either viral infection or drug reaction. Clinical features include GI bleeding, renal failure, and purpura. So, pathology behind Henoch Papura is fibrinoid necrosis of the cell wall and neutrophilic vasculitis, IgA, and complement deposition. So, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, which occurs in a rendu arsler weber syndrome. And uh, in this, you have mucocutaneous telangiectasia plus arteriovenous malformation. Uh, clinical features include epistaxis, so, which is caused due to inadequate elastic and smooth wall or smooth muscle in a vessel wall. So, then we are going uh, to learn about platelet disorders. So, when in order to know platelet disorders, you should know what is platelet. So, uh, the platelet is derived from megakaryocyte by cytoplasmic fragmentation. Uh, thrombopoietin and uh, interleukin 11 controls the platelet production. Lifespan of a uh, platelet is 10 days. So, this is a megakaryocyte. From this uh, megakaryocyte, there is a uh, cytoplasmic fragmentation and formation of Platelets. So, this is a picture which is showing a, uh, it is a peripheral smear in which you can see a, a platelets. So, first, what is the function of platelets? It is responsible for hemostasis, that is, adhesion and aggregation of uh, platelets. It provides a phospholipids for, for collagen uh, coagulation reaction. So, receptors, in, uh, receptors on a platelet include glycoprotein 1b, factor 9 and von Willebrand factor, glycoprotein 2b, 3a and for fibrinogen, ADP, collagen and thrombin and coagulation factors. So, primary hemostasis. Normal primary hemostasis requires a functional vascular endothelium. Platelet count should be greater than 1 lakh per uh, microliter and function, functionally normal a platelet should be required for primary hemostasis. Von Willebrand factor should be uh, greater than 40% of normal. And fibrinogen, which is required, 
and the fibrinogen content should be more than uh, 25 micrograms per deciliter. So we are going to learn about platelet disorders. Platelet disorders can be classified as qualitative defects and uh, quantitative defects. So under the qualitative uh, quantitative defects, numerical platelet disorder. So decreased production, it can be caused by decreased production, decreased survival or sequestration. Sequestration is nothing but destruction of uh, uh, platelets, which is caused by hyperspinism and dilution. That is post transfusion uh, can also cause numerical uh, platelet disorders. Under the functional platelet disorders, which is also called as qualitative defect, uh, it is a defect in adhesion, defect in aggregation and disorders of platelet secretion. So first we are going to learn about thrombocytopenia. So thrombocytopenia is nothing but decreased platelet. Uh, so the, uh, when do you call it as a thrombocytopenia is when the count of a platelet which is which should be less than 1 lakh per cubic millimeter. So if the count is ranging between 20,000 to 50,000 per cubic millimeter, there will be a post-traumatic bleeding. There is a spontaneous bleeding which can occur when there is a, uh, a platelet count which is less than 20,000 per cubic millimeter, which involves a skin and mucous membrane. So spontaneous bleeding of under the skin and mucous membrane uh, will cause uh, petechia, purpura and ecchymosis. Petechia is not, nothing but a pinpoint uh, bleedings, bleeding in the skin and mucous membrane. Purpura is nothing but a small uh, uh, subcutaneous uh, sub or sub mucous membrane uh, patch which occurs due to uh, bleeding, sub, uh, subcutaneous or sub mucous membrane uh, bleeding. And ecchymosis when there is a hemorrhage of large uh, quantity, the hemorrhage of large area. Causes of thrombocytopenic purpura: decreased production of platelets. So generalized decrease of marrow, which is caused in aplastic anemia and marrow infiltration by leukemia or disseminated disseminated cancer, and, and selective impairment of uh, platelet production which is caused by drugs such as thiazide, cytotoxic drugs and alcohol. Infections such as HIV and measles can also cause impairment of production of uh, platelets. Ineffective megapyriopoiesis which is caused in a megaloblastic anemia or myelodysplastic syndrome which is also called as MDS. So decreased, decreased platelet survival so which is which can be caused by Immunogen, immunologic destruction, there is autoimmune, isoimmune, drug induced and infection. So non-immunogenic destruction can be due to disseminated intravascular coagulation or TTP that is thrombocytopenic purpura that is uh, joint hemangio hemangioma, microangiopathic hemolytic anemias and uh, decreased platelet survival uh, due to sequestration which is caused due to hyperspinism and dilutional which is for, uh, which is caused by massive stored blood transfusion next one is a platelet production defects decreased megakaryopiasis uh, it is very rare and isolated abnormality with two or more cell lines which are, which are involved congenital include fanconis anemia uh, with associated skeletal effects. Acquired includes bone marrow injury, which is caused due to aplasia, uh, due to radiation, chemotherapy, or viral infections such as hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So, in the replacement of bone marrow, there is a malignant hematopoietic cell line which is uh, involved, uh, which can be uh, caused by acute leukemia or lymphoma, multiple myeloma metastatic malignancies and fibrosis. Fibrosis uh, is as a primary process or secondary process due to metastatic disease. So ineffective erythropoiesis or premature cell death in a marrow, which can be caused by uh, non-malignant factors such as vitamin B6 or vitamin B, B12 or folate deficiency and malignant, which includes myelodysplastic syndromes.
ideal thrombocytopenic purpura, which is also called as ITP. It, uh, it is caused by autoimmune destruction or due to antiplatelet antibodies which are formed. So acute ITP, that is idiothrombocytopenic purpura, which is a self-limited disorder of children. It is usually preceded by viral infection. So it is abrupt in onset and uh, after an interval of two weeks, it resolves spontaneously within six months. 20% may progress to chronic uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So platelet count will be less than 20,000 per cubic millimeter. When it is a very serious or severe ITP, you can manage it with a steroid therapy. Next one is a idiopathic thrombocytic uh, uh, thrombocytopenic purpura, chronic. So chronic idiothrombocytopenic purpura. It is most commonly in adult women younger than 40 uh, years. Ma female to male ratio is 3 is to 1. It is insidious onset. So here you can uh, have a 30,000 to 80,000 uh, platelet count is between 30,000 to 80,000 cubic uh, per cubic millimeter. You can see a cutaneous petechial hemorrhage in a dependent area. You can also, uh, spinomegaly and lymphadenopathy are not uh, uh, are not a feature of chronic idiothrombocytic clinic purpura. So, uh, clinical features, long history of easy bruising, nosebleed, bleeding gums, extensive, uh, extensive hemorrhage in the joints and uh, after minor injury. Sometimes the first symptom of melina, hematuria and menorrhagia. You can uncommonly uh, the complications include subarachnoid hemorrhage, hemorrhage and intracerebral hemorrhage. So pathogenesis behind uh, chronic idiothrombocytopenic purpura, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura includes antibodies are uh, formed against the platelet membrane glycoprotein. These antibodies are predominantly IgG class. So opsonide, opsonized platelets are removed from the removed by the mononuclear phagocytic system. So spleen appears to be the major site of destruction. There is a uh, laboratory findings include low platelet count, large platelets in a uh, peripheral smear, bleeding time is prolonged, uh, prothrombin time and activated prothrombin time are normal. Test for a platelet antibody will be positive. So splenectomy is a, a treatment of choice. So it improves about 70 to 80, 75 percent, 75 to 80 percent of patients because uh, the spleen, uh, spleen is a major site of uh, antibody production and also of platelet destruction. So it is treated by uh, steroids and cyto cytoxin. Uh, medication it is treated by medication with the steroids and cytoxin etc so drug induced cyt uh, thrombocytopenia so uh, drug such as quinine quinine and quinidine penicillin thiazides and methyl dopa heparin all these can cause drug induced thrombocytopenia so uh, drug induced thrombocytopenia is of two types first one is it develops within a minute after the uh, therapy with the drugs and uh, here uh, the drug induced platelet aggregation so it is more modest in severity and uh, clinically it is significant type 2 in this uh, uh, it occurs after 5 to 14 days after the therapy with the drugs and it is caused by immune reaction against the heparin or platelet factor 4 so this causes platelet depletion as well as activation 20 to 60 percent may be associated with life threatening thromboembolism. Next one is a HIV associated thrombocytopenia. So, most common hematological manifestation of uh, HIV infection. So, impaired production and accel uh, accelerated destruction of uh, platelets. Here, megakaryocytes express CD4. That is why uh, the megakaryocytes are infected with the HIV and thereby decrease the production of. Uh, platelets. So antibodies against uh, 2B and 3A are also 
can be seen in HIV associated thrombocytopenia. Next is a disseminated intravascular coagulation. So it is also called as thrombohemorrhagic syndrome in which sustained activation of coagulation and fibrinolysis result in uh, consumption of platelets and coagulation of fibrinolytic factors. So thrombocytopenia is the manifestation of this uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation. Next one is a thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. It is also called as TTP uh, and hemolytic uremia syndrome. It occurs in an adult woman. It is characterized by a penter. There is a, a five features, five clinical features. There will be a fever, thrombocytopenia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, transient neurological defects, and renal failure. So here in this TPP or thrombos, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, there is a widespread hyaline thrombi in a microcirculation formed by platelet aggregation and fibrin. So fibrin thrombi include induce microangiopathic form of hemolysis or organ dysfunction. So it is caused by uh, influenza virus. So there is a plasma exchange can ensure 80% of survival. It occurs in three phases. There is a endothelial cell injury, secretion of abnormal Raj von Willebrand uh, factor multimers, and there will be a spontaneous platelet aggregation by von Willebrand factor. Next one is a up to now, we have learned about quantitative uh, uh, platelet defects. Now, there is a qualitative. We are going to learn about qualitative platelet disorders. That is also called functional disorders of platelets uh, inherited. So, defects in adhesion. Bernard Scholler syndrome is one of the uh, uh, one of the syndrome which is uh, which affects the adhesion of the platelets and defects in platelet aggregation glansman thrombasthenia it is a uh, autosomal recessive disorder characterized by failure of platelet to aggregate with adp and due to lack of uh, factor 2a 2b and factor 3a which is also called as fibrinogen receptor so other functional disorders of platelets include Disorders of platelet secretion and aspirin ingestion uremia. So, laboratory assessment of platelet disorders. You can assess the automated uh, platelet count, bone marrow aspirate and bone marrow biopsy, bleeding time, beta thromboglobin and platelet factor 4, platelet aggregation or ADP release, and platelet antibody assay. All these laboratory findings will assess the platelet disorders either qualitative or quantitative. Next one is a uh, prothrombin time. Prothrombin time or protein. It is a test for extrinsic and common pathway done using pa uh, patient's platelet to plasma, a tissue factor and uh, calcium. Always uh, while uh, assessing a prothrombin time, always we have to use a control sample uh, along with a, a patient sample. So normal uh, prothrombin time include uh, will will be uh, around 12 to 13 seconds. So when there is a abnormal uh, test that indicates a deficiency of a factors that is less than 30 percent of a normal factors involved in the extensive pathway. Uh, presence of inhibitors or it, is, it can be a technical error. Uh, correction can be done using uh, absorbed plasma or serum Russell Viper venom. So ideally, INR must be determined. INR is nothing but international uh, normalized ratio. So this is a method to com uh, compare programming time between the labs. So purpose is to adjust the different uh, reactivities of different tissue factors. So each thromoplastin uh, is assigned an international sensitivity index. The WHO standard of ISI is 1 uh, to 3. So prothrombin time ratio is calculated by uh, prothrombin time of patient and by prothrombin time of a control. 
So INR is calculated from a prothrombin ratio and ISI. So in absence of anticoagulant therapy, INR will be 0.8 to 1.2. So target range for INR in anticoagulants will be 2 to 3. When there is a high INR, it, in, uh, it indicates high risk of bleeding. When there is a low INR, it, is, uh, it indicates a high risk of developing clot. Next one is a activated prothrombin time, uh, activated partial thromboplastin time. This is also called as APTT. So it measures our intrinsic and common pathway integrity. It is done by using a plasma and phospholipid and calcium. Always uh, for this test also, there should be a control sample. So when there is an abnormal APTT, which indicates the deficiency of factors or presence of inhibitor or technical error. So correction can be done using absorbed plasma or serum. The range of APTT that is activated pro or uh, partial thromboplastin time uh, is about around 30 to 30 seconds to 50 seconds. Increased APTT uh, indicates a risk of bleeding and decreased APTT indicates a risk of thrombosis. Next one is a factor 8 one will brand factor complex. So this is made up of factor 8 and one will brand factor which is uh, which are coded for a different genes. So factor 8 is produced mainly in the liver. So deficiency of factor 8 will cause hemophilia A. One will brand factor is a multimer which acts as a, uh, a carrier for a factor 8 and is it is required for a uh, factor 8 stability it produced it is produced by endothelial cells so one will brand factor facilitates binding of platelets to subendothelial collagen through uh, glycoprotein 1b and 9 so one will brand factor is measured by restore setting aggregation test so there is a, a disease called as one will brand disease the frequency of this disease is one percent uh, one of the most common inherited bleeding disorder. So inherited by autosomal dominant or sometimes it can be autosomal recessive. Uh, here there will be a spontaneous bleeding of mu uh, from the mucosa, uh, excessive bleeding from the wounds and, uh, and or menorrhagia. There are three types of von Willebrand factors disease. So type 1, it, it is uh, autosomal dominant disease, 70% of a uh, one will brand disease uh, will be of type 1. So variable clinical expression but usually mild. There is a reduced circulation of one will brand factor. Uh, type 2 it is also uh, autosomal dominant and it accounts for about 25% of one will brand disease. Uh, there is a qualitative defect of one will brand factor. It is associated with moderate bleeding. And type 3, it is autosomal recess, uh, recessive. It is associated with very low levels of one will burn factor, which causes very severe bleeding. Laboratory findings for a one will brand disease prolonged bleeding time, normal platelet count, and plasma one will brand factor it is reduced in a, uh, and is measured by uh, resto setting uh, cofactor activity. So APTT may be prolonged. So next one is a hemophilia A. This is a X-linked recessive disorder. 30% have no family history. Uh, it majorly affects the males. So very rarely it affects the heterozygous female because of unfavorable lineization. So incidence of this hemophilia A is, A is 1 is to 10,000 males. So most commonly inherited disorder with a serious bleeding. So this is a, a inheritance. Uh, how the hemophilia is A is inherited. When the father is uh, uh, free of hemophilia and mother is carrier. So the chances of being the child uh, hemophilia will be 
uh, 50% of the sons will affect with the hemophilia A and 50% of the daughters will act as a carrier. When the father is hemophilic and no, or mother is normal, there is a chance of uh, all, the, all the females to become a carrier and uh, sons will be uh, of free of disease. So clinical features for hemophilia A is there is no racial predilection, easy bruising, uh, bleeding manifestation begins after six months of age. There will be a signs of hematomas, hematrosis, hematuria and GI bleeding. There will be a massive bleeding after minor injury, particularly in the joints, that is, which is also called as hematrosis, hematoma, ecchymosis, and there can be a recurrent bleeding in the joints, which leads to a deformity. Usually, pedicures are absent in the hemophilia A. Oral manifestations, persistent bleeding at the site, uh, such as plenum of the lip and tongue, prolonged bleeding after the tooth extraction. Uh, physiological process of tooth eruption, exfoliation can also be uh, produce severe prolonged hemorrhage, gingival hemorrhage when there is a gingival injury. So, this is a picture of hematrosis. So clinical severity depends on the level of factor 8. So when the factor 8 is less than 1% of the normal, then uh, the disease is very severe. And when the uh, percentage is 2 to 5%, uh, when uh, factor 8 is about 2 to 5% of normal, the, there will be a moderate disease. And when there is a 6 to 50% of uh, factor 8, the disease will be mild. Laborative findings for a hemophilia A is uh, clotting time will be prolonged, bleeding time will be normal, uh, prothrombin time will be normal, and APTT will be prolonged, factor 8 will be decreased. So, management for a hemophilia A includes infusion of factor 8 derived from a human plasma. The complication for this is HIV, and there is a chance of acquiring HIV and antibodies uh, formed against factor 8. So replacement with a recombinant factor 8 is also one of the management, one of the management. And next one is the hemophilia B, which is also called as Christmas disease. This is a very rare compared to the hemophilia A. It is a deficiency of factor 9. About 14% of our patients with a factor 9 is present but uh, in uh, the patients with hemophilia B, 14% can have factor 9, but it is non-functional. It is an extremely recessive uh, disorder. Incidence is 1 is to 1 lakh males. So males are more commonly affected. Clinical features include easy, uh, which will be similar to that of a hemophilia A. So there is a comparison between hemophilia A, hemophilia B, and there is one more factor, uh, one more disease which is called as hemophilia C. So in a hemophilia A, it is most common type of hemophilia and severe, it is also known, uh, it is also known as factor 8 deficiency or classic hemophilia. Hemophilia B, it is the second most common type of hemophilia. The symptoms will be moderate. It is originally named as a Christmas disease, which is caused by a factor 9 deficiency. So mild form of a, a hemophilia, which is hemophilia C, uh, it, it is also caused due to deficiency of factor 9, 10, 11. So hemophilia uh, B, la laboratory findings include, bleeding time is normal, uh, prothrombin time is normal, APTT will be prolonged or uh, corrected by normal serum. So, factor 9 is decreased. So, dental management hemophilia. Anesthesia or LA. Anesthesia, LA local anesthesia is contraindicated contra before replacement therapy. That is, uh, replacement with a factor 8 only. Uh, uh, anesthesia should be given only after the replacement of a Factor, assessment of a factor 8 and replacement of a factor 8, then only you can go ahead with a local anesthesia. Until then, uh, it is uh, if 
it has to be used it, it should be used as the intrapapillary or uh, periodontal ligament in the intraperiodontal ligament or uh, papillary injection sedation with the digipam and nitrous oxide analgesia can be given so endodontic therapy is safe when provided uh, the gp point should not go beyond the apex restorative treatment is done uh, under the rubber rubber dam uh, to prevent the gingival problem prosthodontic therapy so maintenance of oral hygiene is necessary to prevent a uh, gingivitis so periodontic uh, therapy conservative periodontic therapy in a oral surgery, uh, surgical procedures local hemostatic agents are used aspirin and nsaids has to be avoided pre operative factor level should be assessed if it is more than 30 to, uh, 30 to 40 percent of normal activity then only you consider for a oral surgical procedures electrocautery is uh, electrosurgery or electrocautery is contraindicated in patients with hemophilia so disseminated intravascular coagulation is also called as uh, consumption coagulopathy or microangiopathic hemolytic anemia it is a serious serious and often fatal acquired disease so here massive intravascular coagulation takes place and uh, uh, there is uncontrolled hemorrhage in other parts of the body so the initiation of disseminated intravascular coagulation there is the activation of intrinsic and extrinsic uh, clotting cascades uh, damage to the endothelium five steps five step process so a tissue injury or endothelial cell injury release of coagulants into the blood excessive activation of coagulation cascade widespread thrombosis and secondary fibrinolysis consumption of clotting factors and platelets these all cause uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation so bic associated risk factors there will be obstetric com uh, complications there will be abruptio placentia retained dead fetus septic abortion amniotic fluid embolism and toxemia uh, next one is the infection infection due to gram negative septicemia meningococcemia histoplasmosis aspergillosis and malaria so neoplasms include aml and massive trauma burns and extensive extensive surgery so this all causes disseminated intravascular uh, coagulation so pathology behind many venules and capillaries arterioles contain multiple small fibrin platelets and throm uh, fibrin thrombi so meshwork of fibrin may uh, fragment red blood cells and they uh, form a cytocytes which are called as the uh, these altered rbc accounts for a uh, named microangiopathic hemolytic anemia there will be a widespread ischemia which can cause a stroke renal failure extremity infarction and deep venous thrombosis and bleeding so laboratory findings for uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation highly micro thrombi in arterioles and venules platelets and fibrin thrombocytopenia prolonged uh, prothrombin and uh, partial thromboplastin time and uh, decreased fibrinogen increased d dimer and anemia cytocytes in a peripheral smear so how to identify the dental patients with bleeding disorders with this we have completed uh, bleeding and clotting disorders and uh, at the end we should know how to identify the uh, patients with a bleeding and clotting disorders so we have to before starting the procedure we have to know family history past history current medication and uh, in alcohol intake and medical condition so family history is known uh, because any bleeding problems uh, within the family so that indicates the inherited disorder past history if there is a bleeding uh, which followed by surgical procedure a dental extraction then we should be cautious and surveying of a patient uh, medical current medical condition is very very important heavy alcohol intake can also uh, lead to bleeding and clotting disorders 
medical conditions such as hepat hepatitis or uh, liver cirrhosis renal disease hematological mal uh, malignancies thrombocytopenia predispose predispose the patient to bleeding disorders so this is the end of uh, my topic so my book of reference my acknowledgments thank you Thank you so much, sir, for sharing an in-depth lecture on this topic. Sir, am I audible? So good evening, sir. Am I audible? So can you unmute your mic, sir? Yes, hello. Yes, sir. Thank you for the lecture, sir. OK. Sir, uh, we have a question from our participant. Tell me. Yes, sir. Uh, she says, what is the classical clinical uh, tetrad observed in patients which, with HS purpura? Shall I repeat, sir? Maybe you can ask her to online to. Uh, due to some technical issues, we are uh, not able to connect to sir. Sorry for the inconvenience, but uh, Dr. Supraja, ma'am, oral pathologist from Vishnu Rental College will be answering the question. Uh, good evening, everyone. Actually, when you see this uh, HSP purpura, usually you see with patient with upper respiratory tract infections associated with small bruises and blood spots all over the skin. When we see the tetrad, the tetrad has the purpuric rash, atralgia, abdominal pain, and the renal disease. So this is the tetrad what we see in the uh, HSP purpura. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Your uh, lecture was very informative. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, sir, we would like to present you with the certificate. Uh, kindly accept it, sir. With this, we have come to the end of day two of Vidya, uh, Vishnu Adhyan 2022. I thank all the enthusiastic doctors who came forward to share their knowledge today. The organizing team hopes that all of the participants were able to make this the best of today's lectures. Kindly take time to fill in the feedback of day one and day two forms 
that will be posted in the WhatsApp groups and chat box. See you all tomorrow morning, sharp at 9 a.m. Have a good evening. Please join in with the same link as today, tomorrow also. Thank you.